see me here. Uh, you may have still Christian Müller's name uh, in, in the program, at least in the first programs that you got. He couldn't make it. He had to cancel on a short notice. So I'm filling in for him today. My name is Hanne Lorefeit and I will guide you through the day. I will start off with a few housekeeping rules. First of all, Thanks for adhering to the mask mandate uh, that we have for in-person participants. First question, usually Wi-Fi. Uh, if you are not in the Wi-Fi yet, uh, the codes are displayed around the venue. Uh, it, the password is stay connected, lowercase and one word, and you'll be in. If you scan the QR code on your badge, uh, on your name badge, you get the detailed speaker speakers' bios and the agenda. As I said, we are adhering to strict COVID rules and guidelines following the CDC requirements. All speakers you see on stage, uh, like everybody here, I believe, have been fully vaccinated and may remove their masks as I did. It's better for you to hear me and it's better for me to speak. <laughs> it works both ways. During the Q&A session later this uh, morning, we will disinfect uh, the microphones throughout uh, the panel, throughout the Q&A session. For the audience who are joining us uh, over the live stream, there are, no, for the audience, let's talk about first you here, there, if you need to make phone calls. Out there on the left, there are phone booths. Uh, please put your phone on mute while you are in here. Uh, there is coffee, there are snacks throughout the day, throughout the conference, back behind you. For those joining us live stream, welcome from DC. We are excited to have you join us from practically all corners of the world. For, thanks to everybody for being here today. This event will be recorded. Some of the sessions will be available at a later point for download and for viewing on the OSTA website. And now, let's get started. I'd like to officially welcome you in person and those joining us via the live stream on behalf of the Office of Science and Technology Austria, OSTA, who organized this event, and on behalf of the Federal Ministry of Education, Science and Research, the Federal Ministry for European and International Affairs, and the Austrian Council for Research and Technology Development, who are funding and supporting today's conference. Thank you very much. Why are we here? Today's focus is on energizing knowledge transfer ecosystems. We live in a world today where innovation drives us, drives us forward. Innovation happens when people get together, when they collaborate, when they form partnerships. That's what we are doing here. It happens when uh, new approaches come out of basic research and are applied to everyday life lives and make our everyday lives better. We'll see success especially when universities, research centers, industry and governments work together and pool their forces. That's why today experts, leading experts, will share their perspectives with us. What will the day look like? Uh, we will first hear from Austrian stakeholders about how their organizations come together to advance research and innovation. Then experts will share their knowledge and, uh, and innovation can be used to address, how innovation can be used to address global challenges. You all get to engage and share your experiences as well. We are looking forward to having questions from you, to hearing from you here today. Uh, during lunch, we'll stream pictures of partners and showcase the top 10 posters of this year's ARIT poster session. I believe most of you are familiar with this because we've had it for so many years now. In the afternoon, we'll hear some lessons from innovation in academia and how transfer can stimulate progress. Now, let's get started. I would like to introduce the first two speakers. Uh, you all know them. Before I ask them on stage, I'll just give you a very brief introduction. 
Uh, Austria director Simone Pacher will open the day. She has been with the Austrian embassy for 16 years, 15 of those years with Austria, and the last two years she has been leading the Austria team. She is the person connecting Austrian researchers in North America and for bringing stakeholders in Austrian and North American science, technology, and innovation together. And, of course, the host, Ambassador Martin Weiss, one of the hosts today, Ambassador Martin Weiss, you all know him also. He has been in the Foreign Service since 1990. He became ambassador to Washington, D.C. in 2019, at the end of 2019. Before that, he was ambassador to Israel. He was director of the Press and Information Department of the Foreign Ministry at home in Vienna, and he was ambassador to Cyprus, and he knows the United States very well. He has been stationed here at the embassy before as press attaché he has been stationed he had he was stationed at the austrian mission to the un in new york and he was the uh, consul general in los angeles simone i'd like you to start Thank you. how do we do it <laughs> Thank you, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Hannelore, for the introduction. It's been quite a year since we came together last year virtually, since the last ERIT, and all of you in this room are scientists, so you all know what it means that we actually get a chance to come together. And I want to say thank you so much with everything going on that you're here today celebrating with us. I look at, at the faces here and I have to say when I checked our registration list last week um, I also did a little bit of a deeper digging exercise to see how many people have attended how many of our ERITs like Nelore said it's the 18th ERIT and some of you are here for the very first time with us today some of you three times five times eight times and some even more than ten times and what I did last week is I did my due diligence, like you scientists do, and I didn't just rely on my own experience. Um, I reached out to you and I asked some of you why it is that you keep coming back to an ERIT. What makes this event so special? And there are three main things that some of you told me, and they may resonate with some of you here in the audience and with some of you at home joining us virtually. The first is that the people to the left of you, the people to the right of you, the people behind you and the people in front of you all share one same passion with you, and that's the passion for science. And having one thing that you all have together in common unites. The second thing is, as you have come so many times to join us at an ERIT, over the years, you've not only built research collaborations on a work level, but you've also built trusted friendships. And you, just like everybody else, at least once a year, love to come together to check in and see what's new with each other. So it's that coming together component and building relationships. And the third part is, while we're very far away from Austria, this event helps us and the activities that we have throughout the year to stay closely connected to the Austrian scientific community. And the last word here, community, I think is what sums up the magic of what we have built with this Research and Innovation Network Austria. And that's why Astina and Rina, both of the networks that we have here in North America, have become more important than ever before. We're in a world today where people are ge geographically separated, but virtually coming together even more. And that's why we need organizations and institutions provide a framework for people with joint interests to come together. For me, um, you already mentioned the 18 years. I already said it as well. I've been with OSTA for 16 years, uh, for, for almost 16 years. It's my 16th ERIT, in fact, today, and it will be my very last ERIT. I'll leave OSTA at the end of the month. I have decided uh, to follow my long-term dream and start my own business. It's called 
<laughs> Thank you. It's called ThriveCon, and I'll be able to spend my time helping organizations build people networks and communities that have grown so fun to my heart. You all know that's what brings me joy, and I can't wait to keep doing this and bringing um, the magic of community to more organizations and institutions across the globe. That said, and looking at all of you here, um, I'm getting a little emotional now. <laughs> I want to thank you all for your support throughout these years. I couldn't have done it without you. Um, it's been quite a ride, and I just want to say thank you for picking up the phone when I needed answers, for answering my emails, for, for just being in touch, um, for the friendships that you have all extended to me. It means the world to me, um, the entire network. Um, and I cherish every single moment uh, that I've had, the amazing ones and also the, the kind of uh, challenging ones at the same time, because that's what life is all about, right? It's about experiences and it's about growth. Before I close, I just want uh, you to know that this community is close to my heart and I'll be watching from the sidelines and cheering my team on, the amazing team that we've built here, as they continue to support you in North America. Um, I'm going to pass on, I think, the microphone to Ambassador Weiss before I even get more emotional. <laughs> um, Martin, Martin Weiss um, is the Austrian ambassador here. I've told him for now over two years uh, why I love everybody in this room here so much, why community is magic. And it's so exciting to me that after last year's virtual area, Martin, you can now experience the feeling that's in this room and, and during the networking also in person. Martin, please take it from here. Thanks, everybody, again. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I, I'll be very quick because I'm the last obstacle standing between you and hearing from Minister Fassmann. So just a, a, a brief welcome. Uh, like Simone said, last year we proved that an RIT can also be done virtually, but boy, this is quite a bit better. Uh, you, Hannelore, mentioned a, a number of stations in my personal career. Uh, one station was not on your list, and that wow. is my first assignment when I came to the United States was in 1992, and I was the science attaché of the Austrian Embassy in Washington, D.C., which kind of started my, my love for this topic. I always have had a soft spot. Uh, out of a science, a lonely science at the Shea grew Oster. And uh, Simone was at that time not yet part of the embassy, which is hard to believe. <laughs> but uh, it started small. It became Oster. You have done a number of amazing things. And Ari is, I think, a beautiful example of what can be done and how we connect Austria and the United States. I really... Uh, love what has happened in those years, and I always followed it from the sidelines. Since two years, I followed it a little closer. And of course, the support of your ministry has been so key and functional. Without that, this would not, nothing of this would have been possible. And I see it when I compare notes with my European colleagues, and we talked about what we have, what we do, and what they have, and what they do, and they don't come close. Uh, and I'm talking about not uh, small countries, but larger countries, they have by no means the same network that we have created. It takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of time. It takes the right people. So thank you all for coming. Uh, you will see that uh, what, what happens today. It's a, a great program that we are looking forward to. Thank you very much. And Simone, thank you for everything you have done. Really, you did a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let me quickly formally introduce uh, the Minister... Uh, for education, science, and research. Most of you have already met him. Um, he has been minister since 2017 with a brief break in 2019. And I do remember that you were here for the ARID two years ago, also in Washington, D.C., by the way. Um, I believe I can say 
He is a scholar at heart. He received his PhD in geography and economic and social history at the University of Vienna. He was a researcher at the Austrian Academy of Sciences and professor of applied geography at the University of Vienna and the Technical University of Munich. He also was the vice rector of the University of Vienna. And I would like to thank you especially for attending yesterday's alumni happy hour here in Washington, D.C., alumni of the University of Vienna, I should say. And he was a admitted as a member of the Austrian Academy of Sciences in 2007. Minister Fassmann will share some insights about developments in science, technology and innovation in Austria and in Europe on an EU level. Please welcome him on stage. Yes, thank you, Hannelore, um, for your kind introduction into my CV. Um, Excellence, um, dear participants, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to be here and to see so many Austrian colleagues and friends. Um, you are part of our country despite the fact that you are living in the US or in Canada or elsewhere. You are always something like an intellectual academic ambassador of our republic in terms for science and research. And you are something like a bridgehead of our republic. Um, and I'm proud and happy that you are always showing a feeling of belonging, a feeling of belonging and engagement in this network. If these networks are called RENA or ASINA, um, this is not important and it makes no um, sense important is that there is a network um, in North America and this network is functioning um, in the best way um, if I compare it to other networks. Uh, Botschafter Weiss, he addressed these differences. What I want to do in the next 15-20 um, um, minutes is to give you um, relevant information what happened in Austria and in Europe concerning science and research in the last years. Um, and I want to start maybe with the most important thing, and this is um, our RTI strategy, um, FTE strategy in German, uh, research, technology, and innovation. At the end of the last year, the Austrian government adopted the new RTI strategy, um, and it is for, the, for, for Chancellor Sebastian Kurz, and for me it's clear that we need higher education and we need science and research to preserve our wealth and our welfare state in Austria. Our wealth is produced or is guaranteed by the exports of products and services. And we will only be successful if our services and products are more intelligent and smarter than that of other countries. We cannot compete with low wages. Um, uh, but only with the qualification of the people um, and the competitiveness of our industry. Therefore, this is a clear commitment of our government. Science, research, innovation will and should be the driving force for our economy and society. Um, in this RTI strategy, there are three main goals. I want to address it in a very short way. The first is we want to strengthen Austria as an RTI location. So attract new research intensive companies to settle down in Austria. Make Austria attractive. Think about branding strategy, how we, are, how we see ourselves in, 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 in foreign countries. We should think about taxes, steuern. This is an important location factor. Uh, and we try to reduce bureaucracy if companies want to come to Austria and to settle down. Representatives of AWS um, are here. Representatives of the Wirtschaftsagentur Vienna are here. Um, I can promise you, um, your work will not run out and your work is of extreme importance for this republic. Secondly, focus on excellent research. Um, this is another target. Don't spend money for mediocre 
für mittelmäßige Forschung, mediocre research or for standard research. Try to focus on real excellence and try to increase effectiveness. It is not enough to explain the world, try to change the world. It is fine if research results are published in journals, in good journals, and are read by colleagues, maybe only few colleagues read what you has done. Um, it is also fine if your research results um, and can be translated into social or market relevant innovations. Making money out of research is not a thing. Um, I think the very opposite is true. And third target in our strategy is focus on talents and skills. Our human capital in Austria is the most important capital that we have. We have no oil, no gas, um, but we have smart people and we should support universities to educate them, especially in, in STEM, in, 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 in MINT, um, where we need more qualified people. The strategy is paper, is on paper, but it's not only on paper, it is realized and do have direct impacts on the institution, such as our universities, research organizations, funding organizations. Um, and I give you four examples how this strategy is translated. The first is the Austrian Science Fund, um, the most important um, um, research funding agency in Austria for basic research. President Gattringer is here, Vice President Jakubek is here, and this is also a clear signal of this fund agency. Um, we are present not only in Austria, we are present also in the countries where Austrian researchers are living and working. The FWF will be able to provide 272 million uh, euro payments in 2021. Um, this is a lot of money, I can promise to you, and this is the highest budget ever available. Um, in the near future, FWF will impl implement so-called cluster of excellence, which are great, which are new, and which I hope so will change a little bit our, our some isolated, sometimes isolated structures in our different universities. President Gattringer, I think you will talk a little bit later about this. Um, my second example is the Austrian Agency for Education and Internationalization, the ÖAD. Um, the CEO of ÖAD, Jakob Kalice, is also here and you will uh, present your new ideas. You have also the highest budget since the ÖAD is founded. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that means more mobility of students and professors is now possible, financed out of the European program Erasmus or of own resources or Austrian resources. More educational and international programs can be financed. More innovative ideas can be realized for the schools to modernize our educational system. And it's time to modernize our educational system. My third example I want to highlight is the Austrian Academy of Science. I think there is some persons are coming from the Austrian Academy or will go to the Austrian Academy. There is also an increase of 19% for the next three years period. This allows a continuation of all the activities of the Academy and allows um, uh, the, the foundation of new activities like a research institute into metabolic diseases in Graz or a center for research into current um, anti-Semitism. Um, this will be located in Vienna. And last but not least, the Institute for Science and Technology, um, the East Austria <clears throat> in Maria Kuking or in close to Neuburg. And I, I know that many of you know the, 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 the long story, um, how it was um, erected, how it was founded, how it was financed. But this, this um, institute developed so good that we said, yes, please grow. And every year, five new working groups can be financed 
and now we 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 made an, uh, the the next phase and until 2036 um, the expansion of East Austria is guaranteed. So um, the East Austria is maybe interesting for you. Um, concentrated of life science, mathematics, informatics, um, data sciences, um, and they are paying high wages and offer good working conditions. My second chapter are the universities. Um, without any doubt, um, the, our universities are important tankers, um, the main institutions in the field of basic research and the main institution in educating in the tertiary sector together with the Fachhochschulen, the Universities of Applied Science. We have, and I bring only this into your mind back, maybe you know it, but um, repetition is the mother of studying. Um, we have 22 public universities. Um, we have large ones, like the University of Vienna. Um, we have technical universities, like the TU Wien, um, or TU Graz, um, Professor Fröhlich is here from the TU uh, Wien. We have specialized universities of high quality, especially in arts, the Mozarteum, famous university, or the Economic University, or the Danube University in Krems. And we have um, medical universities, also specialized universities. All our, our universities are Autonomous, autonomous institutions um, since 2002. And this allows the rectorates to act like a CEO in companies. Um, not so directly, <laughs> <laughs> because there is an inner university, um, how I can say, inner university groups which are looking, watching, shouting. Um, but in principle, the rectorates are very important um, within the university. And the, the, the development of the university since two, 2002 proves that this fundamental change from a semi-dependent institution with many commissions inside the universities, many working groups discussion every problem, um, and the ministerial um, influence to an institution with a modern and lean government structure was right, was successful. The rectorate can decide whom or he, whom he or she will be appointed. Uh, the, the rectorate can decide which field of research within the university should get more resources or less resources. But the free and open access, um, um, uh, the, 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 the free and open access to university is in the DNA of. Um, our university policies, um, and this produces a lot of problems, and this cannot be solved by the rectorate. So therefore, I think it was a success uh, that a novel of the university law passed last year, or this year, our parliament. Um, it allows the university to control the number of students in specific study programs, um, and it demands a minimum student activity. 16 credit points, 16 ECTS in four semester. It's not much, but it's a proof of the students, yes, we want to study. <laughs> not very intensive, but at least. Um, <laughs> um, I, I think this was a, a small step in the right direction. Yesterday, we talked about the numbers, University of Vienna, 90,000 students on paper, 60,000 students are really studying. Um, this is a problem for every mm -hmm. management. Um, my third point concerning universities, the budget. The public universities will benefit also from budget increase of nearly 13%. So if you think we have an, um, an inflation about from 2%, 2% multiplied with three years is 6%, but there is an increase of 13%. So there is an extra space for an, for an autonomous development. Um, this increase allows us to invest specifically in STEM universities and in the medical universities. The current pandemic show how important our medical universities are and will be. Then we should be prepared. Um, nobody knows if the next virus or the next pandemic will affect our country. And we should be prepared also in science and research. And my last point concerning universities, 
we are now within a process of founding a new university in Austria. Maybe you heard about. Um, it will be a university focusing on digital transformation in economy and society. It will be not a pure university for informatics. Uh, we have a lot of faculties for informatics. It should be broader designed. Um, the, the first courses shall start in 2023, so over next year. Very ambitious program. Um, we will see if it, if it can be realized. And what is also very important, the students should come from all parts of the world, not only from Austria or from the location where the university will be erected. Um, this would be no gain because students going to that direction uh, are, 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 are um, lost from the Technical University in Vienna and so on. So this is a zero um, sum game. We need students from all other countries of the world and we have to, we have to be attractive enough in that university that this will be happened. Um, we, have now in the, our, our, we are now in the phase of a concept development and an Austrian living in California. I don't know if, if he is a member of Arid, but, uh, of, of, of Asina or Rina, but he should be. It's Gerhard Eschelberg. He is a former manager in Google for cybersecurity, and he is helping us now to develop the, the detailed concept for that new university. Um, news from Europe. Um, Europe is also important, very important. Um, Austria negotiated the next framework program, Horizon Europe. Horizon Europe is now still in realization. Um, there is a budget increase in Horizon Europe as well, 30% compared to the last framework program. It's not really fair if I say 30% because you, UK is not in. Um, so that's clear that there is an, that there is an um, um, increase. Um, the first calls have already started and we hope that Austrian researchers will participate and will be in the same way successful than in Horizon 2020. So the success rate is an average on 18%. Um, it's, it's, it's challenging, yes, it could be more. Um, everyone would be happy if it's not 18, it would be if it is 30%. But it's showing this is a very, um, very competitive uh, program. Um, Austria is, is on number three compared to this success rate. Um, Belgium and France are better, and then Austria is coming. A clear sign and a clear, clear indicator that Austrian researchers are excellent compared in, in, in Europe. And we gained from the last um, Horizon 2020 um, in the seven years uh, 1.8 billion euro is coming back from Europe to Austria. And we do hope that we are so in the same way successful in the next seven year framework program. Um, Horizon Europe offers the possibility for the participation of international researchers, also from outside of the European uh, Union. Um, the conditions are good for them if the country are associated members. Um, the European Commission now closed the contract with the Fairer Island. Um, and I do hope that they are starting negotiations with the US, that US becoming an associated member as well. Yesterday we was in the, um, in the White House, in the Office for, for um, Science and Technology Policy, and we addressed this issue. And there was, a, for me, a clear signal, yes, the US will try the best way to become an associated member. If you need further information, um, um, good information, then you can contact our national contact point um, at the Austrian Research Promotion Agency, FFG. This is an excellent um, contact point with a lot of information. Another important point is the program called Next Generation EU. It is an 800 billion 
um, um, euro instrument, incredible number. I'm losing the real imagination. What does it mean, 800 billion? Um, I only know it's, it's a lot of money. And this program should help to repair the economic and social damage brought the pandemic in the last year. And in the core of that program, there is another program called Recovery and Resilience Facility um, that provides loans and grants to support reforms and investments um, undertaken by the EU member states. Um, every member state has to work out an, 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 uh, an, an country report or a country proposal what they want to do. Um, and at the end of the paper, we want to have 3.5 billion, 3.5 milliarden euro from this program, Recovery and Resilience Facility. And the good news for science and research is that it is not only money goes into streets, bridges, um, transportation, environment or climate change. It also goes into new research and innovation. Um, hydrogen and microelectronics is one of the topic. Quantum physics is another topic with extra money. What will the quantum physics do with all this money coming around? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> quantum physics and precision medicine. Um, and if your discipline is not addressed by these topics, um, please do not be disappointed. It's better to have money in our research and science system, and the more money, the better, then we have less money in the system. Then the distributional conflict is much more um, important. My final point from Europe is the European research area. <clears throat> this is a wonderful idea, common market for researchers, a common market for knowledge, a wonderful, a wonderful vision for Europe. Um, Europe should cooperate, Europe should share costly infrastructure, and the member states should allow free mobility and free employment to researchers coming from all other parts of the European Union without any structural or hidden barriers. It should be like the US, and it's clear for Europe this is a strength um, of this country. So all our energy goes into that direction, trying to reach the goals of ERA. Um, especially try to motivate the, let's say, the countries which are spending um, a low budget into science and research, motivate them to increase this number. This is important. Um, another point is a better trans trans translation and transition from research results into innovation and the creation of an open science culture um, with open publication. Also as an answer um, to the behavior of the large publishing houses, Elsevier and others, um, which, uh, which are producing a lot of problems for the universities and for the researchers as well. Barbara Weidgruber will hopefully take over an important um, position in that area, in that era. Um, she is so experienced and full of energy, and both is necessary to gain progress against the national interests. Um, Bohren, Dicker, Bretter. <laughs> that is her duty now <laughs> for the next time. Um, I want to conclude um, and I want to finish. I hope I have given you some new insights into the developments in Austria and in, in Europe. Before ending my, my keynote, I want to thank the organizers of this event, namely the Austrian Ambassador, Embassy here in Washington and the Office of Science and Technology Austria specifically. The Austrian Research uh, Funding Agency and stakeholders present today, and especially the Austrian Council for Research and Technology Development for co-sponsoring this event. Thank you very much for your attention. Und danke schön. Thank you. Thank you for your very interesting
opening speech today, keynote speech today, you have already introduced our next topic that we'll discuss a little bit more in detail, RTI, or in German, as it, uh, it, it's called the FT, FTE Pact. Um, we will have Austrian stakeholders here with us. One is already waiting here. <laughs> Welcome, Christoph Gattringer, president of the FWF. Let me give a quick introduction, very brief introduction. He has been professor for Compu computational elementary particle physics at the University of Graz. He was also vice rector for research at that university. He's very familiar with North America. He spent some time at the MIT in Boston, the University of Washington in Seattle, and the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. Vancouver. Welcome to the ARIT in Washington. Thank you very much for this very nice welcome. It's a pleasure, it's an honor to present also the FWF and the activities of the FWF here at the ARIT Symposium. What is the FWF? The FWF is the Austrian National Science Foundation in charge of funding fundamental research. So our customers are researchers from our universities, but also the research institutes outside the universities, the academy institutes, it was mentioned, the ISTA, the Institute for Higher Studies, but also some of the big uh, national museums. And of course, Fachhochschulen, Universities of Applied Science. By law, we are open to all disciplines. So we fund projects ranging from engineering, uh, natural sciences, the bio and life sciences, uh, all the way to humanities, social sciences, but also arts-based research. Our funding portfolio has various formats. So our workhorse is still individual grants. They come in two versions, national individual grants, but also with an international partnership, important maybe also for this audience here. Uh, but then we also have instruments for collaborative uh, research, SFBs, uh, Forschergruppen, ZK, Connecting Minds uh, program. In our portfolio, you will also find programs for training PhD students, the DOC funds, and the DOC funds connect. However, uh, beyond the PhD students, we also fa fund uh, early career researchers, postdocs, maybe also interesting for some of you the Schrödinger program, but maybe even more interesting, the Esprit program, which you can use for coming back to Austria, doing research there. You need to find a partner, a hosting institution. If this is uh, signed by the hosting institution, you can apply for your grant. It's evaluated competitively. This is a way to go back to Austria also, maybe interesting for some of you. Actually, if you're interested in the um, opportunities uh, provided in our funding portfolio provided by the FWF. I brought some copies of our annual report. Uh, we will place them at the reception desk. If you're interested, have a look. I was invited to look a little bit also at the context of the RTI strategy, which was already mentioned by Minister Fassmann. And here the FWF is uh, trying to set uh, also new steps, you know, steps in a new direction. And actually next Wednesday is a very important first step. We will be at the ministry signing our three-year finance agreement, the, the framework finance agreement for the FWF. Why is this important? So for the first time, we have a three-year horizon for our finances, and it has been mentioned that our task is to implement the excellence initiative in the next few years. And for that, we need a long-term financial commitment. So we are very grateful that this is possible from now on. This is really the prerequisite for our big plans, the excellence initiative. One element of the excellence initiative was already mentioned. It's the clusters of, of uh, excellence. These are really large scale collaborative formats uh, with a financial framework of up to 70 million euros for one such cluster and a time range of 10 years. Clearly a format where you can attack big modern research questions yeah, from developing vaccines to building a quantum computer, the large questions. 
And it's also, as I said, collaborative. So uh, one of the boundary conditions that at least three universities or outside university research institutions have to pool their forces to attack one of these big research questions. We have started very successfully with this program with a letter of intent phase. We saw a very, very good response. All of the Austrian universities uh, are part of some of the letters of intents. I'm very happy with the distribution. It really covers all groups of disciplines, the natural sciences, uh, humanities, but also bio and uh, social, uh, sorry, humanities and social sciences, as well as bio and health sciences. Well distributed over the disciplines, very high demand, which really shows that there is a necessity for such a large scale funding instrument as we uh, are about to implement with these clusters of excellence. There's two more funding lines which will start next year and the, the year after. One of them is Emerging Fields, it's the name of the program. It's a collaborative format, so again for groups of researchers, and there the focus will be on high risk, high potential. We really want to try out new ideas, fund new ideas. This is the goal of the uh, Emerging Fields program starting next year. And the third uh, program line, which we will implement again a year later, maybe very important for this community here, is the Austrian Chairs of Excellence. These are competitive starting packages for incoming newly hired professors. So maybe interesting for some of you to enter this um, bid for a com very competitive uh, starting package as an incoming professor. So I'm convinced that our excellence initiative, it was mentioned, will shape and significantly change the Austrian basic research landscape. We will become internationally more competitive and also more attractive and hopefully also for some of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, President Katringer. Uh, another stakeholder in the RTI uh, program is the Agency for Education and Internationalization, the UAD. It's easier in German. <laughs> and I'd like to welcome Jakob Kalige. He is the managing director. Let me very briefly introduce you. You, you started at the beginning of 2019 in this new role. Uh, Mr. Kalicze held positions in the offices of several Austrian federal ministers. Most recently, he served as Secretary General in the Federal Ministry of Education, Science and Research under Federal Minister Fassmann. And under your leadership, the ÖAD is undergoing important institutional changes, which we'll hear about. Thank, thank you very much. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's great to be here again in Washington, D.C. It's my third ARIT. Um, and, uh, yeah, there's some news I can uh, report about the ÖAD. Um, this is the first part um, I will talk about, and then I will quickly tell you some things you might be interested in about uh, developments in the Erasmus program. So who is ÖAD? We are the um, Agency for Internationalization and Education, um, meaning that we deal with um, the internationalization of the, of all fields, actually, of uh, education in Austria. So beginning really with kindergarten, the school system, internationalization of the vet sector, and of course the university sector, the higher education sector. There are uh, a number of scholarships we have. Um, you can find much information, of course, on our website, oead.at, and there's also a special website for grants, grants.at, um, where you, you will find um, what, uh, what we have in our portfolio. Um, and there's a, a second dimension, um, and this is a very recent development also in the context of the RTI uh, policy framework, which is that we are also um, an agency who works um, in the field of education on a national level. And there we deal with issues of quality development in the school system, for example, or we... Um, uh, try to support schools in their um, collaboration with the world outside of schools, with uh, uh, universities, for example. So we just recently um, uh, restarted the Sparkling Science Program for the ministry. It's funded by the ministry, um, where pupils um, 
do actual research together with researchers from university. Um, so this is who we are. Um, we have around uh, 85 million euros uh, each year. That's, that's our budget, it's the high, highest we ever had. And um, the bigger part of this budget comes from the European Union for the Erasmus Plus program, actually. And there are some um, bigger changes in this Erasmus program that might be of interest for you, even here in the U.S., um, for those of you who don't know, we just now also started a new funding period for seven years. Um, there's a lot more budget in this program as well, um, not as much as you mentioned in the other programs, uh, Minister Fassmann, but uh, nevertheless, still um, about 23 billion euros for the next seven years. About 650 euros will go into the Austrian system, and half of these um, 650 go into the higher education sector. What do we do with this money? Um, most of you will know most of this uh, money goes into um, supporting uh, people to go abroad, um, to um, f get new experiences abroad, mainly BA students, MA students, but also PhDs. And it's also open for administrative university staff um, as well as faculty men members, for lecturers. They can all make use of this Erasmus funding. Um, we had about 12,000 people each year we supported with Erasmus. Um, this is a pre-COVID number, of course. Um, and most of these people, as you can imagine, they went abroad within the European Union or within Europe. And uh, now this is actually one of the biggest changes in the new um, program, which is that um, it is now possible for universities to um, take up to 20% of the funding and use it for international, um, uh, well, supporting international states, so, so um, stays outside of the European Union. Um, people now can go to China, Australia, they can go to the US, they can go to Canada. Um, and uh, this is fairly new. Yeah, um, institutions are only now um, uh, getting the first funds, and they are just now starting to um, well make make use of this uh, new funding stream. So it's now a good time, also, um, if you are interested, if your institution is interested, to um, connect to in Austrian institutions to set up some kind of new collaboration. The funds are there now in Austria for this. Um, there are a lot of other changes I could report um, in the Erasmus program. It's much more flexible than it used to be. It has some um, uh, focus content-wise on digitization and other things. Um, I'm happy to tell you more about this um, in the breaks, in the break, uh, during the break. And if you have some um, technical questions, please don't hesitate to contact us at URD. We are more than happy to, um, or I'm more than happy to connect you with our experts um, because our aim is to have more international collaboration, more exchange with the U.S. also. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jakob Kalice. Thank you, Christoph Gattringer. We are coming to our first, getting to our first panel, and I would like to introduce the Director General for Scientific Research and International Relations, the Austrian Federal Ministry of Education, Science and, Science and Research, and of course, you all know her, Barbara Weitgruber. She will take over from now. Let me just briefly introduce her for the few of you who may not know her that well. Uh, she was a founding staff member and then directed the Office of International Relations and the lecturer at the Karl Franzens Universität in Graz. At the uh, ministry, she held a variety of roles uh, where she focused on higher education and research. She's also a member of the Task Force for Research, Technology and Innovation of the Austrian Federal Government. And most importantly, she helps shape the programs of the Austrian Marshall Plan Foundation and Fulbright Austria, which many of you know so closely or are maybe graduates of. Welcome, Barbara Weitgruber. You will take over from here. You will call your own panelists on stage. The floor is yours.
Thank you. You will be surprised that I'm moving all the way up here, but it will be um, a larger panel. Um, dear ARID participants, it's a pleasure for me um, now to have this panel discussion after you have heard about the recent developments and the quite um, great changes uh, that Austria and the European Union has uh, undergone um, ever since the pandemic started. Um, and now we would like uh, to see if the challenges we face uh, in Austria and the European Union are similar to those uh, that you cope with here. Um, and if not, why not? Um, and take back some inspirations um, for our work uh, back home. Uh, in line with the overall theme of the RA 2021, Energizing Knowledge Transfer Ecosystems, uh, the panel will focus on innovation and knowledge exchange for addressing global societal challenges. Very ambitious aim, um, but don't worry. Uh, we have three excellent um, panelists, um, and we will also then include all of you um, in the panel discussion. Um, our minister will also be part um, of the panel, um, giving him the opportunity to actually ask questions to the panelists and give comments, because, of course, for us, it's always interesting to see and to learn um, how you experience the difference, those of you who have also had experience in the Austrian or European system, uh, between your um, work here and the work um, you did um, in European countries. I will start um, with the panelists um, who live here in the U.S. Um, Andrea Feigelding, founder and CEO of the Health Finance Institute, a former health economist at Harvard Chan School of Public Health, as well as with the OECD. She also serves as a scientific advisor to the Lansing Commission on Non-Communicable Diseases, Injuries, and Poverty. Her work for, focuses on health systems, financing, and governance, universal health care and cost effectiveness, and chronic disease interventions in developing uh, countries. She graduated from Simon Fraser University, Canada, and received her PhD from Harvard University. Um, so welcome here, and uh, you can either take the chair or just uh, stand here with me at the table. Um, the next is uh, Dieter Fosa, Chair of the Department of Geography and Geoinformation Science at George Mason University in Fairfax. He teaches courses related to geospatial data management, linked data, web application development using open source software, and data visualization. His research interests include data management, data mining for spatial and spatial temporal data, graph algorithms for dynamic networks, and user-generated content, e.g. map matching and map construction algorithms. He graduated from Johannes Kepler University, Linz, and received his PhD from Alberg University in Denmark. So he has two different European Union experiences as well. Uh, Sonja Schmergalunde, Senior Research Scientist at Smart Information Flow Technologies, SIFT. Her research focuses on merging social science with artificial intelligence and technological innovations. She works on developing novel approaches, for example, in the areas of team dynamics of human and human cyber teams, machine learning bias, and the influence of social cultural context on big data. Prior to working at SIFT, she worked as research scientist at the Social Cognitive and Effective Neuroscience Lab at Columbia University. She graduated from Karl Franzens University, Graz, and Lund University in Sweden. So first of all, um, I think they deserve some applause. <laughs> and in the first round, um, we simply uh, decided it would be nice to have a short introductory statement, up to five minutes, um, just to focus on your experience here um, in North America um, and also um, on your personal career development. And, and um, there is, of course, uh, the focus on innovation and addressing societal challenges, but from your curricula, I think <laughs> that's what you're doing anyway. So let's start with you, Andrea, please. Thank you so much. Um, I have to press something. Okay, it works. Um, uh, I'm really honored to be on this on this panel, and thank you, uh, Director Weidgruber, um, Minister Fassmann, and um, Your Excellency Ambassador, and also Simone for inviting me. It's um, I was reflecting back. It's 
I don't know how the how manyth of the art it is, but I remember being like um just doing my masters or something and being so inspired when I met all these fantastic American Austrian American researchers and the Austrian delegation. So I'm really, really honored to be here. Um, and um, before I start my impulse statement, I also want to congratulate um, the um, Austrian policymakers and leadership on, on really trying to make changes for innovation. And, and you know, things are changing slowly, as they always change, change slowly in Austria, but or surely. So that's, that's really great. So, Simone, you told me that I, I have to start with an anecdote, and I was, you know, trying, you know, really trying to think about an anecdote and something. I have a, quite a few to start with, but one um, sort of picture that, that stuck to my mind last night as I was prepping was a picture of um, Anna Kiesenhofer winning her gold medal in biking this year in the Olympics. And I think as Austrians, we were all really, really proud, and she finished so far ahead of the team that the second person thought she had won. <laughs> But she did it without, like, an Austrian team. She did it as an amateur. And that might have been her personal choice. We, we don't know the exact backstory, at least I don't. But I think some of us in the room might identify with that experience. And when you look at her resume, she got her very good scientific foundation in Austria, her, her, her you know, um, high school and, and her first degree. But then she went to Cambridge, then she went to, I believe, Portugal or Spain, and now is doing her postdoc in mathematics in Lausanne. And I think that that might not be in the U.S., but I think that that that, that anecdote speaks to many of us because you know we're we're all here in the search of excellence as innovators, as scientists. We want to be the best, and we want to make a difference. So, what are the factors that, for me personally, but maybe for us? globally can make that difference. And um, I want to offer some reflections that hopefully in the implementation of this really strong FTI strategy could help. So I wrote down, I was just reflecting before looking at any of the data, I was writing down three, um, three things that I thought, what makes good innovation? And I just want to preface, no country does that perfectly. But, um, you know, some things the US does better and some things Austria does better. And I was writing down we need to optimize for stability, motivation for success, and wide accessibility of innovation or application thereof. So I looked at the ranking published by WIPO, the GIIN, and there are many rankings, and it's not that scientific, but anyways, I looked at those. What are the most innovative countries in the world? And there's actually Sweden and Switzerland. I was a bit surprised by that, but then I thought about the three variables, and I thought that makes sense because you have a notion of stability, but you also have a notion of reward for that success. So then I was like looking at Austria, where, where Austria is in this very, in, in the ranking. And it's around, I think in terms of um, globally around the 20th most innovative place in like 11 or 10 or nine in like Europe, and you wanna get to number five as I understand. And a couple of the other factors and that make up the success. And in terms of venture capital penetration, it's actually the lowest when it comes to co its comparators in the, at least in that, that little research piece uh, in, in high income countries. And in terms of the, um, it's called like science and technology hubs or, or basically culture, cultural spaces or incubating spaces where they rank all the cities in the world. And Austria is actually number 70. So basically you just, you don't just need money. You also need a culture that breeds that kind of where you're allowed to have ideas, where you're allowed to fail, where where you know where you come from doesn't so matter as much of where you go, and I think that is that is sort of the signifying difference that we as researchers and seekers of the best and excellence we care more about the destiny than where we come from and where we are allowed to really look at that destiny of excellence. I think is where we then plant our roots. So I'm taking a lot of time, so I have to also I will try to make a couple more points. So the three points that I think are really driving innovation from looking at my personal experience and looking at other countries are there has to be, um, you know, there needs to be enough money to support your ideas. And maybe, you know, you, you can get by on ramen and ramen and like, you know, whatever, um, tap water and, 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 and cheap housing when you're a graduate student. But I think when you're older, you, wanna, you want to basically see that you can get somewhere and then what you, where you get is rewarded financially and culturally. 
The second thing is there needs to be sort of a culture that celebrates your individual successes and celebrates that excellence and not sticking to the mean. And I think that that is something <laughs> that, 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 that is done better here in the U.S. than it is in Austria. And I'm not talking about social media in the U.S. I'm really talking about the, the scientific networks. And then lastly, and this is, I think, where Austria needs to do better and the U.S. needs to do better when we're talking about global challenges, is the translation and of, 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 of our innovations. And that is like, you know, if you look at the U.S., like we, we, there were two companies that, um, you know, were so far ahead in the race to find a vaccine, and now not even 60% of the population is vaccinated, yet we have behavioral science and social science understanding of what makes people adapt or adopt science and innovation. And there, we're not strong enough here in the U.S. and in Austria. I think we can also tell tales when we look about climate change and other things. So I also encourage um, everyone in the audience to think about, yes, innovation for basic science, but also about innovation on application of that innovation. Because to me, innovation is only like as a social scientist and economist who tries to make the world a better place, um, I, I care about the accessibility of, of, of that science and that innovation as well. And so I just want to throw that in there as well. And I'm probably way over time. So thank you. And I look forward to further discussion. Thank, thank you so much. We will have all three panelists and then I will uh, they ask the minister on the stage as well. Uh, Professor Poser, please. Hello and Grüß Gott. Um, again, thanks to uh, Barbara and uh, Minister Fassmann and Simone and Ambassador Weiss for organizing this event. It's great to be here again. So my last one was in DC. The next one is also in DC. Um, when, when I was asked to be on this panel, you know, and Simone asked us to tell a story, yes, she asked all of us, all of us to basically come up with a, with a narrative that kind of relates to this challenge that we are discussing here. Um, I was thinking about, you know, how, how I got here, how I got to the U.S. And um, to Barbara's point, um, I was, so I studied in Linz. Then I was an Erasmus student, so ÖAD. Uh, I was an Erasmus student in Belgium for one year. There, uh, by chance, I met a professor that told me, you should do a PhD. Um, I went to the U.S. to start my PhD. I was in Maine. Um, didn't like it because it wasn't very technical. I went to Denmark, did my PhD there as part of a, it wasn't called Horizon back then, but it was, um, it was a European Union funding for PhD students. And it was a European project with 10 participating nodes. I was in one of them in, in Alba. I got my CS degree. Um, I met my wife before that in the US. She's Greek. And we said, Denmark is too rainy. We want to relocate to a more pleasant environment. We thought Greece would be it. And it was it for 11 years. So I was, I was essentially a Beamta in Greece at a research institute in Athens, working attached to the Technical University in Athens. Um, crisis came along, 20, you know, housing crisis 2008. Um, and then we said our kids were 10 years old by then. And we said, hmm, maybe that's not the place you want to grow up. So this continuous barrage of bad news and you know, not, not a good environment. And I got a nice offer from the U.S. just because, you know, through networks, et cetera. And it was a direct hire. And I, eight years ago, I came to, uh, here to, to Fairfax, to George Mason University. So one Uber ride away from here. And uh, we have been here, and our kids are now in college, right? Um, so it, it is really uh, many of the vehicles and many of, of the measures that were discussed before, European Union funding, uh, Erasmus students, et cetera, I, I used all of them, so to speak, to get here, right? And all of them were great fun. So the best time I ever had was uh, as an Erasmus student in Antwerp. Fantastic. So, so yeah, shout out to uh, the Erasmus program. Um, now here in the US, so go, going to this narrative about innovation and what I, I think the, the problem, or my, my understanding is I'm a researcher and uh, Minister Fassmann mentioned that before, it's fantastic to write papers and it's even more appreciated when people read them and cite them because then your citation index goes up. That's kind of the currency we are measured as researchers. Uh, but when it comes to impact and, and innovation is always impact, right? All the stuff that we do as researchers, does it really make an impact anywhere? Uh, then we always have problems. So many researchers really are 
have a problem writing NSF proposal and writing the broader impact sta statement of an NSF proposal, because this is really where we struggle, saying that, you know, down the road, 10 years down the road, will it really make an impact what we are doing here? Um, all right, so how can you create innovation? How can you make your work impactful? Well, and the story goes as follows. So COVID came along, we, it's still here. Um, and me and my wife, our kids went off to college and suddenly we were empty nesters at home, right? And it was COVID, we took our quarantining seriously, so we stayed at home and said, we have to do something, right? So we started volunteering at a vaccination clinic at the university that the university organized and actually Ambassador Weiss actually visited. Uh, chance encounter, uh, and, and he came out there and, and we showed him around. Um, then mass vaccination sites, so people stopped kind of, it was tapering off, people stopped showing up, and then the idea of a mobile clinic was born, right? So we go out there, we grab a food truck, uh, we fill it up with vaccines, some registered nurses that jab people, and we go into neighborhoods of vulnerable populations, so folks that, that A, are kind of shy of being in contact with the government, um, illegal immigrants maybe, and, but the idea was really, you know, you go there and you do mobile vaccination clinics and, and everything will be fine, right? Uh, so one example, I wasn't part of that, I was part of a later one where we learned our lesson. Um, so the food truck with, full of vaccines went out there, the nurses went out there, they set up shop in a parking lot in a neighborhood with, of, of such a community. And they expected 500 people to show up and what happened? As you can imagine, nobody showed up. Right? It was publicized, everybody knew about it, the whole community was aware of that the vaccines are coming. Just go there, you get jabbed, no registration, no cost, nothing. Well, out of 500 people only, I think, what I remember, 100 people showed up. What was the issue? Um, and it, it was like a communication failure, it was an innovation failure, I would call it, so that's why I use it as a metaphor. The folks that they wanted to vaccinate were uh, deeply religious people from Guatemala, that spoke a Mayan dialect, didn't speak English, didn't speak Spanish. Right? So communication was a big issue there. The biggest problem with all was the vaccine. It was the Johnson Johnson vaccine, which at that time um, there was these ethical concerns because there wasn't cell lines from what a fetus is used to develop the vaccine and the Catholic Church in the US came out against that vaccine to be dubious, right? Those folks didn't have any communication from anybody else except this, um, you know, um, among friends in their community. And it was like a pressure cooker, right? And they decided we are not getting vaccinated, right? Scientists didn't know about this, that this kind of sentiment um, uh, or scientists, the public health folks of our county didn't know about that. They couldn't address it, right? So th this is what happened. So on one hand, it was the scientists that didn't know kind of what was going on and the other hand, it was the people. Um, now I'm getting to my three points. So w what is an important thing um, that you can do as a university? And A, it's education. So educating people, that's really one of the contributors um, that, that uh, universities can do. And by education, it is not just lectures and degrees because degrees are disappearing. President Trump signed an executive order saying that the Office of uh, Personnel Management, they should not mention degree requirements on, on job ads anymore. It is just a set of skills. So your paper, your degree is worthless if you don't have the skills that are asked for. So degrees maybe disappear. Skills, university maybe don't, uh, or I'm not sure if, if all our course offerings, all our degree offerings really match what is required by industry, by the federal government anymore. So do we really do a good alignment in terms of what we educate people with? Uh, and the other one is how do we teach? Um, Project-based learning is a big thing here in the US and many, many courses. So the universities that say 50% of our courses will be project-based learning in combination with industry, in combination with outside stakeholders, because it teaches students so much more than just knowledge, right? Just drilled facts and know-how. It teaches them teamwork, interacting with stakeholders. So all these, these cooperative uh, aspects of working together in teams, cooperating, although with a bit of competition is really important. Uh, now, so this is like educating people. On the other hand, for researchers, what's also important is not being a researcher all your life. Right, so we have here the minister, he was a professor and he had so many different posts, now he's a minister, right? now he's a politician, give or take. Um, uh, so what, one thing in the US, it's really important is like this revolving door principle. So you're not staying in your job for 40 years, but you go from the university to the federal government, to industry and maybe back, right? So we have a work span life or work lifespan, I think that's the word, of what, 40 years, 50 years, some in the US have, you know, 60 years, they work until they, you know, 
cannot work anymore because, you know, nature takes its course. Uh, but so we, we can do many things during this lifetime, right? And, and going from the university and working for the federal government, even if it's just um, as an NSF program director, why not, right? So those are all people do because it gives us more experiences. It helps us understand how the other people think, and it helps to translate, for example, research into actual innovation because we all understand each other. We kind of know what's going on in the other, in kind of in the other, in the other shop. Uh, so those are from an education side that that's really important. Now the third point uh, I want to make is multidisciplinary research, and I would say multi-organizational research. So I read, you know, in preparation for this panel, I read up a bit about on things, and it turns out in the last decades, more and more important innovations were not done by the genius researcher in his office with his, I don't know, pen and paper, but were done by multidisciplinary, multi-organizational teams. So bringing people together and making them work together, and they are able to work together. So there are many, many conditions attached to that. But once you succeed in that, once you bring different researchers from different universities and different organizations, the federal government, uh, companies together, actually the results are quite wondrous, right? So, so this, this, but it is not easy. It is really not easy. And, you know, education and revolving door principles are actually quite helpful there. Um, now, in terms of going back to this initial COVID example um, that I told you, so there, there was more to that. I was volunteering, yes, and I was, you know, helping people get vaccinated, and I was actually seeing people. This was really the big thing. This was the big driving force for us in the beginning. But what we ended up was actually a group of researchers from our university working on a multidisciplinary uh, proposal with uh, a total of 40 partners. Uh, we submitted it two weeks ago to NSF on health equity. Because health equity or health, um, you know, giving everybody the health care they deserve, and yes, it's a complicated topic. And it is, yes, it is attached to money, and yes, it is attached to health insurance, but it is also attached to folks not being able to take time off from work and or not having a car to go to a clinic, right? So, so those, are, those are some really some, some, some simple issues that some have to, have to address. Some have to do with policy. So health equity is a really, really complicated issue that is not solved by throwing money at it. As research is a really complicated issue in innovation that is more than just throwing money at it. Of course, it's great to have a budget. Without money, you cannot do much, right? But, but so there are more issues to be uh, considered. So for me, it really helped me a lot. And it just started by saying we have to do something, right? We have to get out of our house and help and help people. So summarizing all my, um, my um, thoughts, it is really about people. It's about the skills that people have. It's about the experience uh, people have and the relationships they built, right? So if, if you get this, this network, Simona's point, right? So that's why it's great what she's doing and what great what she will continue doing. And bringing people together and making them work nicely together is like a huge thing. And it, it's the key to many, many, to solving many, many really big societal challenges. Um, Thank you. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Sonia, your story and your advice. Thank you. You both already made great points. It's uh, unfortunate to come last. <laughs> maybe sounds, some of it might sound like a repetition, but I also want to say thank you, Barbara, for the kind invitation. Thank you, Simona and the ambassador for the invitation to come here. It's a great opportunity. You are all amazing. I looked at the list of attendees and I thought any one of you could be up here. So I'm really humbled and uh, grateful. But what I also saw when I look, looked at the list of attendees is that at least we here, but probably also many of you who are in the audience, share a very similar story, right? Uh, we left the safe, beautiful, warm Austria uh, home that it can be, Austria. Uh, <laughs> sometimes, like warm in a metaphorical sense, <laughs> it, certainly, it certainly is a lovable country, right? And it all provided us with a security and a home base that we'd like to return to. But we left it for one reason or another. And we left it because maybe we are comfortable with risk. Maybe we are comfortable with the unknown. Uh, maybe we are rule breakers. We certainly broke into something that is unknown. Uh, and that is a kind of at the core of what innovation is also about. We can kind of imagine a different way of living, a different way of thinking. Uh, and this should not be overlooked. I know you both have probably already touched upon that which is the human aspect, what actually fosters uh, innovation, 
adapt adaptation, flexibility to new circumstances. So we are perfectly, we are, we are all innovators in that sense. We are all entrepreneurs. And, that, and that's really great to have that kind of community. Um, now, I would like to, thinking about innovation, you know, it, as I said, it requires creativity and imagination, but at the core of innovation is always an idea. And I would like to challenge you to an idea. Um, and that is thinking about, you know, AI, the field where I find myself in. And I certainly also similar to you, and maybe I'm not going too much into my personal story, but I can tell you that growing up in Weitendorf, I did not think that I would end up as an anthropologist living in San Francisco working for a tech company, uh, you know, in the field of AI. That was not on my radar. But there I am, you know, uh, and have been for a number of years now and understand kind of like how Silicon Valley works. And like I'm also the industry representative here, so I really work very much in the applied sciences. But the idea I want to challenge you on is really to think about AI or technology or innovation in a different way. So AI is, AI is like this complex of, you know, machine learning technologies, uh, natural language processing, uh, but it's very nebulous and we don't really know what it means. Uh, but it's also a construct of social and cultural practices, something that is reflected in what we build. Uh, so in anthropology, in my own field, we use something that is called marktness or markierung of Deutsch. So you have categories that are marked and that are unmarked. So for example, if I take scientist, and particularly if I use the word female scientist, I have to use female as a marking in order to delineate from the default because there's assumptions about scientists generally being male. But if I say that we have actually also a female scientist, the word female is the marking. It's like the, the exception from what the default is. Now, if we think about AI in a similar sense by using a word, let's say a country, Austria, what would that look like? If we think about Austrian AI, what did that actually look like? And why would we ask such a question? And I respond to my own question with like, well, it's important because like using markings actually opens up the meaning of what's behind it and what kind of assumptions go into it. And this is where I think Austria can become really innovative. If you think about the kind of values we want to have reflected in the technology that we are building, but also for who we are building that technology, not just who are the people that build it. And that also means like maybe breaking free from this idea that Silicon Valley is like, you know, kind of dominating the narrative here, but that we can actually think, in, you know, and, and honestly also like Silicon Valley these days is really more about like selling ads online and keeping us on the screen than about true innovation. But true innovation also means like in particular in the context of Austria, that we can like do better. And that doesn't necessarily always mean that we have to go faster. I think like sometimes the barriers that we see are maybe safeguards because like we can also reflect about like what's the society we want to have. So when building AI, can we be more community-based? Can we be more egalitarian, for example? Can we be more fair? Can we be more transparent? Can we be more accountable? And these are really important questions that I would like an Austrian AI or an Austrian technology to look like. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Minister Fassmann, may I ask you on the stage as well? Um, and thank you so much for these introductory statements in which you already addressed uh, the key issues for our discussion. Um, and I would like to give the Minister the floor for questions or comments he might have already now. Or should we continue? <clears throat> no, I want to say thank you. Yes, you are. I want to say thank you for your comments and your questions and your reflections um, um, about the own career, but also about the question um, how we can, can do it better um, in a certain system. Um, I take three notes. Andrea Feigl, you said um, we should develop much more a culture to allow to have own ideas. Um, this is how I translated what you said to me. And that's a very important point. And I, I always thought how we can, let's say, engage, engage young researchers um, to be independent. We have in Austria a little bit the system of 
of professuren and of lehrstühle and if you are hired and you get a call from a university you ask i want to have one postdocs and maybe three um, pre-docs and these are your positions um, so your positions are filled with young persons um, and if you can leave these persons alone or let them alone or let them to be independent that is a contradiction to that what you said um, and it's a culture question how can you as a professor who get several resources um, let's say postdocs predocs and and not to think about these are your resources these are resources um, given by the university for a certain time but it's your responsibility that the young researchers became independent and that's sometimes difficult for professors female or male professors that's the same um, there is a vice rector for research sitting here and i'm sure that you have the same feeling how we can give young researchers more independency to develop their own ideas um, my second comment is to um, Mr. Fosa, um, all about the people, skills, and relationship. Um, I fully agree. And what you said, uh, we should, for example, project-based education as early as possible. Um, absolutely right. It's not, it's not easy to realize in universities with 90,000 students. <laughs> we do not have so many projects. Um, but we have to think about how we can manage it. Um, this is one, one important um, um, discussion point during our, 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 um, um, our thinking how we can design our next newly found university, technical university in Upper Austria. A project-based education should be in the DNA um, also about your things about job rotation. Um, we think about it's, there should be professors um, hired which are not coming from a straight and strict academic career. Habilitation is so important in the German-speaking countries, but it should not be an, a, a prerequisite to get a professor. We should be more open, more flexible, to get more realities in the educational sphere of a university and bringing people together at the borderlines of disciplines there maybe are new innovation emerging um, that's also my, my position um, people of the same discipline are coming together always discussing always the same issues bring different people together and let them discuss, and that will bring maybe new and fresh ideas. This is also in the DNA of the next university. It's not only specialized in informatics. We think we should bring people from informatics, but also from arts together and think about um, several issues. And Frau Schmeer, um, um, I found this, this um, uh, definition of innovation um, absolutely correct. You said, um, information, innovation means risk taking and every migrant, out migrant is taking risk. So you are a person, personalisierte Innovation. So, <laughs> um, so thank you very much for all your three ideas. I, um, my impression is these are excellent ideas. Thank you. Um, and I think in the next round, um, you could um, definitely, of course, uh, reply to, to some of the comments of the minister, but maybe also um, come back to your own organizational setting. If there are instruments or policy measures um, which you think are very valuable in enabling, providing a framework um, which helps um, either young, either students or young researchers or researchers in general to actually be able to, to, to come to impact um, and to, to come up with innovation because of, of the, the framework conditions. Would you like to start again? Yes, thank you so much. And thank you, Minister, for your, um, for your comments. And um, uh, 
as as you were speaking, I, I was reminded of of a learning I recently had in in some uh, professional coaching that our organization is doing, and that's sort of the even if you have the the mo you know if you basically can always find ten percent um, in an idea that somebody else proposes that that you agree with. So it's called the yes and method, and I think Austria, in terms of its culture, we have a sometimes a das geht nicht culture. <laughs> and I think that um, I want to like encourage us as, you know, to think about Austria becoming a yes and culture. And that would, I think, create freedom. So when we talk about freedom in the United States, and it's such a loaded word, but, you know, when I was thinking about it in the context of, of ideas, I think there's a, a sort of a, a mobility and it's sort of a build mobility of ideas, mobility of innovation, geographic mobility. And, and Austria sometimes, I think, suffers from its, from its smaller size. So, so I want to say yes and to, to that notion of independence um, because um, it's not necessarily the independence when you are a smaller you know, an becoming researcher when you're studying and, you know, you, you need good mentors and you need good structures that, that is, that goes without saying, but it's sort of like, where do you think can you go with your idea? And for me, that was always when I, when I, um, when I left Austria at the age of 17 and I started, it was an international college in Norway um, that Austria supported me with a scholarship with, but I was embraced in this chemistry class with the teacher jumping up and down. Oh my God, Andrea, you're coming to chemistry. It's wonderful to have you here. And I was just like so embraced and I just studied biochemistry. I got a scholarship and I was, you know, writing research articles in my undergraduate when I was in Canada. Whereas when I was in Austria in my Olympiade class, I was not just the only female person there it was kind of like I was barely accepted. And that that just, you know, that I just left. Like I loved chemistry, but I just left. And then and then so so another reflection on that notion of culture. Um, I was going in an international organization way, I was with Harvard, and then I was like, I want to really do something about the knowledge that we're creating in health economics and apply it. And for me, it was never a question, do I start this business in Austria? Do I start this business in the U.S.? Like, it was never a question for me. I sat there on, like, it was a Tuesday night. I incorporated my business. The next day, I had the business license. And, you know, less than a year later, I had several million dollars in funding. Well, there is a lot that went into that year to get that couple million dollars of funding. But it was never a question of any barrier of starting a business. There was zero. And I had a conversation with a friend of mine. He had a fantastic UN career as an entrepreneur and tried to do something very similar in Austria. Again, N equals one. The first three months, instead of building his business, he was running from one arm to another to get the license from one arm that they said he has to get the stamp of approval from the other arm. And he just gave up. So I think we need to learn from these anecdotes and, and question them, like what is behind them of, of, of the, uh, the barriers that people face. So I, sorry if I went a bit more personal, a little over the place, but I think takeaway from my comment is sort of have a yes and culture. Let's help, but see what we can do, but let's give freedom to that innovation spirit. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, And I think the colleagues here from the Austrian Business Agency and the Viennese Business Agency are already making notes and will definitely come back to you and come back to your colleague uh, to find out um, how to improve it um, for the next person um, to have it um, better framework conditions. Please. Uh, yeah, so I just want to pick up on that uh, about school. Right? So school, I think, I mean, elementary, uh, secondary education is really... Um, to me, it was very important. Uh, I went in Austria, went in Wels to in a HTL for electrotechnic, and I think it was it, it's a brilliant school. I don't know how it is now. I think it's 50 year. They have, they're celebrating the 50 year uh, anniversary this year. Uh, but when I was there, it, it was a great school. So I had similar experiences than you had in Werkstätten and labs and so on. So it, it, it was a very and the professors were, you know, some of them better than others, but overall they were really good guys, and they were all guys. Uh, and we were all guys. We had one girl in our class, and we treasured her like like crazy. But so it, it's really important that you get started early on, so you get kind of, you, you, 
you have a positive attitude towards, you know, hey, I want to look into that, right? I'm, I'm, and people support you in, in, uh, in your talent and push you. And, and to me, it made all the difference. By chance, I did a PhD, right? As, as a, at least in my, um, I would say my generation, we were like going to university was kind of a thing, right? So my dad, military officer post-war, um, the classical thing is you also go to work for, for the government, right? So this was kind of a stream for me to become, I don't know, an, an officer um, and hopefully general, right? So th this was kind of his, his scope and it didn't work out because, yeah, for whatever reasons. I did my AF year though. But um, so, so this initial pushing and also for the PhD, it was by chance that I did all these all this sort of things and, and, and finding mentors, finding people that really support you throughout and it might be in uh, your math class or in physics in, in the HTL, or it might be project-based learning because you get to know professors better and they just discover your talent and they push you. That's super important. So again, it goes back to this relationship. So people get really encouraged by having good relationships in the environment and learning something, something really um, uh, meaningful. And uh, if they're creative, yeah, then, then they have a career like Andrea here, right? Uh, I want to say one thing about universities and how we treat in the U.S. our professors. Um, so I'm also department chair right now, and our department has 17 faculty, which is, you know, it's small, right? Computer science, for example, has 70, 70 faculty. And you have the rank. So you have assistant professor, associate professor, that's when you get permanent, and full professor, that's when you get old. Um, and the equivalent of Oberstudienrat, I think. <laughs> And, uh, but, but when we hire professors, we don't give them much, right? We give them a salary, we give them an office, we give them equipment, we give them a starter package, which can be millions, right? That's true. But we don't give them a permanent three positions and a postdoc position, so you don't get that. But what we give them is opportunities. We say that, look, here's NSF, here's NASA, here's DARPA, DARPA is here, IARPA. So they're all the funding agencies and all these agencies just wait for good ideas, Right? They, they wait for being able to put their trust into your, into your ideas and in your, into your skills to give you money and for you to grow a research team. Um, and it's, it's a bit of a like, you know, survival of the fittest um, that, yes, after six years, you have tenure evaluation. After three years, you have this midterm uh, mid uh, or mid-tenure evaluation. So whether you get another three-year contract. But after six years, it's really, you know, you make it or you're out of the university. So there is no, there is no second chance of, of being retained as a, as a tenure professor if you don't make this tenure evaluation. So it's a bit brutal. But in reality, if, if you do your work, I would say you, you're not a genius, but you're reasonably smart. You, you, you do your work. You, you kind of push towards a goal, right? So this continued effort is really important. You get funding, you get students, and you're going to be fine. That's what I tell my folks, so that, that the newly hired assistant professors, what do I need to do to get tenure? And I basically tell them, you know, you have to publish X amounts of, of articles, and you have to get X millions of dollars in funding in the for, in these six years, right? If you don't, you will not get tenure. If you do, you will be fine. So it is a bit more... Uh, how should I say? It's not, you know, being a, becoming a professor, becoming an assistant professor is not really the solution to all your problems. It, it's like the beginning of all your problems. <laughs> and, and, and so the U.S. system is really about, A, it's about cooperation, but it's a lot about competition. And, and so there's a redundancy built in, which is great when you have 360 million people and, I don't know, thousands of universities. Austria is a different scale. It's like Virginia. I live in Virginia. Uh, and Virginia has, yeah, give or take, I think, seven universities, but, but really just four research universities, right? So, and, and Austria has many more. You mentioned 22, I believe, right? 23 soon? And one coming, one in the pipeline. All right. So, so Austria has a lot, right? So in, in terms of a lot to offer in terms of universities. I hope I didn't ruin the chances of Upper Austria getting a TU, a technical <laughs> university now, so... But, but that's what I'm saying. So the system is fundamentally different, but also the society is, more, is different, right? Yeah. So it's, that's just what I want the comment on you made on, mm -hmm. on faculty. But successful people get really pushed very high, mm -hmm. and not successful people will be struggling all their life. That, it is just how it is here. Mm -hmm. yeah. May all I right. just... Um, I have not heard anything about impact of research or 
um, making a change to society or sore or, spot, sore spot, right? Because because it, it a lot of it is uh, we publish papers and we appreciate the other scientists that are in our kind of uh, group field um, that they appreciate our papers. So getting to it, the impact stage is really, I, th- I say, really happens a very small fraction of of uh, researchers and, and research results. Um, and so these this technology transfer offices like, you know, Stanford, MIT, Caltech, those are the places where this stuff really happens. Um, I'm fleece-bound, so really, you know, stuff really goes out a lot. Uh, in other universities, I don't think it happens that fast, right? So I think it's, it's more like a drip sometimes. And, and if you go down the ranking, it doesn't happen at all. And I think many, many researchers are content with increasing their, their age index and, and really um, and publishing more and more papers. So really making an impact takes a lot of effort and is also unfortunately not in many places not rewarded in the tenure process, mm-hmm. right? So it is... Um, when I tell, for example, my, my, uh, some, of, some of my professors in the department saying that if you publish stuff on GitHub, so you share your software, it's open source software, so that other people can take it and run with it, for me, that's a big benefit. But it's not everywhere like that, right? So I reward that because that makes an impact. Mm-hmm. Other people are just happy to write it up and, and publish it in a conference where, you know, few people actually read the paper. Thank you. I think this is something we will come back to later on. Please, Sonia. It is a great transition point that you're talking about the age index, for example, because I think it's a perfect example of like Goodhart's law, where the metric becomes the target. And this is important when we're trying to think about like how do we measure excellence? How do we measure success, right? Like if we are trying to optimize for the metric, the metric becomes useless. And this is the case in science. And that's why we have a reproducibility crisis because we are optimizing for, you know, impact factors. But it's also a problem like in the industry when you're trying to optimize for profit or you're trying to optimize for IPs and et cetera. So I think these are important things and that need to be discussed. And, you know, it's not like we have to take it for granted either. I think like we can change incentives. So I applaud your um, your endeavor of like creating a new university, one that sounds to be more interdisciplinary. I think this is this is excellence. <laughs> uh, I would also encourage you to not just like think of artists, but really of social scientists, of uh, philosophers, ethicists. My husband works uh, for Google at machine learning, fairness, and ethical questions. And they are really hiring a whole range of individuals in order to like make next generation uh, artificial intelligence and technologies, where it's utterly important to also understand what it actually means. And again, like I'm, I'm talking about these cultural values, but what, what does fairness mean, right? Uh, so it, it's really important to get everybody on the table. And then I would also say to not, you, you know, to not just keep them in a lab, but send them out into the world and include the community and include the user when you are building technological systems. Because I think that otherwise the money is, of course, great, but wealth alone should not be taken, mistaken for innovation. I think that's really important. And then I just briefly also want to speak to the uh, you know small businesses. That, that's really an area that I have been working in. Like my, The company that I work for is considered a small business, but it's really functioning as a research lab. It actually came out of Honeywell Aerospace during a time when big companies like basically left the research labs. They like gave up like blue sky research for the benefit of using small businesses as these laboratories where they can then experiment. And the U.S. is pretty well positioned, like using, for example, small business research innovation grants or or so-called SBRRs or also STTRs, small tech transfer innovation grants, specifically designed to be to fail, really. Like they are like structured in a way where you have different phases and you should also fail quickly. One of my favorite DARPA program managers who also happens to be an anthropologist, the only one so far, used to say, if I don't get fired if I don't almost get fired, I don't do my job right. 
uh, <laughs> managed to almost get fired actually, <laughs> but <laughs> or they, they have a tenure and then they, they leave eventually. But I think it's important to keep in mind if you want to have innovation that you also have funding vehicles in place that where you are okay that like maybe 20 or 30 percent of the money are not going anywhere. But maybe they go somewhere really innovative through accidental findings, through, some, through something that you didn't plan or that something that you, you know, don't expect as an outcome. Um, yeah, that, that's basically the, ma the major points that I want to make to, to this discussion or question. Minister, would you like to comment? <clears throat> yeah, maybe I, I put the point of, of Dieter Foser once again. Um, and I will not, will not defend the Austrian system of hiring and, and, and giving specific resources, but because you have to take into account we are dependent um, from the standards from our, let's say, from our surrounding countries. So if it's, if it's common in Germany, and I know it as a former professor of the TU München, you get your resources, and that means you give, you get positions and the positions are related to you so long as you are retired um, and there is no midterm evaluation you get it um, um, I, I have I have a lot of sympathy for this much more brutal way of giving a starting package um, and then look what what have you done after let's say 10 years or six years with a starting package uh, and was it let's say a good investment or not but changing a culture is not like um, switching the light on or off. Um, it's a long way. Um, and if we found a new university, this new university will be based on a new university law specific for this University of Upper Austria. Because it's clear if you bring it into the system of the 22 um, other universities, we are sticked. In, in the old system, but we want to have some experimental situation. Um, and if some elements are good, maybe then we can transfer it from this experimental situation to the 22 universities. Thank you. And I think the same is true for ISD Austria, which is research only, um, PhD student, postdoc students and professors, and they are simply hired for their idea and not for the track record. And then there's the tenure procedure as well, and um, doctoral students and postdoc need to leave anyway. So there is, uh, it's clear, it's um, brain circulation um, and excellent research. Um, but that was only possible because it was um, a greenfield project um, with a specific law and not within in the, the regular setting. Um, and as far as the, the data, and sharing data is concerned, I think that within the European Union and Austria, with the fair data approach, um, the findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable, um, and that the funding agencies like the FWF um, and the European Union in the Horizon Europe um, is um, giving clear guidelines that that should be the norm for basic research. I think that that's very helpful and might be the value-based idea of what is different in the European Union also in the discussion of um, artificial intelligence um, and cooperation in general in technology, there is um, a lot of discussion on which values should this be based on in the European Union and also in Austria. And this leads me actually to the second uh, part, um, and we only have 11 minutes left, um, but it would still be very interesting for us to find out um, if you witness a change uh, with the new government in, in the um, areas of, of societal challenges, where funding is now focused on, if there are new programs, um, something that's already um, has become visible. Um, and then we will have a discussion with all of you and Hannelore will take over. Maybe you start first because you always come last. <laughs> I always come last. No, I think that, I mean, there's, a, of course, a lot of global challenges, uh, you know, primarily like pandemic readiness and, and climate change, I think is, is out of question. But I think in my area where I come from, it's really misinformation and disinformation uh, more broadly. It's a it's an enormous problem that uh, where, where global collaboration is utterly important because we, we've all experienced like how 
the, how we consume information has also changed the way we think, right? Like we feel like we are overloaded by information, but at the same time, we don't trust the information anymore. So it has actually become, gotten worse. The kind of information we are consuming, like journalism, for example, has not really improved. Like, so it ca causes a lot of confusion. And this is like a place that is really like exploited by, and you know, this, that they, they maybe don't share the same values, the same de democratic values. Uh, there's a lot of misinformation campaigns going on that's considered a cyber warfare that, that is taking place and it is influencing like our very own fabric. We have seen it in the US, we have seen it in the French elections, there's constantly interferences in, in elections that are very targeted and sophisticated. And they work really well because we are, <laughs> We're, there's a lot of social science stuff, but we are clinging on to our social identities in, in many ways. And that means that very often when I consume a piece of information on the internet, it becomes more important that, that I signal my social identity, that I signal to my in-group that by liking or resharing or retweeting something, I'm actually belonging to this group. And this social signaling is overriding accuracy motives, which means like we are perfectly comfortable with false information as long as it's aligned with our values. This leads to polarization and this leads to radicalization in the online environment. And the, com and the campaigns that we are exposed to are making really perfect use of it. I think it's extremely important, both on a global scale uh, when we are thinking about democratic values in, you know, the kind of like um, caught in between like the quick and dirty way of like, Asia and like the slow and clean way of, of Europe here as well. But it's really important to maybe think about like new ways of providing information to Austria in particular. And uh, a close friend and excellent investigative journalist in Switzerland, Hannes Grassiger, for example, is starting a new uh, form of like Swiss local uh, social network where um, you where we are sharing like a base reality, where the goal is really that there's checks and balances in place to provide high quality information to the Austrian people. Uh, I think when this is really a challenge that is not just you know, global, but also local, because everything that is global is ultimately also local. So I would really encourage us to think about that as one of the, you know, fundamental issues, apart from, you know, the obvious ones uh, that, that, like, is, that is happening right now and that's, that is going very slow, but that we are really exposed to. So. Thank you. Dieter, please. Um, yeah, so about the changing uh, initiatives from the federal government, so the U.S. traditionally, I look and I read that um, in preparation for today, uh, the, the, the U.S. or the, the federal research funding in the U.S. was really always tied to crises. So each time something came along, think of it going back to uh, Civil War, um, Second World War, Cold War, Sputnik. Sputnik was a big trigger for NASA, DARPA, and so on. So there was a lot of funding push from that. Um, oil crisis, and so on, up until um, the Cold War kind of broke away and that kind of actually f resulted in a dip of, in, in federal funding. So there was no enemy, right? So there was no, um, nobody to, to be competitive against. So the funding actually dropped a lot. And, this, and the dot-com bubble, um, that was interesting, actually, to think about it that way, kind of camouflaged a lot of that um, loss in innovation power in the United States. And uh, it really happened after the dot-com bubble and, and kind of burst a bit that um, funding actually picked up again. Uh, but what happened in the U.S. is really, um, so industrial production really went down and industrial innovation really went down. And, and if you want to tie it back politically to, to um, the Republican Party and to the Trump campaign, that really kind of hurt you know, the Democratic Party and really hurt elections in that sense because, you know, they, everybody was so focused on IT and the, those efforts that they really forgot about industrial production and, and the U.S. really took a backseat there. Uh, now with the, I, I would say with the new government, what has changed are two things. A, um, people actually dare to use the word science again, right? You're, you're, not, you're not like uh, put in a corner as a crazy person. But, but you can actually make a rational scientific argument and, and you can actually say that you're a scientist. Um, and so, no, but I mean, it might be a bit exaggerated, but, but there is this general um, 
feeling about science of being something useful and um, not being argued against. So I think that has changed and that makes many people just feel better and be more productive. And the other thing is, I, I would say Biden, like with, with the climate agenda, they, they, they put topics on, on researchers' agenda saying that, you know, we have to look into that and here's the funding to do so. I don't know. With COVID especially, it was, really, it was really a very immediate crisis and there was a lot of money from NIH, NSF, and various funding agents and also DOD. That was a lot of funding that just came out of nowhere because Congress was appropriating like ginormous amounts of money, even more than 800 billions, so trillions of dollars. Um, and researchers benefited from that. But I think it, that's really an outlier. But, but overall, in terms of policy, I think the Biden administration is really very cognizant of, of issues that one needs to address and is willing to put the funding on the table. Uh, I, I think it's, it's, of course, a problem because, you know, not many people are too excited about paying more taxes in order to support scientists. So it's a political issue, but at that. But overall, when, when the U.S., basically, federal funding for research is going down, actually, over the years. Uh, and is declining and is now far back. I read it's like out of a ranking of 38 industrialized countries, the U.S. is only 23 when it comes to federal research funding. So a lot of it's done by the, by the private sector. Um, but at least you can discuss issues and at least you know, your, your work gets recognized and at least there will be innovation towards solutions that affect climate change, renewable energy, uh, et cetera, et cetera, which was not the case in the past four years. Okay, thank you. Andrea, please. Yes, thank you so much. Um, just to echo what uh, Dita said about um, the change that we've seen, I think the change around science in a new administration is is is, is that the you know embracing of science um, and and even you know if science says we don't know it perfectly to real to to at least understand that there's a scientific process and to appreciate it and that is evidenced in a new uh, funding that's available, but just generally the dialogue and the the positions that are being filled and the science being recognized through those positions and uh, the, the, the stopping of muzzling of science, that, that was definitely the case, but it's still the case in some states, unfortunately, when it comes to COVID. I want to take the minute or so that I have to talk about the global challenges and the role of innovation in global challenges. And I think that, you know, having started as sort of a basic science researcher and now really working on the translation of research, because I see like in the field that I work, I see three global challenges, and that is the one of climate change and um, currently with the you know the pandemic is a global challenge and making sure that we have access to the innovation and that we that as governments and policymakers that they actually implement the innovation at the speed that is necessary to curb pandemics and then the, the field that I work is in in is chronic diseases um, and um, prevention and early treatment which can save you know four to five percent of GDP a year actually but in there, it's not so much in that we need a new drug or that we need a, you know, a new solar panel or something like that in climate change. We actually need to just apply what we know and we need to use the tools of social science and behavioral economics and other things to actually make them work and apply them, right? So... And I think that is, I just wanted to also mention it because I know we have fantastic, um, you know, um, R&D scientists and, and innovators in the room, but we need to also then apply that innovation. And that also needs to rest on sort of understanding of social science. Um, and um, yeah, so just stopping at that, I know you want to probably comment. Thank you. And that, I think this is very important because this is also the discussion we have on the mission orientation of research um, in the European Union and how to implement it also nationally, uh, because you need the, the other policy sectors, you need the regulators, and um, this is where really the challenges come in. Minister, please. Yes, I want, I want to comment what, what Sonia, you, you, you told and described, and I absolutely agree that this is a real issue. Misinformation in the society, the effects of social media, um, of, of communication, internal structures. Um, aber, jetzt komme ich zu Ja, aber. Um, <laughs> what should ja, we do? <laughs> Not only Ja und, sondern Ja, aber. Was, 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 what, what can we do? We cannot turn off um, the social media. And your suggestion is to... to, to uh, we should provide quality assured information. Yes, uh, we can do it. And the ORF, our broad public broadcast company, is doing it. But beside of that, 
we have the bubble of social media and they're producing their own communication structures. In other words, um, we are living in a time where science is, is, is not a bad word, um, correct. Scientists are now in the core, um, in the core um, to solve global issues and they can do it. Maybe um, if, if we have enough money, enough resources, enough time perspective. It's an illusion to say now it's science um, beginning with their work and all these issues are solved immediately. For me, as a social scientist, I find it interesting that global problems are still global problems, but disappeared from the public communication. Um, so there is no strict relation between a challenge and a political challenge. It's always a question what identify you as a challenge. Um, population development, for example, um, the growth of population, the aging of population, demographic change. For me, I would say this is a real, real issue. Um, but it disappeared from the political landscape. Um, so um, everything is relative. <laughs> Although the question, what is a real political challenge? Thank you. And it's now time to hand over to Hannah Lore. We all stay on stage and there will be now a discussion um, with all of you, hopefully. Thank you so much. What an, what, what an interesting discussion. It's your time now. If you have questions, well, first of all, let me repeat, the microphones will be sanitized in between different speakers. Um, if you have questions or comments to any or anyone here on the panel, uh, please get up uh, or just wave your hands or make yourself make it known that you have something to say. And please uh, let us know who you are and your affiliation. So, questions. There's one. Um, Jana Kainestoff. Okay, uh, Jana Kainestoff, I'm an associate professor in biomedical engineering at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, I am still on the tenure track, even though I'm promoted to associate, I'm still not tenured. Um, but I started as an assistant professor with a large check, with resources, with people, with space, and so on. And I would like to make a comment about, Minister, what you have said earlier about uh, it's the responsibility of a professor to support innovation of the PhD students, as in that the resources given to a professor, and you were talking specifically for Austria, that those resources do not belong to the person, but the professor has a responsibility to help the students. I would say that's much easier done in the US because I have a startup package I can afford having my students work on something that is not related to my research. And I've done that. I've spent tens of thousands of dollars on a student who came to me and said, I have this crazy idea. Will you support me? I could do that in the US. Can you really do that in, in Europe when the students help the professor work on their projects? There are not the same resources available. I think it's the yeah, question to you. Maybe the, 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 the active <laughs> vice rector is helping answer this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure we can get a microphone to them. If, if yeah, sure. you would like to say something. Yes, uh, I don't know if this microphone is on, but I, my voice is usually yes. very loud. So I found this interesting, and this was, it was touched upon also before in the discussion which we had. Uh, actually, in Austria, we have something like a tenure position. You know, of course, uh, what I'm talking about, the paragraph uh, 99.5 uh, professorships, which is exactly patterned. Yeah, I have to ex explain it. Uh, it's exactly patterned after the American system. So the idea is that you hire a young uh, researcher relatively early in the career, you make a clear promise, we give you six years to fulfill your tenure agreement, and then you become tenured, you're, you become a full professor. It's slightly different than the US. But the idea is the same. We give you 
um, six years where we, we try to see uh, how you develop. If you develop well, uh, you become uh, permanent. The problem is uh, what I see at our universities, this is used quite differently. So some uh, rectors I talk to, they say it's a fantastic instrument. We do it like the, uh, in the US. This also means that not everybody gets tenured automatically. Other universities, I'm not mentioning which ones, they, you, if you, the moment you're in, it's also guaranteed you pass it. Uh, they make you pass. Uh, and then it's, it's not very well invested, not a very well uh, implemented tool. So I don't know if this relates to your question. So in, pin in principle, the tools are there, but the understanding how to use them uh, is not uniform uh, over Austria. Maybe this is an input to the discussion. But there's more wise rectors in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> Would somebody else like to comment on that? Or we have, ah, here we no, I, I only want to say, because of that problem, different university handle and manage the paragraph 99.5 in a different way. Therefore, we, there is now a monitoring process starting, organized by unserem Wissenschaftsrat, who systematically uh, compare uh, the management system in the different universities concerning 99.5. And after, I don't know, half a year, one year, we can sit together and discuss the results. I would be very much interested. Yeah. <laughs> There's a question over yeah, there, I'm, please. I'm Georg Reichert, um, grew up in Austria, uh, TU Graz absolvent, and I'm a professor and department chair in building construction at Virginia Tech. And so I would like to add some similar but different perspectives um, to the tenure process specifically and how we look at criteria and innovation. So we have observed similar tendencies with assistant professors that we hire and looking now at impact papers. Yeah? Uh, for example, we have seen an increased number of what I call overview papers, uh, literature studies, and they make a good citation impact, but not innovation. And so this is a problem that we have to address specifically in a domain that I have that is very resistant to innovation. So construction is really backwards here in the US, so I admit it. Uh, that's why we look so good as Austrians if we come in. Um, but this is a, a challenge that we need to address in academia. And the other one is we need to show exit, track, um, exit opportunities for people. Just because they do not get tenured, they may be just at the wrong institution. And so this is a warning for Austria. If we go that direction, we need to have several other avenues for them. Um, because you know, we are reviewing externally our assistant professors, and I just have to write one of those reviews now. And it doesn't look good. <laughs> so, this, this, this person needs to have an exit strategy as well, that we have the responsibility as reviewers uh, on that side. That was not, yes. I only want to say it's an important point, exit strategy, um, career development. Um, and there is a responsibility um, more within the universities than the political sphere. Um, outplacement, a help for outplacement of colleagues which are not able to stay forever in the academic sphere. Don't let the people alone if they are not so, so successful. And, if, and this should be identified so early as it possible. Um, don't say to, let's say, 45 years old people, um, your academic career is not possible to pro prolong, make it much earlier. But you're completely right. We have to think about such exit strategies. Hi, my name is Florian Zak. I'm an assistant professor also at Virginia Tech, but I'm in the College of Business. Um, one thing that I realized that's quite different in the U.S. than in Austria is the hiring process for assistant professors. I don't know other colleges how, um, how they do that. But at least in business schools here in the U.S., usually when you hire assistant professors, the idea is you hire them for six years 
in those six years, they can prove themselves to secure tenure, and then they have that permanent position. Um, so the investment from a university is quite high. You hire for six years, and potentially you hire somebody for the rest of their lives to work for this institution. So when we hire, we usually post the positions a year ahead of time. Hiring is done 99% of the time. We only hire people starting in the fall semester, like at the beginning of fall. So there's no hiring throughout the year. There's no fluctuation. So nobody leaves in the middle of the semester, and then the courses are left without instructors. Um, and we... Uh, at least pre-pandemic, we flew people in. I think for every person that we consider hiring, we spend about $10,000 to fly them in, be it domestically or internationally. So there's a lot of energy spent on that. And I'm not sure if this is happening the same way in Austria. I know it's expensive, but on the long run, you try to find the most, like the best, ed the best candidates and the, most, the highest fit for the institution, for, uh, essentially in perpetuity. Okay. We have a question Hannelore. over there. The Hannelore, middle, can I say first something? Answer, yes. Just, just a quick comment on that. I, and um, it was mentioned before, one thing that I like in the U.S. is fail fast, right? So you have, you have uh, faculty, you try to weed them out after three years or six years, right? So you have, you have research ideas that you try, like, for example, in DARPA, they are what they call seedlings. So they're, they're, they give you, I don't know, $250,000 to just try, it and, uh, try out an idea in like six months, eight months, and see if the crazy idea you have actually works. So th there are pots of money for that in the U.S. And if you can convince the funding agencies that your idea is crazy enough and you are kind of good enough that you might make a dent into this crazy idea, they, they will let you run with it, right? So So... And I try to do the same with, with PhD students. So basically, they, they have a topic. Yeah, but don't do uh, four years of research, and then you figure out it's wrong. Or don't keep a person around for 20 years and then tell him he's not suited to do that. Do it fast. Do it like in half a year. Do it in a year. And, and then let them move on or let them do something else. So I think this fail fast, trying out something, even if it's crazy, the cost is low when you pull the plug quickly rather than keeping things going forever. And, and Tita, can you say something about the evaluation criteria of these crazy ideas? Um, um, we, it, because we have the problem of yeah. how you should evaluate emerging fields. So I think we have the same type of project manager. Um, and so he, he yeah, uh, well, he's not in Maryland. So, so what they do is, in, in, for example, in DARPA, right? In DARPA, it's, it's very program manager driven. So they basically set up a guy, so they hire somebody for four years, give him $50 million or $100 million, and tell him, you go, define your own program. Of course, to hire somebody uh, in a particular subject area, like the anthropologist we know. And he, um, you know, he basically tries to do um, um, whatever, tries to help folks with uh, social science-based approaches, sociology, anthropology-based approaches, and, and to just improve decision-making. Um, now, some the seedlings work like DAPA is based on these crazy ideas that, that you know, high risk, high reward. Um, and it's not expected that you solve the problem, but it is expected that within a year, you make this impossible problem more plausible. Right? So you gain some insights, you, you, you get some early results that might actually hint at the possibility of solving it. And for that, they give you $250,000. So that's kind of the approach. I, I may add to that because I did this. So that, that is one way, a seedling, and that's generally program manager dependent. But DARPA also has like a, a new avenue of funding, which is called AIE or AI Explorations. And this is a very quick turnaround, uh, meaning like the evaluation, which is often based on like a committee of experts that will read those like very short proposals. It's just eight pages. Um, happens within 90 days. So, uh, very, you know, like the notification, you write the proposals, but it is made easier, and maybe that's, an, that's the important piece of information I want to say here. It's made easier because it's very templated, right? You have, like, a, a milestone outline. You have a task outline. So the evaluation, like, is easier because you can compare the different proposals because you have, you have a timeline that you set for them, 
with, that you kind of have to fill in. Uh, this is usually one million for about a year and a half, and it's also like two phases where you get like half in the first, you know, six or nine months, and then the, the second one if you if you show success. So there's always a down select, and these are excellent vehicles to try out ideas. But I also want to, if I may, just comment on. Um, your suggestion or your, uh, you guys talking about like the difficulty from within academia. And I left academia for a reason. <laughs> but um, the, the thing I think, I, I really liked your idea about like, you know, the in innovation index. Again, DARPA has something called like tech technical readiness levels, for example. And I think and, and the higher up you are in technical readiness levels, starting out with really basic uh, tier one is basic research, the higher up you are, the higher the pot gets, or the bigger the pot gets. I think this is like where uh, the academia and the industry collaboration is like extremely important, especially in fields like yours, where publication impact in itself shouldn't be the dominant factor, but innovation or technical readiness impacts. And that's something that Austria can do. There's no, there's no reason why not. Why, why can't we not, like, for example, assign these kind of evaluation criteria? Because it would facilitate also how to get the science and to get the research from academia out into applied sciences. And it would also open up new collaborations and new job opportunities like outside of tenure track. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question first. Yeah, you get two microphones, <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. I hope, I hope you can hear me like um, with the mask on. So uh, my name is Christine Marizzi. I'm a science professional and outreach specialist from Columbia University, Bayebas. Um, I just want to bring up one aspect. I mean, I have a lot of things in my head right now, but I want to comment to one specific aspect about that came up in the panel, like and pivoting from like, you know, how you felt when you were a student in an educational system, right? The idea of like belonging, right? Where, how far do we have to go to make somebody belong? What kind of, you know, infrastructure do we make to just like, you know, really like foster innovation at a very early age? Um, I think those stories, I mean, I have a similar story. I went to a specialized high school and I was one of seven girls, right? And again, how to foster his identity later on? Like, you know, I was never given a safe space to fail there was no project-based learning. So these are things you can just, like, you know, you, we had this idea about you can change culture because culture is eating, like, strategy for breakfast. You all heard this, right? But in, you still do in this space that you have, you do what you can. So what is your commitment to, like, bring science and society together? I know we have Sparkling Science, which is fantastic. I'm so excited. That we have a new call, right, open right now, and I hear those grants are going fast. So... Is there a commitment to have another round of Sparkling Science after this? Is there a commitment to do more programs? Because, again, if you get that excitement into people's heads early enough, um, you're going to create a culture of innovation, not only at university level, and hopefully the infrastructure is also going to be more supportive, but what's happening around this. I would really appreciate an answer. Thanks. Yeah, yes, um, yes and yes. Um, the, the Austrian Agency for Education and Internationalization also has now a three-year agreement, and um, there is money for more than one call um, because this new program is actually geared towards 10 years um, of funding um, citizen science plus uh, cooperation between schools, higher education higher education and research organizations. Uh, but what URD is also doing, and, and you can talk to Jakob during the break, um, a lot of educational programs that were run by the ministry ourselves are now handled by the URD. Um, and there is a, a focus on STEM activities. Um, and what we are trying within the ministry now is actually from kindergarten to research to have this um, multiple um, amount of activities um, within one umbrella framework um, so that it's actually clear that when you're in, how, how to get people to STEM and keep them, because that's also one of the ambitious goals in our strategy, that we should have 20% more graduates in Mint um, and also more academic spin-offs and startups. So, yeah, a lot of cooperation, hopefully. We have another question there. Hi, um, I'm Simone. Um, most of you probably know me from Stanford, but I moved to Cornell as faculty um, before the pandemic. Um, I'm also an invited professor at Lindt. So, <laughs> yeah, my question is mostly uh, for you. I was wondering what um, if you could comment on dual citizenship for 
scientists um, like us? <laughs> That's a question that had to come up. <laughs> what, what can I do? Um, this, this is, this is um, in the political competence of the uh, Minister for Internal Affairs, um, though the principal uh, decisions and the executive decision is handled by the Austrian lender. Um, um, for me, it's clear that if persons do have strong links to Austria still, if they are living in other countries, but they have strong links to Austria, they can prove strong links to Austria. Then it is, from the, from the standpoint of Austria, it would be a fine and wise decision to say, okay, um, we, we, we want to keep you as, let's say, as a tenth Austrian federal country, as the zehnte Bundesland, as the Auslandsösterreicher, Austrian living um, abroad, we want to keep you in our um, Austrian community. Um, for me, it's, it's, it's clear, and I, I hope there is a change in the thinking of dual citizenship. You know, we, we granted the, the dual citizenship not only to emigrants after 38, but also to the descendants of these emigrants. So there is a there is a wider um, uh, and wider eligible um, group of people for the dual citizens. And I do hope that there is a change. And I will um, give my influence, if I have some, into that respect and, and it would argue in the same way as I do it here. May I just add, because I know that this is a question that's dear to the heart of a lot of people here. Do you see any initiatives somewhere? Or I know it's the Ministry of Interior. Is there any, do you see any indication that there might be a change? No, the indication I, I characterized is that okay. enlargement of the, of the eligible um, um, people, descendants of 38 um, immigrants. This is a this is how say, a, a clear change uh, because they was not born in Austria. Yeah. Maybe they don't live in Austria. Um, they don't have to prove emotional or practical links to Austria. The only element of proving is I'm a descendant yeah. of an, of an um, 38 immigrant. Um, so don't give up the hope. I just have to comment on this, but I want to talk about culture, but I'm going to talk 20 seconds about citizenship. I think what I was, I was one of the lucky ones. I, I, I received uh, the permission when I got the American citizenship to keep my Austrian one. And I, uh, I'm, I, I am really privileged and I love it. And I'm Austrian and American and, you know, it's, 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 it's fantastic. But what, what helped me was I got a, um, I, I got a lot of like support letters. Um, I was very involved with Astana. So I got support letters with Astana leadership, uh, then the uh, consul general, um, so I was leading the Austrian, uh, sorry, the Harvard Club of Austria. And maybe that helped, but you know, like I think all of us in the room. I mean, I think I, I don't want to speak for everyone, but I think we all have very strong ties to Austria by virtue of just being part of these groups. And so, you know, maybe there could be, you know, not at the legislative level, but just at the you know support letter level, something like you know part of Austrian scientists of North America, putting putting a real face other than, you know, in addition to, you know, Mozart and Sound of Music, which we have no, um, which is, I think, probably the best uh, f ad for Austria. But, you know, may maybe something like that. Maybe that's a yesable solution that, that we can get these support letters. I want to speak, however, just a few moments about culture. And I actually moved back to Austria for a year during the pandemic with my son because our school closed down here. And I thought at least at the first wave of the pandemic, Austria was doing much better than the U.S. And I can speak a lot about public health and science, application of science and how fast people reacted and didn't react for the second and the third wave. But what I've seen is sort of there's a window of opportunity for Austria right now, I think, that still exists due to this pandemic, which is a lot of people really thought about, I can work from anywhere in the world, and I want to work somewhere where it's comfortable, where I have good health insurance, and where I'm embraced. I'm going to say one word. It's called MA35. So the question is, you know, high living standards meet MA35, and then who wins? 
but um, I think that there, there's, there's really like if you, I think there's an opportunity and the question is how can you harness that opportunity of people actually coming back to Austria right now during the pandemic, working virtually, you know, still for other institutions, but um, and how can you integrate them and how can you also allow them and their skills to become integratable into the Austrian innovation um, economy. Um, uh, and then also, um, I've also you know, I've hired a lot of babysitters and, and household help while I was in Austria as well. And that was the most educated and driven household help I've ever had. They had masters, they were studying for masters, they were at the TU and everyone else. And everyone really wanted to get their education in Austria because Austria had a good reputation and they came, you know, from Syria, from, from Serbia and others, but they struggled greatly in terms of both with the integration system and also with um, scholarship support. Um, again, N equals three or N equals five, but I think there is this opportunity and we would have to look at how do we, how do we embrace that, that, that hunger for, for making a difference with their scientific careers, but then struggling with, with literally the basics, which is, you know, um, I'm getting responses from the professors and, and getting the necessary support to make it work in their scientific careers. Again, just anecdotes, but I want to talk a little bit about culture, culture as well. Thank you. We have time for, yes, one more question here. And we have another question over there. Yeah, two more questions over there. Um, I want to thank you for that question. My name is Sabine Oler, and, and um, with the Vienna Business Agency, I'm together here with uh, four ladies, also with the Austrian Business Agency. I don't have all the answers, but I'm grateful for this question. We know that it's uh, it's a topping every year, and I want to uh, have uh, starting solutions. First of all, we want to collect all your cases. We want to listen to you. We want to um, understand what's driving anyone in this room um, re uh, with, uh, regarding this topic. And uh, we want to um, invite you for tomorrow. We are, we're hosting a, uh, a brunch at 11.30. It's uh, right next door at the old Abbott's Grill between 11.30 and uh, 2 p.m. Please come to talk to four of us so we, we just know for the reservation. Um, and one specific solution we already started is we just, just, just this last past month um, initiated um, the, a business immigration office. So that's a collaboration between the Vienna Business Office's um, expat center and uh, a whole department of MA35. And so we physically started this uh, initiative um, just to you know, combine their, their expertise and our, let's say, service orientation because they, they have to work on these cases, right? We, we have the, the, the privilege and the, uh, um, I can say, the, the time. We can take the time to listen to you. They, are, you know, they, they have you know, hundreds of cases, and it's, it's really a challenge. But we, um, in our team, uh, we have the, 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 the time, the luxury of time to listen, um, to digest, to collect these questions, and to really look at it case by case. By, case, by case. And I really want to point out, it's, um, like you said, it's right now it's a window of opportunity for Austria. Um, and we want to be part of the solution. We want to address these challenges, and we, want, uh, we, we don't want them to, to go by unheard. It's a great opportunity, and it's a great uh, resource you know, and treasure for Austria as a country, um, as a location, as a business location, as a science location, um, as a location of excellence. And it's, it's part of our mission here, why we will have to come here every, every year. And I also want to take this opportunity to thank you, Minister, and your entire team um, for the generosity of including us, for the broader thinking of how uh, multiple organizations being part of this delegation can really um, collaborate and uh, be, uh, be part of the solution. So again, uh, join us tomorrow, 11.30. We really want specifically to address these things and to also um, offer you to accompany every one of you who is contemplating what does it take uh, to, to uh, come back to Austria and uh, contribute and uh, thrive in the Austrian uh, system of excellence uh, in the uh, R&D field. Thank you very much. Thank you. Maybe that's a start for some of you. Uh, we have... <laughs> Thank you. We have... Two more questions over there, and then we'll break for lunch. And we'll, you can always continue your conversations during lunch hour. Yes, please. All right. I'm, I'm Christian Forst, Icon School of Med Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York. Uh, another question or comment on citizenship. So I'm also a dual citizen. Uh, got this, this uh, agreement to maintain the Austrian citizenship and get in the U.S. 
Uh, I got that through MA35, so I have actually good experience with them. But this is actually a problem. So the law is a federal law, but this is executed by the yes. Bundesländer. Yes. So you have nine different interpretations, you have nine <laughs> different fees, and nine different solutions for this problem. And that's the thing. So it's the, depending on the uh, agreement, so which uh, uh, country or which, which Bundesland is responsible for executing this law, it is, one can either be successful or fail. And maybe there could be a solution, but I fear that it is very complicated in Austria <laughs> to <laughs> come over this summer nine Bundesländer. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think it was more, more like a comment than a question, right? <laughs> yes. So there was one more. Um, yes, hello. Uh, so first of all, I would like to express my appreciation that you know, the, the issue of citizenship is at heart of so many people of you. Could you identify yourself, please? Uh, yes. And then I'm in, uh, introducing myself. My name is uh, Anan, Anan Chang. I'm a second year PhD student in uh, robotics and AI at MIT. And uh, don't worry, my, my question will not be about citizenship, but I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, when I found out about this uh, a while ago, I was, uh, I've been bothered since, so to be honest. Um, yeah. Uh, but I would like to go back to the, to the discussion that uh, Ms. Schmer started with about misinformation and stuff, and um, uh, so that people kind of uh, prefer uh, or, or tend to... Um, uh, perform anything that's you know that that makes it appear in the group uh, and even ignore let's say um and the the factual correctness of, of what they do what they share and this reminds me of a, of a book that i re read recently uh, by ezra klein he's a he's a rising star in american journalism um this book is called why we're polarized it's more about american politics uh, but there he you know brings a lot of these examples of, of uh, group behavior one of them for example is um that you know, people are so blatantly uh, pro group, pro their own group, that you know, in some study they even tend to you know give themselves their own group one hundred dollars and the others zero instead of giving everybody two hundred. So so you know, this kind of behavior is well studied, and and exists. And um, translating to the political landscape, uh, he argues that on the one hand it's it's because um, the American two two party system, which we uh, I'd argue. Uh, luckily, don't have in Austria um, or anymore. Um, but uh, secondly, this can be tied back to uh, evolutionary uh, uh, instincts that kind of are in our brain because back in the time when we were hunters and gatherers, it was uh, preferable to uh, you know stick to the group and survive instead of being correct and die. So my question is rather, um, how do you how do you tackle this? This, this kind of behavior, if it's so deep wired into our brain, um, like, like eating sweets. Um, it, it, you know, we all kind of know that we shouldn't eat too much sugar. This is all similarly from, from the same time hardwired into our brain that, you know, that, you know you're eating those calories and stuff. Um, so so my, my question is, yeah, how do, you, how do you tackle this from this point of view? Um, that, you know, it's, it's not of sheer stupidity but it's because it's, it's uh, deeper in the back of our head. Who has an answer to that? I, I can take you that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, we are, you are exactly right. We are tribal, right? Um, there's no way around this. It's not we suddenly not going to be that. I think we should turn the bug into a feature and t turn it into an opportunity. That's what I was trying to say before when we were like, thinking through this, you know, talking about branding, thinking about like Austrian AI, uh, as one way. I think the most important thing, though, while we might not solve this very problem, is that as we are building new technology and new innovation, we should not um, take, uh, we should not like really always think that innovation is always a good thing. Sometimes they can like lead to things like misinformation. We are now experiencing the downstream consequences of technology that was developed a long time ago without checks and balances. So I think we should think about like when we are building new innovations and new technologies about who is benefiting and who is actually losing. We should think about people that are digitally invisible. We should really think about like what kind of data we are training our algorithms on and if everybody is, for example, represented at. Um, and again, as I said before, I also think we should not always think of barriers 
uh, as something bad, but they can be a safeguard. The misinformation part is like a perfect example of that because we are learning the hard way. Now we are reactive. Now we are starting with re regulations. Now we are re realizing maybe that's not the world we want to live in. So maybe we should be more deliberate but using also this tribal identity as a feature when thinking about like how can we build something local for Austrians, for the Austrian community that benefits like its people really. Okay, I think it's time for lunch after a very intensive, intense morning. Uh, thank you so much. I'd just like to tell you that there will be one minute pitches of Austrian stakeholders in science, technology and innovation during lunch. So you can you get to know and get to learn a little bit more about the organizations, the various organizations that are here today. And we'll see the top 10 posters that are part of the ARIT 2021 poster session. The award ceremony will follow in the afternoon. Uh, there is one more remark. There is a table reserved for Marshall Plan fellows and Barbara Weidgruber will be there, I believe, and Marco Schweiger. So you're very welcome to go and uh, join fellows at this table. Uh, let's be back at 1.20 and, well, enjoy your lunch. Thank you. at the International Monetary Fund here in Washington, D.C. My research focuses on the determinants and the effect of macroeconomic policies. For this, the COVID-19 pandemic was the perfect laboratory. The severity of the shock motivated very strong macroeconomic policy responses all around the world. At the IMF, we collected data on these countries' macroeconomic policies from over 190 economies. The first goal of this project is to document which and how much of these policies governments decided to use to fight the economic fallout from the COVID-19 pandemic. In the poster, you can see the countries enacted very large fiscal stimulus, significantly loosened monetary as well as macroprudential policies. The second part of the research analyzes the determinants of countries' policy responses. Our regression analysis here finds that on average, countries' pre-existing policy space is most important in determining how countries responded to the pandemic. We conclude that for the future, countries may need to place greater weight on adjusting policy space sooner to prepare for the next crisis. Thank you very much for listening. Has it ever crossed your mind whether skin is all the same? Let me tell you about differences in skin and their relationship to wound healing. We found that plantar skin is an evolutionary revolution that comes at a trade-off for skin growth. We performed our any seek with four different skin sites. Principal component analysis depicts the dorsal foot and trunk skin are highly related, whilst plantar and snout skin are unique. Something was fundamentally different than plantar skin. Trunk skin has a thin epidermis, whereas plantar skin is much thicker, with a massive stratum corneum known as callus, and is also conserved in humans. Our RNA-seq data revealed that calcium ion binding and signaling is differentially regulated in plantar skin. The epidermis typically exhibits a calcium gradient. One can see an increase in calcium, and levels drop drastically until reaching the stratum corneum. Plantar skin has lower calcium levels, and the gradient is absent. These differences led us to the hypothesis that plantar skin might display features of wound healing. On the left, you see tightly packed cells of normal skin. The center shows cells that are bigger and loosely packed in healing. Foot skin exhibits a comparable phenotype. This may be why wound healing in foot skin is impeded. Curious? Take a look at my poster. Thank you. Hello, I'm Christoph Gebauer from the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory here in California. In my role as a principal scientific engineer, I'm focusing on various challenges for the integration of renewable energy resources such as photovoltaics, battery storage, electric vehicles, and smart buildings. For this work, we applied the latest advancements in artificial intelligence to optimally control a smart building. The training process can be envisioned as an engineer, let's call him Mr. AI, being sent to a new building, trying to figure out how to best control it. At first, he might not do a good job, but after a while, say one year, he become an expert. 
Now, for training of our artificial intelligence, this is exactly what happens, except that it happens in software which allows us to accelerate time and one year of experience can be gathered within minutes. Overall, I believe that artificial intelligence paired with domain expertise will ultimately enable our transition in a clean, renewable future. Thank you very much for your attention. Please contact me if you would like to learn more. Hi, I'm Romana, and I'm studying how the trillions of microbes in our gut interact with the intestinal immune system. This is important because mucosal surfaces, including the gut, are frequent entry sites for pathogens, which cause large numbers of infections worldwide. My poster is about the role of the chemokine receptor CXO2 during the mucosal immune response following infection with the pathogen Salmonella. CXO2 is primarily known for its critical role in neutrophils during bacterial infections. However, we found that this receptor also guides B cells to certain immune follicles in the gut, also known as pious patches. B cells are the antibody producing cells in our body and can be found in large numbers in these immune follicles. Studies with germ-free mice revealed that certain members of our commensal microbiota trigger the maturation of these pious patches, which depends on the expression of CXO2 on B cells. In conclusion, our studies uncover a novel immune pathway that demonstrates how the microbiota contributes to the maturation of B cell immunity in the gut. Hi, this is Andreas Lichtenberger, and I'm a PhD student in economics at the New School. In this research project, I analyze U.S. income distribution data between 1940 and 2000, based on spatial, institutional, and social factors. The study is motivated by the question in how far U.S. income distribution is impacted by the spatial shift of deindustrialization, which is paralleled by an institutional divide in terms of labor rights. Between 1940 and 2000, the pro-labor U.S. Rust Belt declined, while the deregulated anti-union and pro-business U.S. Sun Belt rose. I analyze these distributional changes with a kernel density decomposition approach. If you want to see why I find time-varying effects of right-to-work policies and union power, sex and race-based wage discrimination exists on a cross-regional level and endorse political economic approaches that account for the formation of power relations, then please look at my poster. Until today, the implementation of solid-state electrolytes in large-scale appliances like electric vehicles is hindered by lithium filament formation when cycled at a so-called critical current density. Automotive industries have set a CCD value of at least 4 mA per cm as the goal to reach. So what does it take for us to increase the value of this factor? That is a question that is very difficult to answer, as the underlying mechanisms are in fact not entirely elucidated yet. Gathering all parameters and electrolyte characteristics that were found to be connected to this phenomenon, we base this work on three main cornerstones. Being a meticulous surface preparation to decrease interfacial resistances to a minimum, a variation of the microstructure to connect morphological to electrochemical characteristics, as well as an adjustment of the cycling program to achieve a smooth plating behavior. The combination of these actions enabled high electrochemical performances up to 5 mA per square centimeter and could in fact reveal that pulse plating is able to mitigate lithium filament propagation in the polycrystalline solid state materials. My name is Mohamed Saadoun and I'm a researcher at Kerenthe University of Applied Sciences. Waterfall surveying is essential to understand the distribution and habitats. However, traditional surveying methods can be expensive, labor intensive and risky. We want to explore the potential of machine learning here and what accuracy can we reach. The data set was collected in Bosque del Apoche Wildlife Refuge in New Mexico and we had to perform pre-processing steps such as redundant label removal and resization for better outcomes. Our results showed up to 80% accuracy in identification and 74% in classification. We have concluded that convolution neural network have potential that greatly depends on the volume, quality, and textual and structural composition of the dataset. In future, we want to investigate the performance on much larger datasets and, of course, augmentation techniques to detect rare classes. In this project, Taylor Loy and I re-examine the history of tritium production in the United States. Tritium is a radioactive isotope of hydrogen, which is used to massively increase the yield of modern nuclear warheads. The success of international arms control negotiations prompted the U.S. to shut down its military production reactors. 
This left the nuclear weapons complex without a reliable supply of tritium. Based on historical documents and interviews, we trace how multiple administrations reviewed possible options for replenishing tritium. We scrutinized the decision made in 1998 to utilize the commercial reactor at Watts Bar for irradiation services, and we focus on reconstructing the design, manufacturing, and chain of custody of the tritium-producing absorber rods, or TP bars. Finally, we discuss the implications of tritium production for the nuclear nonproliferation regime and expose the tentacles of this seemingly small operation for the rest of the nuclear ecosystem. Hi, my name is Anna Katarina von Krauland, and I'm a PhD candidate at Stanford University. My research is focused on accelerating the transition to 100% renewable energy for the United States. I'm developing a wind energy atlas that reveals the available land area and power potential for wind farm siting across all states. I do this by mapping the restrictions to wind development, including infrastructure like roads and buildings, protected land areas such as national parks, and low wind speeds that wouldn't be economical. We find that the U.S. has far greater potential for onshore energy than previously suggested, and in fact has sufficient resources to meet 2050 targets. With this atlas, wind farm developers and policymakers can reduce the time selecting a new wind farm site, as well as the upfront cost, uncertainty, and investment risk. Further, it helps transform what is currently a manual process into one that is digitized and streamlined, helping states decide where and how many wind farms to build. Thank you. Hi. MR guided focus ultrasound is increasingly used to treat neurodegenerative diseases. It uses thousands of acoustic transducers to concentrate the energy on a millimetric size focal point in the brain. However, using a free Tesla MRI, very poor imaging quality can be obtained for several reasons. First, though now only the body coil is used for imaging, and also the conductive surface of the transducer causes a destructive si signal in the image known as black belt artifact, as you can see here. For this reason, our solution is to use a flexible, very thin, and acoustic transparent eight-channel coil geometry that can be placed around the patient's head in order to increase the signal-to-noise ratio in the image. So we studied the acoustic footprint and the coil and that showed the acoustic transparency of the coil, and electromagnetic simulation and in vivo experiments show the improvement of the signal-to-noise ratio using our proposed coil over the body coil. For more information, please check out my poster and feel free to ask me any questions. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for the 2021 Austrian Research and Innovation Talk. AIRID is brought to you by the Office of Science and Technology Austria, which hosts the RENA Network, a scientist network of over 3,000 Austrian students, researchers, innovators, and entrepreneurs in North America. RENA provides you with a variety of professional support tools. Our guiding principle is to inform, assist, and connect you. Maybe you want to launch a startup, share your work with the world, or look for collaboration partners. Maybe you're seeking opportunities in knowledge exchange, or maybe you're seeking a career change. Whatever it is, the Research and Innovation Network Austria is a tool that you can use to advance your professional development, expand your network, and realize your goals. If you'd like to learn more, visit our website or find me at Eret. I'll be around. It is a pleasure to be invited to address you in this recorded message. My name is Christoph Gartinger, and I'm the president of the Austrian National Science Fund, FWF. I would like to use this opportunity for a brief overview of the role and the funding activities of the Austrian Science Fund, FWF. The task of the FWF is to fund and promote fundamental research in Austria. We support all disciplines from natural sciences, biomedical research to social sciences, humanities and arts-based research. All our funding decisions are based on international peer review. The current COVID crisis, as well as the fast global change, have demonstrated how important the role of fundamental research is for a modern society. The FWF aims at providing the best possible funding and the optimal environment for basic research. Thank you.
Greetings from the Institute of Science and Technology Austria. My name is Tom Hensinger and I wish you a very good workshop. I also have a message for you, for all Austrian scientists in North America and for all others who are interested in a scientific career in Austria. ISD Austria is growing. ISD Austria is hiring on all levels. PhD students, postdocs, junior professors on a tenure track and senior professors. And we are hiring in all fields of science, in the life sciences, physics, chemistry, mathematics, computer science, and also in earth and astro sciences and in science-related engineering topics. So, best wishes and I hope to see your application. Welcome to Open Austria, the official Austrian representation in Silicon Valley. Our structure here is quite unique as we are a collaborative initiative of three different organizations, namely the Austrian Foreign Ministry, the Austrian Trade Commission, and the Austrian Investment Agency. Here at Open Austria, it is our mission to connect Austria to Silicon Valley through our different initiatives and focus areas. Our main focus areas include business, startups, and accelerator programs, attracting invest investment from Silicon Valley to Austria, our art and tech lab, where we connect Austrian artists to Silicon Valley technologists, and our tech diplomacy efforts, where we host the first ever Austrian tech ambassador, who was the second tech ambassador appointed in the world. Additionally, we host a variety of community events and programs for our local Austrians living in Silicon Valley. We hope to see you in San Francisco soon. Hello, my name is Dietrich Haubenberger and I'm the president of ASCINA, the Austrian scientists and scholars in North America. ASCINA is the first and only independent network of Austrian scientists and scholars in North America and is organized in 13 chapters in the US, Canada and Mexico, as well as back home in Austria and across several alumni chapters in Europe. We at ASCINA share the conviction that the Austrian intellectual landscape shall not end at its national borders. Through our network activities, both locally and virtually in our chapters, it is our goal to connect and support those who share academic and or personal roots in Austria, to enrich the careers and professional development of our members across all career stages while in North America. Our main activities across all chapters are the annual ASCINA Awards and our mentoring program that connects early career scientists with accomplished ASCINA members who are successful scientists or scholars in their respective field. We invite you to go to www.ascina.at and sign up to become part of our network. We can't wait to get to meet you. Dear ARIT participants, my name is Edeltraut Stiftinger and I'm Managing Director of Austria Wirtschaftsservice, which is the state-owned promotional bank to drive innovation and growth within the Austrian economy. And that's also why the main topic of this year's ARIT, um, technology transfer or knowledge transfer from academic research to spin-offs, startups and companies is of highest interest to us. We have been funding for many years three dedicated Austrian knowledge transfer centers. And right now our main and most important uh, programs, funding programs concerning knowledge transfer are pre-seed and seed financing. These programs bridge the financial gap for, of uh, innovative startups developing uh, high-tech products from idea uh, to market. I wish you a very exciting conference and many greetings from Vienna. Are you a researcher thinking about working in Austria in any area of science? We will introduce two European funding schemes that might be of interest to you. My name is Theria Slindahl. I am Yasmin dorak strauss and we are from the Austrian Research Promotion Agency. The LSCA postdoctoral fellowships support projects for researchers of any nationality with a PhD applying together with the European host organization of their choice. The ERC funds investigator-driven groundbreaking research. 
these prestigious grants support promising research leaders and established scientists. Are you interested? We can help you identify the right program and support you in the application process. You are welcome to contact us at researchcareer at ffg.at. Servus from Austria. Hello, my name is Marco Schweiger and I'm the director of the Austrian Marshall Plan Foundation. The main aim of our foundation is to foster transatlantic excellence. We are doing this by organizing conferences, publishing books, and providing research fellowships. Students and researchers up to the PhD level are eligible to apply for such a fellowship. So if you are a student, a principal investigator of a research group, or a professor with master or PhD students, this fellowship might be an excellent opportunity for you or your young colleagues. Interested? More information on our homepage, marshallplan.at. Thank you. The University for Continuing Education claims is the only public university for academic continuing education within the German-speaking world, an entire university dedicated to lifelong learning. Our research is motivated by the desire to find answers to the major challenges facing society today. The university is part of European international research networks and increasingly involved in projects under Horizon 2020 and Horizon Europe, as mobility and cross-border cooperation are essential for the pursuit of our main strategic goal, to become the leading university for continuing education in Europe. Staff members and around 8,000 students from more than 80 countries contribute to this goal creating an international and diverse atmosphere at our beautiful campus in the UNESCO World Heritage Region, Wachau. Ladies and gentlemen, dear bright minds. My name is Hermann Arkes. I'm the executive director of Fulbright Austria. Fulbright Austria promotes mutual understanding, cooperation and knowledge transfer between Austria and the United States of America by sponsoring educational and cultural exchange programs. We fulfill this mission by managing the Fulbright program, coordinating a national-wide teaching assistantship program, and counseling students and institutions on opportunities to study in the US as an Education USA Advising Center. Do not hesitate to contact us if you want to learn more about our initiatives. The OEAD is Austria's agency for education and internationalization. We are advising, supporting and connecting people and institutions in education, science, research and culture with our programs and initiatives since 1961 both in Austria and internationally. The OEAD offers a variety of national funding schemes to students and researchers, and it supports so-called Austria centers at three universities in the US. In addition, the OEAD has been supporting more than 40 Erasmus Plus partnerships between Austria and US universities within the last three years, involving around 100 academic exchanges of students and teaching staff. We support the development of personal skills for a globalized and digitalized world. We are promoting Austria's position as an internationally oriented academic destination. We contribute towards strengthening the innovation competence of institutions and educational systems. Internationalization and global mobility are today's USPs in the field of education, science and research. And that's what OEAD stands for. We are ABA, the Austrian Business Agency, your easy access to the Austrian business location. We are the official investment promotion agency and we are here to help you. We support you setting up your business in Austria, 
from start to finish. We guide you towards funding and founding options that are right for your individual setting. We connect you with fitting research and development institutions and potential corporate partners. We are your bridge between Austrian companies and highly skilled talent. We provide most recent insights concerning immigration and residence topics. All of that and more, all free of charge. ABA, we simply make it easy. Greetings, my name is Megan Crane and I manage the Fulbright Austria portfolio for the US Department of State's Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs. Thank you to the Office of Science and Technology for the opportunity to highlight the Fulbright program today. Fulbright has been active in Austria for over 70 years and over 75 years globally. There are many types of awards for students and scholars, including those for US and Austrian participants that specifically support teaching, study, and research under the umbrella of science and technology. Examples include the Fulbright Claus University of Technology Visiting Professor Award, Fulbright Volksbier Visiting Professor of Austrian American Studies Award, and the Fulbright Austri Austrian Marshall Plan Foundation Award for Graduate Studies and PhD Research in Science and Technology. For more information on Fulbright Program, please visit awards.cis.org or fulbright.at. We look forward to our ever-expanding collaboration between Austrians and Americans through Fulbright Awards for students and scholars for years to come. Thank you. Greetings from TUV and dear colleagues. Some key data. Austria's largest technical university, some 30,000 students, 4,000 researchers, and 175 professors thereof. 32 ESC grants. More data on our website. Why could TUV be of particular interest to you? We have for highly competitive funding programs the so-called Excellence Program of Directorate. If you succeed, for example, to get a FWF Start Prize or an ESC grant with Tiovin as host institutions, you will be offered the opportunity to apply for a tenure track position. For more information, please contact our funding support team via the homepage or me directly. Hi, I'm Ute from the Vienna Business Agency. Hi and welcome. My name is Karen and I work for the Vienna Business Agency. Have you ever thought about setting up your business in Vienna, Austria or moving your spin-off to the most livable city of the world? Vienna is a R&D and talent hub, features a buzzing ecosystem and is the perfect place to grow your startup. In addition, Vienna fosters innovation and the development of sustainable technologies across all industries, providing financial grants and subsidies useful market research data, organizing events, such as the amazing festival Vienna Up. Vienna is home to R&D units and innovation centers of global players like Böhringer Ingelheim and is the perfect place to grow startups like Bitpanda, GoStudent or Glückgalatte to unicorns. Are you curious finding out more about the gateway to Central and Eastern Europe? Then connect with us at ARE 2021 to find out more about opportunities in Vienna. Fifteen percent of the world's population has some form of disability. Our Northern Star and key aspiration at the Zero Project is to remove those barriers and to realize a world with zero barriers. We have a research-driven process which achieves that, and over the past decade we've worked with over 9,000 partners in 180 countries. So come join us in Vienna for a coffee to find out more, specifically, how the ESO Foundation, Fundación Descubreme, and Ashoka have joined forces to initiate the first program to support the internationalization of innovations for a barrier-free world. My name is Ludwig Gatzig. I'm the Managing Director of the Austrian Council for Research and Technology Development. We are supporting ARID because we are convinced that the regular exchange of views between the Austrian system and the diaspora all over the world, but especially in North America, is very important. 
If you come back to Austria, I could assure you that the progress in the system was a lot. So if you're more in basic research, the Austrian Science Fund got more money in the last five years, about 50% more money. If you're more in your own business, entrepreneurship or startups, so we now have two new unicorns, uh, Big Panda and Go Students, maybe you heard of them. To confess, it's our first unicorns, but the entrepreneurship system has developed a lot. So no matter what you do, uh, you will get our full support and now enjoy Arit and enjoy your time in the discussion. If we want to create a green, prosperous and sustainable future, we need to work together and bundle our competences. And that's where Silicon Austria Labs come into. At Saal, there are 250 people from 40 different nations and we work together with academic and industry partners to bridge the gap between basic research and industrial applications. We've worked from chips to intelligent systems within mobility, energy efficiency and other industrial applications. Just to name one example, with our tiny power box, an energy efficient onboard charger, we will boost, together with our five industry partners, the e-mobility of the future. We at Saal are the research partner for the technological challenges of the future. at the International Monetary Fund here in Washington, D.C. My research focuses on the determinants and the effect of macroeconomic policies. For this, the COVID-19 pandemic was the perfect laboratory. The severity of the shock motivated very strong macroeconomic policy responses all around the world. At the IMF, we collected data on these countries' macroeconomic policies from over 190 economies. The first goal of this project is to document which and how much of these policies governments decided to use to fight the economic fallout from the COVID-19 pandemic. In the poster, you can see that countries enacted very large fiscal stimulus, significantly loosened monetary as well as macroprudential policies. The second part of the research analyzes the determinants of countries' policy responses. Our regression analysis here finds that on average, countries' pre-existing policy space is most important in determining how countries responded to the pandemic. We conclude that for the future, countries may need to place greater weight on adjusting policy space sooner to prepare for the next crisis. Thank you very much for listening. Has it ever crossed your mind where the skin is all the same? Let me tell you about differences in skin and the relationship to wound healing. We found that plantar skin is an evolutionary revolution that comes at a trade off for skin growth. We performed our any seek of four different skin sites. Principal component analysis depicts that dorsal foot and trunk skin are highly related, whilst plantar and snout skin are unique. Something was fundamentally different in plantar skin. Trunk skin has a thin epidermis, whereas plantar skin is much thicker, with a massive stratum corneum known as callus and is also conserved in humans. Our RNA seq data revealed that calcium ion binding and signaling is differentially regulated in plantar skin. The epidermis typically exhibits a calcium gradient. One can see an increase in calcium and levels drop drastically until reaching the stratum corneum. Plantar skin has lower calcium levels and the gradient is absent. These differences led us to the hypothesis that plantar skin might display features of wound healing. On the left, you see tightly packed cells of normal skin. The center shows cells that are bigger and loosely packed in healing. Foot skin exhibits a comparable phenotype. This may be why wound healing in foot skin is impeded. Curious? Take a look at my poster. Thank you. Hello, I'm Christoph Gebauer from the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory here in California. In my role as a principal scientific engineer, I'm focusing on various challenges for the integration of renewable energy resources such as photovoltaics, battery storage, electric vehicles, and smart buildings. For this work, we applied the latest advancements in artificial intelligence to optimally control a smart building. The training process can be envisioned as an engineer, let's call him Mr. AI, being sent to a new building, trying to figure out how to best control it. At first, he might not do a good job, but after a while, say one year, he become an expert. Now, for training of our artificial intelligence, this is exactly what happens, except that it happens in software which allows us to accelerate time and one year of experience can be gathered within minutes. Overall, I believe that artificial intelligence paired with domain expertise will ultimately enable our transition in a clean, renewable future. 
Thank you very much for your attention. Please contact me if you would like to learn more. Hi, I'm Romana, and I'm studying how the trillions of microbes in our gut interact with the intestinal immune system. This is important because mucosal surfaces, including the gut, are frequent entry sites for pathogens, which cause large numbers of infections worldwide. My poster is about the role of the chemokine receptor CXO2 during the mucosal immune response following infection with the pathogen Salmonella. CXO2 is primarily known for its critical role in neutrophils during bacterial infections. However, we found that this receptor also guides B cells to certain immune follicles in the gut, also known as pious patches. B cells are the antibody producing cells in our body and can be found in large numbers in these immune follicles. Studies with germ free mice revealed that certain members of our commensal microbiota trigger the maturation of these pious patches, which depends on the expression of CXO2 on B cells. In conclusion, our studies uncover a novel immune pathway that demonstrates how the microbiota contributes to the maturation of B cell immunity in the gut. Hi, this is Andreas Lichtenberger, and I'm a PhD student in economics at the New School. In this research project, I analyze U.S. income distribution data between 1940 and 2000, based on spatial, institutional, and social factors. The study is motivated by the question how far U.S. income distribution is impacted by the spatial shift of deindustrialization, which is paralleled by an institutional divide in terms of labor rights. Between 1940 and 2000, the pro-labor U.S. Rust Belt declined while the deregulated anti-union and pro-business U.S. Sun Belt rose. I analyzed these distributional changes with a kernel density decomposition approach. If you want to see why I find time-varying effects of right-to-work policies and union power, sex and race-based wage discrimination exists on a cross-regional level and endorse political economic approaches that account for the formation of power relations, then please look at my poster. Until today, the implementation of solid-state electrolytes in large-scale appliances like electric vehicles is hindered by lithium filament formation when cycled at a so-called critical current density. Automotive industries have set a CCD value of at least 4 mA square centimeter as the goal to reach. So what does it take for us to increase the value of this factor? That is a question that is very difficult to answer, as the underlying mechanisms are in fact not entirely elucidated yet. Gathering all parameters and electrolyte characteristics that were found to be connected to this phenomenon, we base this work on three main cornerstones. Being a meticulous surface preparation to decrease interfacial resistances to a minimum, a variation of the microstructure to connect morphological to electrochemical characteristics, as well as an adjustment of the cycling program to achieve a smooth plating behavior. The combination of these actions enabled high electrochemical performances up to 5 mA square centimeter and could in fact reveal that pulse plating is able to mitigate lithium filament propagation in the polycrystalline solid state materials. My name is Mohamed Saadoun and I'm a researcher at Kalantia University of Applied Sciences. Waterfall surveying is essential to understand the distribution and habitats. However, traditional surveying methods can be expensive, labor intensive and risky. We want to explore the potential of machine learning here and what accuracy can we reach. The data set was collected in Bosque del Apoche Wildlife Refuge in New Mexico and we had to perform pre-processing steps such as redundant label removal and resization for better outcomes. Our results showed up to 80% accuracy in identification and 74% in the classification. We have concluded that convolutional neural networks have potential that greatly depends on the volume, quality, and textual and structural composition of the dataset. In future, we want to investigate the performance on much larger datasets and, of course, augmentation techniques to detect rare classes. In this project, Taylor Loy and I re examine the history of tritium production in the United States. Tritium is a radioactive isotope of hydrogen, which is used to massively increase the yield of modern nuclear warheads. The success of international arms control negotiations prompted the U.S. to shut down its military production reactors. This left the nuclear weapons complex without a reliable supply of tritium. Based on historical documents and interviews, we trace how multiple administrations reviewed possible options for replenishing tritium. 
we scrutinized the decision made in 1998 to utilize the commercial reactor at Watts Bar for irradiation services, and we focus on reconstructing the design, manufacturing, and chain of custody of the tritium-producing absorber rods, or TP bars. Finally, we discuss the implications of tritium production for the nuclear nonproliferation regime and expose the tentacles of this seemingly small operation for the rest of the nuclear ecosystem. Hi, my name is Anna Katarina von Kraland, and I'm a PhD candidate at Stanford University. My research is focused on accelerating the transition to 100% renewable energy for the United States. I'm developing a wind energy atlas that reveals the available land area and power potential for wind farm siting across all states. I do this by mapping the restrictions to wind development, including infrastructure like roads and buildings, protected land areas such as national parks, and low wind speeds that wouldn't be economical. We find that the US has far greater potential for onshore energy than previously suggested, and in fact has sufficient resources to meet 2050 targets. With this atlas, wind farm developers and policymakers can reduce the time selecting a new wind farm site, as well as the upfront cost, uncertainty, and investment risk. Further, it helps transform what is currently a manual process into one that is digitized and streamlined, helping states decide where and how many wind farms to build. Thank you. Hi. Um, our guided focus ultrasound is increasingly used to treat neurodegenerative diseases. It uses thousands of acoustic transducers to concentrate the energy on a millimetric size focal point in the brain. However, using a free Tesla MRI, very poor imaging quality can be obtained for several reasons. First, till now, only the body coil is used for imaging, and also the conductive surface of the transducer causes a destructive si signal in the image known as black bed artifact, as you can see here. For this reason, our solution is to use a flexible, very thin, and acoustic transparent eight-channel coil geometry that can be placed around the patient's head in order to increase the signal-to-noise ratio in the image. So we studied the acoustic footprint and the coil and that showed the acoustic transparency of the coil and electromagnetic simulation and in vivo experiment to show the improvement of the signal-to-noise ratio using our proposed coil over the body coil. For more information, please check out my poster and feel free to ask me any questions. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for the 2021 Austrian Research and Innovation Talk. AIRID is brought to you by the Office of Science and Technology Austria, which hosts the RENA Network, a scientist network of over 3,000 Austrian students, researchers, innovators, and entrepreneurs in North America. RENA provides you with a variety of professional support tools. Our guiding principle is to inform, assist, and connect you. Maybe you want to launch a startup, share your work with the world, or look for collaboration partners. Maybe you're seeking opportunities in knowledge exchange, or maybe you're seeking a career change. Whatever it is, the Research and Innovation Network Austria is a tool that you can use to advance your professional development, expand your network, and realize your goals. If you'd like to learn more, visit our website or find me at Eric. I'll be around. It is a pleasure to be invited to address you in this recorded message. My name is Christoph Gartinger, and I'm the president of the Austrian National Science Fund, FWF. I would like to use this opportunity for a brief overview of the role and the funding activities of the Austrian Science Fund, FWF. The task of the FWF is to fund and promote fundamental research in Austria. We support all disciplines from natural sciences, biomedical research to social sciences, humanities and arts-based research. All our funding decisions are based on international peer review. The current COVID crisis, as well as the fast global change, have demonstrated how important the role of fundamental research is for a modern society. The FWF aims at providing the best possible funding and the optimal environment for basic research. Thank you. Greetings from the Institute of Science and Technology, Austria. My name is Tom Hensinger and I wish you a very good workshop. I also have a message 
for you, for all Austrian scientists in North America and for all others who are interested in a scientific career in Austria. ISD Austria is growing. ISD Austria is hiring on all levels. PhD students, postdocs, junior professors on a tenure track and senior professors. And we are hiring in all fields of science, in the life sciences, physics, chemistry, mathematics, computer science, and also in earth and astro sciences and in science-related engineering topics. So, best wishes and I hope to see your application. Welcome to Open Austria, the official Austrian representation in Silicon Valley. Our structure here is quite unique as we are a collaborative initiative of three different organizations, namely the Austrian Foreign Ministry, the Austrian Trade Commission, and the Austrian Investment Agency. Here at Open Austria, it is our mission to connect Austria to Silicon Valley through our different initiatives and focus areas. Our main focus areas include business, startups, and accelerator programs, attracting invest investment from Silicon Valley to Austria, our art and tech lab, where we connect Austrian artists to Silicon Valley technologists, and our tech diplomacy efforts, where we host the first ever Austrian tech ambassador, who was the second tech ambassador appointed in the world. Additionally, we host a variety of community events and programs for our local Austrians living in Silicon Valley. We hope to see you in San Francisco soon. Hello, my name is Dietrich Haubenberger and I'm the president of ASCINA, the Austrian scientists and scholars in North America. ASCINA is the first and only independent network of Austrian scientists and scholars in North America and is organized in 13 chapters in the US, Canada and Mexico, as well as back home in Austria and across several alumni chapters in Europe. We at ASCINA share the conviction that the Austrian intellectual landscape shall not end at its national borders. Through our network activities, both locally and virtually in our chapters, it is our goal to connect and support those who share academic and or personal roots in Austria to enrich the careers and professional development of our members across all career stages while in North America. Our main activities across all chapters are the annual ASCINA Awards and our mentoring program that connects early career scientists with accomplished ASCINA members who are successful scientists or scholars in their respective field. We invite you to go to www.ascina.at and sign up to become part of our network. We can't wait to get to meet you. Dear ARID participants, my name is Edeltraut Stiftinger and I'm Managing Director of Austria Wirtschaftsservice, which is the state-owned promotional bank to drive innovation and growth within the Austrian economy. And that's also why the main topic of this year's ARID, um, technology transfer or knowledge transfer from academic research to spin-offs, startups and companies is of highest interest to us. We have been funding for many years three dedicated Austrian knowledge transfer centers. And right now our main and most important uh, programs, funding programs concerning knowledge transfer are pre-seed and seed financing. These programs bridge the financial gap of, of uh, innovative startups developing uh, high-tech products from idea uh, to market. I wish you a very exciting conference and many greetings from Vienna. Are you a researcher thinking about working in Austria in any area of science? We will introduce two European funding schemes that might be of interest to you. My name is Therese Lindahl. I am Jasmin dorak strauss and we are from the Austrian Research Promotion Agency. The MSCA postdoctoral fellowships support projects for researchers of any nationality with a PhD applying together with the European host organization of their choice. The ERC funds investigator-driven groundbreaking research. These prestigious grants support promising research leaders and established scientists. Are you interested? 
we can help you identify the right program and support you in the application process. You are welcome to contact us at researchcareer at ffg.at. Servus from Austria. Hello, my name is Marco Schweiger and I'm the director of the Austrian Marshall Plan Foundation. The main aim of our foundation is to foster transatlantic excellence. We are doing this by organizing conferences, publishing books and providing research fellowships. Students and researchers up to the PhD level are eligible to apply for such a fellowship. So if you are a student, a principal investigator of a research group or a professor with master or PhD students, this fellowship might be an excellent opportunity for you or your young colleagues. Interested? More information on our homepage, marshallplan.at. Thank you. The University for Continuing Education claims is the only public university for academic continuing education within the German-speaking world, an entire university dedicated to lifelong learning. Our research is motivated by the desire to find answers to the major challenges facing society today. The university is part of European international research networks and increasingly involved in projects under Horizon 2020 and Horizon Europe, as mobility and cross-border cooperation are essential for the pursuit of our main strategic goal, to become the leading university for continuing education in Europe. Staff members and around 8,000 students from more than 80 countries contribute to this goal, creating an international and diverse atmosphere at our beautiful campus in the UNESCO World Heritage Region, Wachau. Ladies and gentlemen, dear bright minds. My name is Hermann Arkes. I am the Executive Director of Fulbright Austria. Fulbright Austria promotes mutual understanding, cooperation and knowledge transfer between Austria and the United States of America by sponsoring educational and cultural exchange programs. We fulfill this mission by managing the Fulbright program, coordinating a national-wide teaching assistantship program and counseling students and institutions on opportunities to study in the US as an Education USA Advising Center. Do not hesitate to contact us if you want to learn more about our initiatives. The OEAD is Austria's Agency for Education and Internationalization. We are advising, supporting and connecting people and institutions in education, science, research and culture with our programs and initiatives since 1961, both in Austria and internationally. The OEAD offers a variety of national funding schemes to students and researchers, and it supports so-called Austria centers at three universities in the US. In addition, the OEAD has been supporting more than 40 Erasmus Plus partnerships between Austrian and US universities within the last three years, involving around 100 academic exchanges of students and teaching staff. We support the development of personal skills for a globalized and digitalized world. We are promoting Austria's position as an internationally oriented academic destination. We contribute towards strengthening the innovation competence of institutions and educational systems. Internationalization and global mobility are today's USPs in the field of education, science and research. And that's what OEAD stands for. We are ABA, the Austrian Business Agency, your easy access to the Austrian business location. We are the official investment promotion agency and we are here to help you. We support you setting up your business in Austria from start to finish. We guide you towards funding and founding options that are right for your individual setting. We connect you with fitting research, 
and development institutions and potential corporate partners. We are your bridge between Austrian companies and highly skilled talent. We provide most recent insights concerning immigration and residence topics. All of that and more, all free of charge. ABA, we simply make it easy. Greetings, my name is Megan Crane and I manage the Fulbright Austria portfolio for the US Department of State's Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs. Thank you to the Office of Science and Technology for the opportunity to highlight the Fulbright program today. Fulbright has been active in Austria for over 70 years and over 75 years globally. There are many types of awards for students and scholars, including those for US and Austrian participants that specifically support teaching, study, and research under the umbrella of science and technology. Examples include the Fulbright Clause, University of Technology Visiting Professor Award, Fulbright Boltzbeer Visiting Professor of Austrian American Studies Award, and the Fulbright Austri Austrian Marshall Plan Foundation Award for Graduate Studies and PhD Research in Science and Technology. For more information on Fulbright Program, please visit awards.cis.org or fulbright.at. We look forward to our ever-expanding collaboration between Austrians and Americans through Fulbright Awards for students and scholars for years to come. Thank you. Greetings from TUV India colleagues. Some key data. Austria's largest technical university, some 30,000 students, 4,000 researchers, and 175 professors thereof. 32 ESC grants. More data on our website. Why could TUV be of particular interest to you? We have for highly competitive funding programs the so-called Excellence Program of Directorate. If you succeed, for example, to get a FWF Start Prize or an ESC grant with TOVN as host institutions, you will be offered the opportunity to apply for a tenure track position. For more information, please contact our funding support team via the homepage or me directly. Hi, I'm Ute from the Vienna Business Agency. Hi and welcome. My name is Karen and I work for the Vienna Business Agency. Have you ever thought about setting up your business in Vienna, Austria or moving your spin-off to the most livable city of the world? Vienna is a R&D and talent hub, features a buzzing ecosystem and is the perfect place to grow your startup. In addition, Vienna fosters innovation and the development of sustainable technologies across all industries, providing financial grants and subsidies, useful market research data, organizing events, such as the amazing festival Vienna Up. Vienna is home to R&D units and innovation centers of global players like Böhringer Ingelheim and is the perfect place to grow startups like Bitpanda, Go Student or Gurkalatee to unicorns. Are you curious finding out more about the gateway to Central and Eastern Europe? Then connect with us at ARE2021 to find out more about opportunities in Vienna. Fifteen percent of the world's population has some form of disability. Our Northern Star and key aspiration at the Zero Project is to remove those barriers and to realize a world with zero barriers. We have a research-driven process which achieves that and over the past decade, we've worked with over 9,000 partners in 180 countries. So come join us in Vienna for coffee to find out more, specifically, how the ESO Foundation, Fundación Descubreme, and Ashoka have joined forces to initiate the first program to support the internationalization of innovations for a barrier-free world. My name is Ludwig Gatzig. I'm the Managing Director of the Austrian Council for Research and Technology Development. We are supporting ARID because we are convinced that the regulate change of views between the Austrian system and the diaspora all over the world, but especially in North America, is very important. If you come back to Austria, I could assure you that the progress in the system was a lot. So if you are more in basic research, the Austrian Science Fund got more money in the last five years, about 50% more money. 
If you're more in your own business, entrepreneurship or startups, so we now have two new unicorns, uh, Big Panda and Go Students, maybe you heard of them. To confess, it's our first unicorns, but the entrepreneurship system has developed a lot. So no matter what you do, uh, you will get our full support and now enjoy Arit and enjoy your time in the discussion. If we want to create a green, prosperous and sustainable future, we need to work together and bundle our competences. And that's where Silicon Austria Labs come into. At Saal, there are 250 people from 40 different nations and we work together with academic and industry partners to bridge the gap between basic research and industrial applications. We work from chips to intelligent systems within mobility, energy efficiency and other industrial applications. Just to name one example, with our tiny power box and energy efficient onboard charger, we will boost, together with our five industry partners, the e-mobility of the future. We at Saal are the research partner for the technological challenges of the future. I know you're all networking, but we have a full program this afternoon. Welcome back. We will begin with lightning talks. What are lightning talks? Uh, they are brief talks uh, that last a maximum of 18 minutes. There's a countdown here. There's a clock here. Similar to TED Talks, uh, we hear each speaker present one key message, and today... Our, our speakers today, all very interesting speakers, will share their lessons for innovation in academia to stimulate technology transfer. Detailed biographies uh, of the speakers uh, you can find on your name badge if you use the QR code. I will just very briefly introduce the speakers, and we will start with... Um, Jeff Reed, let me just make one more remark. After our lightning talks, we will have the uh, Marshall Plan, Austrian Marshall Plan Foundation poster award ceremony. But I would like to ask Jeff Reed to join me on the stage here. He is the founding director of Georgetown Entrepreneurship Initiative. The role of universities in innovation and technology transfer is his topic this afternoon. Welcome, Jeff. Uh, there's one there. Oh, oh sorry. Anka. Hello. All right. Is this one working? Maybe it will. Here we go. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I am thrilled to be here. Uh, and I'm going to talk about universities and their role in innovation and entrepreneurship. I'm not going to talk a lot about technology transfer because one of my colleagues from Georgetown University is here and we'll speak on that in a few minutes. Uh, but I'm going to talk about why universities absolutely must lead the way in promoting entrepreneurship and innovation in our society. And 
it is imperative that universities embrace entrepreneurship and innovation. And yet, we all know, and I understand you've been talking earlier today about many of the challenges that face that, that prospect. Uh, universities are in some ways the absolute worst place for innovation and entrepreneurship. We understand there's nothing more opposite of an entrepreneur than a tenured faculty member. Uh, we know the, the, <laughs> the culture in academia is often uh, built around academic disciplines, right? For more than a thousand years, our universities, not ours in America, but universities that the, the structure that began in Europe still exists today, where each discipline gets narrower and narrower, and you focus on the things that are really important to your discipline, and yet the problems of the world are all interdisciplinary, but our structures don't allow that, that cross-disciplinary activity the way they should. Uh, and there's a sense that these disciplines, uh, many people choose to be an academic. They choose an academic career partly because they may not love commerce and business, right? There is a sense in the academy that business is not as noble of a pursuit. So when you have uh, scientists and, and academics who have a chance to do something that has a commercial application, they often reject that opportunity just because of the culture that they have uh, built their career in. And often, often they chose that very purposefully and deliberately. And within academia, you have the different views of the disciplines. The arts and sciences are the historic kind of leaders of academia. They often look at engineering schools or business schools as, you know, you don't really belong here. Business schools are, you guys are like the, you know, more vocational. It's very practical. That's not true academia. Uh, it's like the business school can be the bastard child of the academy. But then within a business school, you have its own disciplines, finance, marketing, accounting, uh, et, et cetera. Those disciplines look at entrepreneurship as not a real discipline. It's you're too vocational, too practical. You're not really part of the academy. So entrepreneurship programs in universities are often the bastard of the bastard child. It's, it just doesn't fit. Universities do not understand entrepreneurs and the way they are set up. Uh, we, we know that promotion and tenure processes don't reward a lot of innovation. Uh, and it's just so hard for these types of programs to fit. Uh, I work in, at Georgetown University. My job was to, to build an entrepreneurship program uh, from its very beginning. I started 12 years ago. Uh, 25 years ago, I started the Entrepreneurship Center at the University of North Carolina in uh, Chapel Hill. Um, and, and I've worked with dozens and dozens and dozens of other universities at arm's length to, to help them and advise them on how to create their entrepreneurship programs. And every university has a problem creating their entrepreneurship program. That's even in the United States where people think we're all about entrepreneurship. We still have really big problems with entrepreneurship programs in universities. Where does it fit? Is it in the business school? Well, if it's in the business school, how do you serve students who aren't studying business? Do you work with the engineering school or the sciences, or do you not? Do you have a tech transfer program? How does your entrepreneurship program work with those people? Uh, and, and one of the biggest challenges is how do you create the right program that fits your university? So what I will tell you is, if we agree that universities are structurally bad as a place to start and build entrepreneurship and innovation programs, well, now let's talk about why actually should we do it? What are the good things, right? And there's really only one that is really, really important. The one reason universities are the best place to create entrepreneurship and innovation is because that's where the young people are. I mean, almost nothing else matters, right? I have had to... I've had to fight faculty and deans and academic structures to, to build programs, but I always have students showing up. The students, the young people, and this is true anywhere in the world, right? Young people want something new and different. They're looking for new solutions because our generations have not solved all the problems in the world. Uh, far from it, right? So 
the young people want something new and different. They don't necessarily want to have, uh, they recognize they're not going to have the linear career path that maybe previous generations have had. So people want to solve problems. They want to make a social impact, right? We see this in the United States, but also all over the world. Young people don't want to just get a job and make money. That's still nice. But they also want to make a difference in the world. They want their work to, to have an impact. And many of them discover that entrepreneurial pursuits may be the absolute best way to make an impact. So these young people are demanding these kind of programs. They really want them. Uh, but how do you actually make that happen? How do you build these? So I, uh, at Georgetown, we have a th- kind of three pieces to our mission. We start with the core belief that entrepreneurship is among the world's most powerful forces for social impact, right? Entrepreneurs are creating value, solving problems, creating wealth, creating jobs. Uh, they're creating stuff, not just reallocating, right? It's not, a, it's not a mindset where, how do I get my slice of the pie? How do I win and someone else loses? That's the culture that you often find in traditional corporations, where you have to fight for your slice of the budget or in, or in government scenarios, right? Where, and even in universities, right? It's like, okay, there's a, there's a zero sum game where if I get more, that means somebody else had to get less. But the entrepreneurial mindset, of course, is let's grow the pie for everyone. So these entrepreneurs are making a difference. Uh, and our program, we believe that's the core value. It's if you want to make a difference in the world, being an entrepreneur may be the most Im- impactful way you can do that. So, uh, with that as our starting point, we have three big efforts that we focus on. The first is we would love for every Georgetown student to develop an entrepreneurial mindset. We don't think every student should be an entrepreneur. Should Not everybody should start a company. Uh, but everyone can develop an entrepreneurial mindset. And what does that mean? That means no matter what career path you're going to take, whether you're going to work for a bigger company, for the government, and a nonprofit, NGO, or work for a startup, or be an entrepreneur, whatever it is, you need to learn to be creative, to look for innovative solutions, to understand ambiguity and risk, and to be able to recognize and take advantage of opportunities. Those are things that aren't part of a normal curriculum, right? And the students that we work with, they want to know what's the answer, right? What's going to be on the test? How do I get the right grade? Uh, if, they, if they've got it accepted to a school like Georgetown, they probably have not had a lot of failure in their life. They've learned how to succeed in an academic environment where there is an answer key. Uh, and the real world does not have answer keys. And there's not always one solution or even, an, even a solution. So teaching our students how to live in a world full of ambiguity and change is one of the things we work on. That's part of developing an entrepreneurial mindset. So developing an entrepreneurial mindset, we do have a set of courses. Uh, We have a minor in entrepreneurship. We have certificates and lots of kind of formal programs. We offer pitch competitions and mentoring and incubators and and the things that a lot of universities would have. Um, But setting up these programs is not the goal. Uh, If you have a university you're working with and you want to create an entrepreneurship program, my argument would be or my advice would not be don't focus on a program because that assumes that students are going to start at the beginning and go step by step through a set of courses or activities. And at the end, they're going to know how to be an entrepreneur, right? We have those programs. Those are great. That's not the end goal though, or that doesn't get you where you, that doesn't get you everything you want. What I believe our focus is, uh, is creating a culture around entrepreneurship and a community so those two things, culture and community. If, if we want our university to be great at entrepreneurship, we have to create a culture where entrepreneurship is welcomed, it is supported, it is celebrated. So if you think about the institutions that you work with, is there a culture that celebrates and rewards innovation and entrepreneurship? Is there a safe place for students or faculty to, to congregate, to gather? If you're interested in doing something new and different, is there some place you can go? Uh, or is it everything regimented, right? A lot of the students who go on to do entrepreneurial things for, out of our school, they may never take a single entrepreneurship class. Some of you saw a handful of our entrepreneurs on Thursday. Uh, the four entrepreneurs we had on a panel, none of them took an entrepreneurship class at Georgetown. 
So we can spend a lot of time building the right curriculum, uh, but what is more important is when someone thinks maybe I want to do something entrepreneurial, they need a place to go. And that the place to go can be as simple as a one-on-one conversation with a mentor. You can have an incubator space. There's a lot of ways to do it, but it, it can't be so regimented that someone has to say, oh, well, I'm in my third year of study. I'm a physics major. I now think I might want to do something entrepreneurial, but I didn't sign up for the program a year ago, so it's too late, right? That's what you want to avoid. You want to have free-flowing opportunities, lots of on-ramps is the way I like to describe it, Uh, and a lot of experiential opportunities. You want students to have a chance to try things and fail, even in uh, in a a relatively safe environment. I like to tell the parents of Georgetown students that I want your children to fail Uh, because a lot of them have never failed before. And at some point in their life, they're going to get knocked down. And if they haven't learned how to deal with that uh, and that it's not the end of the world, that they can recover and get stronger and better and smarter, then then they are going to have a hard time succeeding in life. So I want to give them a lot of opportunities to fail. That means trying things, getting out of their comfort zone. One of the ways we do that is a pitch competition. We have lots of pitch competitions on our campus. Some people say we have, why do you have so many pitch competitions? But it is one of the simplest ways for people to begin to engage. We have a, a one competition that's coming up next week. We do it at the beginning of each semester where 30 or 40 student teams will stand up and make a two minute pitch, right? And there's no Q and A. They don't have to have a real business or business plan or anything like that. They just have to be willing to stand up and tell, tell people what they want to do. And some of them will win a little bit of prize money. I think our top prize is maybe $1,000, which is that kind of money can be really significant for a college student. Um, maybe not enough to really launch a business, but what it is enough to do is inspire them to keep going. So some of them are going to go for the prize money, but all of them are going to have a chance to get feedback. And we have a, a community that will support them. So people pitch, and that may be the first time that a business person, a mentor, hears that idea and they come up later and say, hey, can I help you? Here's someone that might be able to help your business or I can give you advice. So pitch competitions are simple. Um, All right, so it's about creating this culture and community. It's about all of our students trying to develop an entrepreneurial mindset. We're nowhere close to reaching 100% of our students right now. We have, even within the business school, they're not all learning about entrepreneurship, but that is our goal. Uh, But we find that so many students don't start companies while they're in school. That's natural, right? Even those that are very entrepreneurial, they have all these distractions uh, that don't give them the time to start a business. The distractions like classes and tests and their academic studies. So we support alumni entrepreneurs through, uh, so after they've graduated, uh, we have a lot of programs, incubator programs, our venture lab, uh, uh, angel investment networks, all kinds of things to help those. Um, but we also, we really take it. So that's, that's a a lifelong relationship. That's the key thing there. We want people that have gone through Georgetown university, no matter what program they have graduated from, we want them to have a way to get help the day they want to be an entrepreneur. It's not, again, it's not a, uh, a rigid schedule where you graduate, then you start a company. It could be 10 years or 30 years later. And, uh, Georgetown is here to help with mentoring, coaching, co-working spaces, communities, and, uh, and, and investment opportunities. So we do what we can to help those entrepreneurs. Um, so we have our students. Uh, we also have our alumni. Uh, but we also love to impact the world beyond our Georgetown community. So we have programs where we teach entrepreneurship and life and business skills to returning citizens, uh, people coming out of the prison system, who often have very limited employment opportunities, uh, and there's an there's a incredibly high rate of people going back to prison because they don't have many ways to succeed. So teaching them some basic business, entrepreneurship, and life skills is one of the things we do. We have programs where we've taught wounded veterans around uh, with their earner certificate in business and entrepreneurship. Um, and we have international uh, dialogue and international entrepreneurship training programs. We had a group in town this week from Chile. Uh, we had a really large group of entrepreneurs from Italy who came through Georgetown a few years ago for a, uh, for a multi-week entrepreneurship training program. And you know if the Italians can do it, I know the Austrians can do it so much better. Um, and so, but, but a lot of this is also to say that 
it's not easy. People think the United States has this great entrepreneurial spirit and, and, and maybe we should be proud of what we do have, but we absolutely do not have a monopoly on entrepreneurship and we do not have all the answers. I work at a university where 12 years ago we had one entrepreneurship course. Uh, we had uh, the culture of our university is still dominated by people that want to go into banking and consulting and government types of jobs. So that's, the, that, that's everywhere in the world. We have this kind of this, this sense that the students are supposed to take the next step on a path. And it's often my job to be the guy over here. Like, if you don't want to do that, there is another option. So make sure those students have a place to go when they do see other options, when they don't want to go down the path that others are pointing out for them. Uh, the, you know, I guess the last thing I'll say here is disruption. Everybody in the world has experienced disruption over the last year and a half in a way that has never happened in our lifetimes. Uh, the, the pandemic made all of us learn to change and adapt in ways that were extremely uncomfortable for a lot of people and, and were bad, right, in a lot of ways. But it also created a lot of opportunities. Disruption creates opportunities. And while we're still dealing with the pandemic, we hope someday it will be behind us. Disruption is not going away. We are in a world that is constantly changing, and that pace of change is only getting faster and faster. So whether it's going to be another health, you know, global health scare or climate change or new technologies or whatever it is, new things are coming at us all the time that are going to challenge the status quo. And if, if we train, if we teach our young people to deal with change, to look for opportunities, to find solutions whenever these problems are out there, we're, if we don't do that for them, then we are really, really giving, we're shortchanging the next generation. So I work at a university. We train graduate students, undergraduates. I've also been a part of programs where we taught entrepreneurship to students in high schools and middle schools and even younger. And that's where it should begin. People need to learn that finding a way to make a few dollars or a few euros or whatever it might be is actually one of the most noble things they can do in uh, creating value, solving problems, learn it young. And then as they grow and become scientists and faculty members and academic leaders and whatever it may be, they're always understanding that there are entrepreneurial opportunities around that. Thank you very much. Very American <laughs> entrepreneurial spirit. And I'm not sure it's that developed in Austria, but it should be developed a little more. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll move on to Jana Keinersdorf. She is Associate Professor of Biomedical Engineering at, Car at Carnegie Mellon University. And her topic is leveraging industry, academia, relations, best practices for early career researchers. Welcome. data slides and probably way too many slides to get a message across. Um, but let's start with introductions. So my name is Jana Kainersdorfer. I am an associate professor in biomedical engineering. Um, and the talk title is, when I put together those slides, I realized I am by no means in a position to tell you about best practices. So really the change of the talk is my experience so far I'm pretty much going back to Jeff's point, why faculty members are terrible entrepreneurs and what are the hurdles that we need to overcome in order to actually bring something to the market, let's say. So I thought I'd start with where I'm from. Well, I'm born and raised in Vienna. I got officially all my degrees are from Vienna, um, but I've been in the US for 16 years now because I was an undergrad and I was an exchange student at Georgetown. I ended up spending an additional year there doing all the research for the masters and then went to a conference at NIH and just talked up this guy and who ended up giving me a job as a PhD student, 
was an advisor at the medical school in Vienna. Um, so I'm a physicist with medical influence doing all the research at NIH. And then I met someone else just by coincidence, got my postdoc uh, training at Tufts, uh, like so many other biomedical engineers uh, have went the Boston route. And then I got a tenure track position at Carnegie Mellon University. And for anyone in, who is not an engineer in this room, CMU is uh, top three or four, depends on the year. Uh, engineering schools in the country, top 10 in the world. Um, so I've been there for six years now, uh, got promoted to associate professor, um, but that does not mean tenure yet. So I thought I do want to tell you about some of the research we do, because I think it's a good example of uh, potential research that can be taken to market, but also point out of why during the tenure track, it's almost an impossibility. So I will start with data. And I thought I'd tell you what we do in the lab, and it's very simple. We develop very fancy pulse oximeters. Anyone who's ever been to a hospital knows shining light through your finger tells you how oxygenated is your blood, especially during COVID. That's a very important marker. It really is based on the fact that red light uh, um, gets absorbed by tissue. Everyone knows what I'm talking about in the sense of if you put a flashlight in your mouth, your entire head lights up red. Um, and depending on how much red light comes out, that tells you about oxygenation in, a, uh, in the tissue. So we built this, we use this, we do that for brain imaging. We put uh, LEDs, laser pointers uh, onto the head uh, and measure whatever light goes into the brain. And then we can say something about brain function and, and showing you squiggly lines here that essentially represent functional activation in the brain. So two applications that we have in the lab that I believe have commercial value, that's my opinion, um, is uh, we're looking at traumatic brain injury. Um, so that's one project that I'm talking about. And the other one is for fetal health monitoring. So let's start with uh, traumatic brain injury. If you are in a car crash, um, pretty much clinicians want to know, is your brain okay? In particular, uh, one of the things that are being asked is, is the pressure inside your brain okay? Is the brain swelling? Is the bleeding? And so on. So what are the ways of how we can measure pressure inside the head? Well, the clinical standard is drill a hole, put a pressure into the brain, a pressure probe inside the brain, um, and measure it that way. Obviously, that's not often done because that's highly invasive. So what we have done is we've taken our optical approaches, we've developed, or we're measuring stuff in the brain. We're measuring blood flow changes. It's essentially a fancy pulse oximeter for the brain. And we're using the signals with a little bit of machine learning um, to, to convert it into, into intracranial pressure. Um, and here are my data slides. Uh, the x-axis is the ground truth. The y-axis is our algorithm. If everything works, everything, all the data points should be on the 45-degree line. And we see uh, many, many different data points that highly uh, correlate with each other. And so essentially what this data slide is saying, or rather this one, within 4 millimeter mercury accuracy, we can quantify pressure inside the head. Now, what does that mean? 10 millimeter mercury is clinically relevant. So we're much better than that. So this data is from animals. We are now translating it to children uh, in the pediatric ICU. And I'm showing the same kind of squiggly lines or dots, essentially saying we can do it in humans. This is outstanding. There are so many different applications uh, where this is important. Um, so, uh, and I'll talk about commercial implications in a second. The second project I want to tell you about is fetal health monitoring. Uh, right now, any woman that is pregnant, uh, you can use ultrasound for structural changes. You can look at the heartbeat, but it doesn't really tell you anything about fetal hypoxia. About 300 C-sections uh, in the U.S. per year are performed in terms of um, is an emergency surgery um, because of suspected fetal distress. There is a huge... Uh, inaccuracy in, in determining when fetal distress is really happening. And so there's a, a gigantic need to reduce C-sections by more accurately determining is the fetus, especially during labor, is the fetus in distress. And so what we're developing is essentially a fancy pulse oximeter for the fetus by putting some optical probes on the abdomen of the mother. 
Um, and we have some preclinical data, and I will not, yeah, those are really not uh, easy, understandable yet, but essentially we're at a point where we're saying, okay, we can measure the fetus, which is from an engineering perspective already outstanding, optics perspective outstanding. We measure the fetus, we measure the fetal heart rate optically. We can translate that into changes in oxygenation over time. So this was all done in animals. Um, and we're translating it to humans right now. Um, okay, this, I can give talks about my research. I can sell the ideas to get research funding. Uh, I can, can publish papers on it. And throughout my la last 16 years, I've published quite a few papers. And, if, and I looked back, and I'm only going to focus on my own publications here, but I realized that pretty much from my PhD work on, um, where I published a paper with seven patients, and then during my postdoc, uh, maybe with five, or maybe, well, 29 patients, that was a large study, um, just recently 13, and the really big one uh, right now is based on five animals, not even five humans. So the point I want to make is that we publish papers in biomedical sciences very often, especially when it comes to clinical translation of, of methods that we're developing with very small sample sizes. I've told you 300,000 C-sections per year are performed uh, um, potentially unnecessarily because of suspected fetal distress. I'm probably going to publish a paper with about 20 women and call that proof of principle. And it's good enough for academia. And so the reason is um, because of what tenure and promotion really looks like. And so I, I put together the slide actually recently for some of my students because they asked me, well, what does it actually mean to be on the tenure track? Again, I'm not tenured yet. And essentially the criteria are do good work. If you do good work overall, that's kind of the statement that my dean would tell me, do good research you'll get tenure. Um, and tenure is supposedly this somehow magical time point where then afterwards you have no longer any pressure, which is also not true. But in any case, um, you get a lot of resources to achieve something. So what is that something? Do good work, get funding, graduate students. The more uh, PhD students I graduate, the better I am. Um, I should mentor my students. Hopefully I teach well. Um, be visible, give research talks, uh, publish, publish, publish or perish is the tenure track, uh, uh, as we often say. And we also have to do a lot of service inside and outside the university. And so ultimately, what I've, this is actually copied from our uh, internal handbook of what promotion and tenure should look like. Ultimately, what it boils down to is you're supposed to be on an upward trajectory of like develop new things, publish more papers, graduate more students and so on. And it's all well and good, except for that it really does not support um, uh, industrial, industry, um, well, entrepreneurial work. None of the requirements for me getting tenure actually include impact in the sense of, especially in my field, um, it does not include any criteria about how successful will I be diagnosing a disease? How successful can I treat a disease? Or how many patient lives will I be saving? This is not a criteria in the tenure and promotion um, uh, package. And so um, the problem also then, even if I want to focus on this and say, all right, well, I personally really, really want to see my research in the clinic and, and support it, and I don't want to just have a patent, sell it off to a company. I actually want to be involved in the development, Well, I also need to consider funding opportunities um, for some of the research. And um, how do I go from five patients to 5,000 patients. Um, well, for me as in, in academia, one of the avenues, especially in biomedical engineering, uh, one of the ways I get funding and one of the ways that I'm almost required to get funding is federal funding, especially for us, that's the National Institutes of Health. And there it's the, the big award, it's called an R01 award. It's a five-year funding, multi-million dollar grant. 
Um, essentially, I'm going to get judged based on significance, innovation, and approach. And the argument I'm going to make is, or sorry, the, the aspect on innovation is taken from the NIH website. Um, the reviewers are asking if my grants, if my ideas are innovative in the sense of does the application challenge and seek to shift current research or clinical practice paradigms by utilizing novel theoretical concepts or approaches. So if I want to go from five patients, 10 patients, and I already published a paper and I'm writing a grant of saying, all right, now let's please, let me figure out does that work, that, does that instrument that I already built does it work in a thousand patients? I'm not going to get funding from the NIH for it because the NIH is not going to fund that because inherently it's not going to be innovative because I already have shown, I've already published a paper on it. So that's one of the hurdles. Um, but also, if I tell my students, well, change the instrument, make it better, make it sampling frequency better, resolution better, better imaging or whatever, then it might be innovative. But that's actually not a good idea if I ever want to consider FDA translation. Because FDA regulations for the medical devices that I would have to get in order to show its efficacy and such really does not support me changing the instrument. You want to have the same instrument over a large sample size and show efficacy. So um, my argument is that, well, this is taken from, sorry, it's kind of a blurry image, but this is taken from um, the FDA website that essentially shows the life cycle of medical devices in this case of what I'm talking about. We're starting with discovery, intervention, preclinical, more clinical, and then eventually get into regulatory and, and product launch uh, uh, timeframes. And my argument is that while on the tenure track, while I have to prove myself that I can get more papers, more uh, students and such new work, um, really an FDA regulatory path all the way to uh, to product launch is not something that a tenure track uh, really supports. And so none of those, none of this life cycle is aligns well with the tenure track requirements. So the solutions that I've taken for those two projects that I was telling you about is, I really wish I had a logo on the left hand side. It, I thought I would by the time I'm giving this talk, I'm in negotiation right now with a large company that I'm not allowed to disclose yet. But essentially a company, I, I have managed to get interest from a large, large pharma company, I guess that's what I can say. Um, they really want me, they want to give me money um, to show in a large clinical trial, as in hundreds of patients, uh, if our non-invasive pressure sensor really works. And I'm okay taking this on because I'm close to submitting my tenure package. I would not be uh, able to say yes to this if I were still starting out. Um, but also it's all going to be based on me hiring technicians rather than PhD students. As I said, I mean, I want to show the efficacy in hundreds of patients. That's not a PhD thesis because there's no innovation in there. Uh, the other side, the, the fetal pulse oximeter, I am in, uh, I'm collaborating with a company that's called Radiant Oximetry. And so we've been working together for a few years. And so they are really taking care of all the, the actual building of the hardware and um, clinical translation and taking data. Um, and we have SBIR funding, um, which has been mentioned multiple times earlier in this discussions as well already. So it's a really nice way during the tenure track to work with a company, have them see it through and still have a PhD student just develop uh, the novel algorithms, which may not go into the, the company itself, but, um, but that's okay. So those are my solutions by, by, for now, by no means, uh, the only ones out there, just again, this is my own personal story here. The problem with SBIR funding, even though it sounds magical, it's like, okay, you have a company that, that does all the marketing for you and are entrepreneurs that I am not. The problem with SBIR funding is that typically they only fund phase one NSF or NIH, it's only six months long. Uh, phase two, which already is supposed to be really amazing funding, which we do have, is only two years long. And two years in the life cycle of a PhD student is nothing. I am, as soon as I take on a PhD student, I'm required 
to find funding, not like in Austria where PhD students might be uh, covered for all, all the t duration, the, uh, the time they're there, I am required to find uh, about, for us, about $80,000 a year for a PhD student, and I'm guaranteeing them funding for five years. So after the SBIR is done and they want to write one coherent uh, PhD thesis, that's really not enough funding. So there's this caveat with SBIR funding. So my conclusions are, are really meant to just uh, essentially point out the difficulties tenure track faculty uh, members face, uh, maybe some ideas as well. So really what I'm saying is um, that the early career tenure track uh, faculty really do not have easy resources to do clinical translation or actual large scale translation in whatever field they're in um, and seeing something through because the requirements of the tenure track do not support entrepreneurship. Um, there are options of SBIR funding and industry sponsored research. Um, as I said, they, they have their own caveats. And so I thought I, I'd just point out some of the opportunities I'm seeing and I think that goes hand in hand a little bit with what, what our previous speaker just said is, um, well, how about we change student requirements? How about we actually create, and that's more specific for the US, I guess, but how about we change PhD requirements to not be based on, you get a PhD based on how many papers you have published and how many conferences you attended, but maybe about, have you thought about starting a company and taking your PhD research further? And then also, I think some of the nets more the university, higher level university in the US uh, ideas of changing tenure track requirements, I would really encourage uh, tenure track requirements to be different nowadays and encourage collaborations with industry um, and as much as uh, encouraging faculty members to get federal funding and really also maybe change the shift of, and that's been said earlier before, I don't remember how it was phrased, but Maybe we should not consider success a question of what is the age impact, but what impact does my research really have? And so in my case, do I have a clinical impact? And I said, I started out my tenure track position during my six years ago, seven years ago, when I interviewed at multiple different universities. There's this typical question of what do you want to be known for? And I never answered about developing something new. I said, if I can save one single patient's life, that will be impactful. And so maybe we should consider impact uh, differently than an H index. So with that, I just want to say that I have a ton of people in my lab. It's just customary for us uh, in engineering to thank all the people. So um, thank you for your time and listening to me. Thank you, Jana. Uh, let me introduce our next lightning speaker. It's uh, Stefan Achleitner. He is the principal security researcher at Palo Alto Networks, and he will tell us about knowledge transfer in a data-driven world. Welcome, Stefan. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for this uh, nice introduction. Um, it's, it's really uh, a pleasure for me to be here and uh, to talk a little bit about my work and um, to talk about the um, knowledge transfer uh, in my field in cybersecurity. And I would like to um, talk about this topic of knowledge transfer actually from a data perspective. So from, from the sharing of data and what does it mean um, uh, like we live in a in a very digitized world, data is getting more and more important, and so I would like to focus a little bit what data actually means and what the sharing of data actually means. And so, um, after I talk a little bit about my work, I would also like to um, talk about a little bit about the implications, regulations like the GDPR, like the General Data Protection Regulations in Europe have for people that actually work in the U.S. and develop digital products uh, in the U.S. Also for the European market, 
Uh, and then I would also like to share a little bit my um, experience working with universities. I was lucky enough to uh, study here in the U.S., um, writing my thesis about uh, the cybersecurity uh, field or uh, in the cybersecurity field and then basically join an uh, industry company and um, where I'm also like working in, in research and also collaborating a lot uh, with different universities uh, in the U.S. So um, to start my work um, or uh, to tell you a little bit about my work, I'm, uh, as I mentioned, a cybersecurity researcher. I'm a computer scientist uh, by training. And uh, the most important uh, part of my day-to-day -day work is really analyzing data and working with uh, a lot of data. So what uh, my team and I are, are doing, we uh, develop different uh, technologies, especially different detection technologies, where we focus on the uh, development of, of uh, AI, of artificial intelligence and different machine learning techniques to actually uh, find out new cyber campaigns that are going on, cyber attack campaigns going on, new vulnerabilities, um, new cyber threats that are, that are maybe out there. And of course, we could not do this with data. Data is like really the key uh, point or the key resource in our field. If we wouldn't have data, uh, we could not do that. Everyone uh, of you like knows that data is essential for science, of course, right? And especially in the field of machine learning, of AI, um, you could not do this. Uh, without data. And the more data we have, uh, the better. So actually, if I could make a wish list, what I want to do as a scientist, I really want to inspect everything, every uh, network connection, every internet connection that's going on, every log file, because then we could basically almost detect, or we, we could detect much more than what the industry already can do. But uh, what we see is the trends are going in a, in a different direction. And to some extent, this is a good uh, point because we see that people are getting more and more aware of their privacy, of the data privacy, that data is really important. Whatever we share on social media, whatever we post on the internet can actually be um, used in a cyber attack, for example. Um, and typically also uh, a cyber attack starts with something, if it's, it's a targeted attack, starts with something that an attacker would find about certain person, about a certain organization, um, somewhere on the internet, or even talking, um, 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 talking uh, directly to someone, calling them maybe, right? Um, so this um, really goes in the uh, direction that um, people are getting more aware of, uh, of this problem. And um, like the, the implications that we see in our research when we, when we detect new antivirus software, for example, or new firewall technologies, um, what we uh, face more and more is that, uh, that the trend is going that the data is getting more and more encrypted. I don't want to get too technical, but basically encryption means you obfuscate the information that you share in a mathematical way that you, that you basically cannot read the plain text, right? If we, if we send an email, it's, uh, it's encrypted, it's, it's, it's uh, obfuscated. So um, a pretty big uh, challenge in my research work that, that uh, my team and I are working on is actually to, um, to um, work with data uh, or like to detect new attacks without actually looking at the actual data, without looking at the, the plain text or the, the um, yeah, underlying data, but just mostly work with, with meta information that, that does not uh, violate um, the privacy or we don't violate the privacy, but um, that, we, uh, that we don't have to, you know, um, look at the plain text. So this is, uh, this is uh, a really Im important topic. And uh, I'm sure all of you uh, or many of you heard about the recent uh, ransomware attacks that were going on in the U.S., but also globally, right? Which is actually, uh, if you think about it, people, cyber attackers, are actually taking our data hostage and then uh, demand um, a ransom. So uh, all those uh, unfortunate attacks, of course, um, they have a positive effect because it creates more awareness. People are getting more and more aware that uh, data privacy, whatever I share, is, um, is very important. And so that this kind of uh, brings me to my next uh, or topic uh, in, my, in my talk. What is like the, the, the implications of like um, the, the data, uh, data regulations, the GDPR, the European uh, 
general data pro uh, protection uh, regulation, what implications do those have in our work uh, uh, here in the US? Um, to just give you an example, I think it's a very good uh, way that Europe uh, is going here, uh, but it has also some benefits and maybe some, let's call it challenges. Um, like when I was, I was back in Austria last Christmas and uh, around uh, January, February, uh, actually many of my um, Austrian uh, relatives and friends asked me, hey, I, I got up like a, a pop-up message on my phone, the messenger WhatsApp that I'm sure many of you are, are, are using is saying, hey, there will be a big update on the uh, privacy policy, how my data will be used. And so I've actually took that opportunity and just wrote like a brief uh, blog post and we analyzed what's the difference between that privacy policy in Europe and uh, globally. And uh, the good news is that actually uh, the European version of this uh, new privacy policy because of GDPR was much more protecting the user's uh, data and the user's privacy compared to, um, to users in the US or like anywhere else around the world. Um, so Facebook actually cannot, the parent company of, of, of WhatsApp cannot actually look uh, at, at uh, the data from European uh, users or cannot share them as they want to. And um, we see similar trends uh, here in the US, for example, with the uh, California Con uh, uh, Consumer Privacy Act, which goes a uh, very similar way as the, as the GDPR. It is getting much more, much more um, stricter to uh, what we can do with data and what, what people um, can, actually, um, can actually do with data. Um, so this is, this is the big benefits of, of, of regulations that we have, that people are getting more and more um, aware of that. In my field, it's a little bit of a challenge, right? Because the development of digital products, uh, not just for cybersecurity, for any, for any digital company, like if you think about big companies like Google, Facebook, um, they heavily rely, uh, uh, rely on data and the sharing of data and whoever chooses what to share. I'm sure many of you, for example, used probably Google Maps to come here, like, like I did to find my way around the city. Um, if you, for example, see that there's a traffic jam on, uh, on Google Maps, that's not because Google knows or Google has any cameras somewhere, right? Or there's someone standing and telling someone at Google, hey, there's a traffic jam. They know because people that use this Maps application are slowing down on a road where you usually would maybe go like 30 miles an hour. So they can basically um, uh, compute or uh, predict that there's a traffic jam going on because many people or many users are sharing their data and sharing this knowledge and this information, right? So um, we see that there is uh, really uh, different aspects uh, of data sharing. Um, one thing that I would like to also mention here, as, uh, as I already said, the, the, the GDPR, this uh, data regulations, has somewhat of an impact because um, a lot of the research and development departments of the big, uh, big IT companies, uh, the one I'm working for uh, including, is mostly in, in, in the US. Like almost all of our R&D is done here in the US. Some is also done in, uh, uh, in Israel in my field. But um, as a, as a um, security researcher here in the US, I cannot even look at European data because of the data regulation, which I already mentioned has some good uh, aspects, right? It protects the user's privacy. But we actually often see that there are different trends of cyber campaigns going on, on in, in different regions of, uh, around the world. So if, but if we cannot even look at European data, if we have to rely on data mostly from the U.S. or from other regions in the, in the world, it you know, could also have some disadvantages maybe for the development of, of digital products. And so I think uh, Europe has to, uh, and there's Austria included, of course, uh, has to be also a little bit uh, careful and um, not to fall back because we maybe restrict ourselves too much. So again, there's like, uh, a fine balance where to find the optimum there, as you often do in science, is not that easy, right? So um, this, is, this is one aspect that I really, that I really see uh, in my day-to-day in my -day work. Um, if I want to work with, Euro Euro with European data, I would have to go to Europe. I cannot, cannot look at this data here. Um, that's um, especially, especially um, yeah, 
a big, uh, a big topic in security. Um, one thing that I would uh, like to discuss ne uh, next is the, um, my uh, experience working uh, with universities. So as I already mentioned, I, um, I uh, was uh, lucky to, to, to study at the U.S. Um, at the U.S. University uh, to come here for my for my PhD. And I during my PhD, I also already worked with a lot of different uh, companies here in the U.S. And now I'm actually lucky enough to see it from the other side, from the industry side, uh, working for a, for, for a big company and um, also working together with universities who really do like uh, great fundamental and basic research uh, that, we, uh, that we can use for, uh, in our, in our uh, own research, either from uh, scientific papers or through collaborations we have uh, with different research groups um, around the U.S., one interesting thing, though, when we usually um, start to work with university, uh, um, with universities establish some research collaborations, they typically don't ask us, or the, the first thing they, the universities don't ask us is, uh, is usually not money. Like, they often have, like, a good funding situation. But actually what universities are most interested in is data. They, they want uh, the sharing uh, of data, which is not... Uh, very easy for us to do because of different of different um, uh, customer agreements that we have. Right, we are very uh, very cautious with the data that we have. Um, what we do with it, we have to be. And so, um, how we uh, when we work with universities, what we actually often uh, give them is, is like is like part of the funding or, or or part of the research support is to give them devices and share devices that they can actually collect their own data or we anonymize the data in a way that it can be used and can be shared. So this is, this is um, how we often um, work, um, work with universities. And um, one thing that, I've, that I see working, uh, working with different research groups, with different faculty members in the, in the, uh, at, uni, um, at the U.S. universities is that they really do like great work on fundamental research, on really developing fundamental uh, technologies and making breakthroughs, uh, through, through breakthroughs there. Um, but I also often see a gap from the work that's done at universities and how it can be actually applied in a product in the real world. And that gap, I would say, I experienced it myself as being like a, like a graduate student here. I was, I was um, working on one of the largest um, U.S. Um, 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 collaboratives uh, between uh, different U.S. universities and uh, different industry companies to basically establish a science for cybersecurity. And also what I experienced there is that this gap is often because universities, and that might be very specific to my field, but that uh, universities don't have that data that a digital company have. Like we have sensors all around the world globally that uh, record different uh, internet flows, um, different cyber campaigns, or like the, the data to, to analyze those. And universities typically don't, don't, don't have that, right? So I see a little bit that the gap is coming um, from that. And by working with universities, by collaborating with them, we basically help them or like work with them uh, to close this gap that um, the, the, the research, the fundamental, the, the fundamental research that they do can also be uh, transferred into and uh, applied in real-world um, products. But um, there's always, of course, uh, a mutual ag uh, agreement, right? Uh, a mutual uh, benefit agreement between working uh, with industries uh, or, or working between industries and, uh, and universities. And um, that's, of course, also the topic of recruitment. So um, the sharing of knowledge uh, as an as a, uh, a industry company often comes with... Um, getting, getting, the, the, uh, getting the best brains, right? Getting the best people from, from universities. So what we actually often do when we fund research projects and when we fund universities is that we um, help students, help PhD students, students and really fund them from the beginning of their career and work with them, invite them for, for internships. And then, of course, we hope that they would choose to maybe join us when they, when they, when they graduate. And that's really um, a very uh, 
good source uh, of knowledge, good source of brain power that we that we really uh, rely on. Because um, especially in the field of cybersecurity, it's really really hard to find good people. We cannot we cannot typically find the people or find uh, as much people as we would like to hire. Um, what we what we also um, do when we when we uh, try to fund those uh, research uh, groups uh, and students is that we not just try to work with the top schools, right? We don't want to just be, be focused on like one, one area. We actually often try to pick um, schools that maybe serve certain minorities in, in the U.S. because we want to have this diversity. And we really see that if you have different diverse backgrounds from different social backgrounds, uh, students uh, from all around the world, but also from, from, from different um, let's say, groups, maybe also underrepresented groups, we really see that working together in a very diverse environment gets so much innovation on, and, and gets us so much ideas. And that's really um, one focus area that we have that we typically um, yeah, also focus on when we, when we uh, try to work with the universities, try to sponsor them and, and, and try to support them. So to um, uh, conclude my talk... The, the message that I would like to, to deliver is that um, the sharing of knowledge is really often the sharing of data, right? And the sharing of data is, uh, especially, uh, especially in the field of IT and digitalization, is, is so crucial and so important. And it's up to us, or it's, it's up to us to find what's the right balance of sharing and not sharing because of the examples that I was, that I was discussing. The more... We, uh, we have to be cautious what we share, but we also have to be aware that if we don't share anything, um, that's, that is also a block or for research and innovation. So with that, I would like to um, end my talk. I hope this was interesting, and thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you. We will move on to Daniela Gandorfer. She is the head of uh, research at Logische Fantasie Lab, New York. And Daniela will talk to us about entangled futures, how knowledge collaboration can address injustices. Daniela. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. There is no right to breathe. There are rights that pertain to physical integrity. There are local regulations on whether or not to wear masks during a global pandemic. There are national and international regulations on certain pollutants and emissions. There are important proposals for strong international environmental uh, legal frameworks, such as the Global Pact for the Environment. And all of that is important. All of that, more or less directly, aims to protect vital respiratory processes and life-sustaining gas exchanges. Yet, and it is, it is crucial to realize that there is no right to breathe or, or draft thereof. And, this, and that this absence is not a formality. It affects the earth and its processes. It affects billions of people around the globe. And considering certain cons uh, conversations about outer space governance, also beyond the globe. Greenhouse emissions are thinning the ozone layer. The COVID-19 pandemic has already caused more than 4 million deaths around the globe. And up above the globe, 91% of the world's population breathe air that exceeds the WHO guideline limits, with air pollution killing 7 million people each year, disproportionately affecting middle- and low-income households. Thousands of migrants are left to drown in the Mediterranean Sea. Lungs are filling up with water while environmental refugees, rapidly expanding in numbers and across borders, 
are literally out of breath. And speaking of being out of breath, police violence in the US and in other countries continues to asphyxiate racialized bodies. Radiation exposure, Amazon deforestation, ocean deoxygen, deoxygenation, the list goes on and on and on, expressing ever more precarious states of existence on Earth and calling for a right to breathe that can attend to the injustices of our time. Neither adding a clause to a national legal code or fixing the language of a human rights treaty can sufficiently address this challenge. The work, the work of establishing a right to breathe, has to start somewhere else, namely with the very question what breathing means and for whom in our complexly entangled world. And also with ever more global actors and technologies redefining traditional, traditional concepts of normativity, we also have to ask where and what law is in the 21st century. This is hard work. It requires not only thinking outside the box, but sustainable and effective collaborations across many different fields, places, and sectors. Such collaborations enable a novel and effective approach to knowledge production and problem solving. As the first organization of its kind, the Logische Fantasie Lab offers both. Its commitment to decentralizing knowledge production guides the lab's investment in the innovation of research methodologies and its development of effective formats for collaboration and actionability. Under the leadership of my fellow co-directors, Patricia J. Williams and Suleika Ayub, who is here with us today and is responsible for the visual language here. So under the leadership of my fellow co-directors co and with a dedicated team of more than 20 researchers trained in over 16 different disciplines, the lab is currently conducting three different investigations, tapping into a vast established network of institutions non-profits and affiliates spanning dozens of fields and universities. The investigations differ in terms of their foci and problems, each being uniquely addressed by the team in charge and guided by the lab's metaphorical method, which decentralizes knowledge production while facilitating, facilitating inventive collaborations. All right. So using the lab's method and resources, the gas exchanges and the right to breathe investigation is actively working towards a right to breathe. It develops hitherto unprecedented tools and methods for identifying unrecognized breathing injustices, for addressing the limitations of national and international lawmaking, and for ethically engaging in solution-oriented normative design processes. The investigation was conducted over two years by young researchers from Princeton, Harvard, Columbia, Oxford universities, as well as the University of Applied Arts in Vienna, UC Santa Cruz, Sorbonne Paris, and the London School of Economics. To train students and researchers in the metaphorical method and to further facilitate cross-disciplinary knowledge production, the gas exchanges and the right to breathe investigation was taught in seminars uh, at universities, including the Angewandte uh, last year, and also in addition to those hosted by the Lofi Lab uh, itself. Let me turn over to them for a few minutes uh, with this short uh, video clip. metaphorical method is best able to speak to. 
radioactive colonialism permeates all of these scales and matters, from cellular through to the planetary. You know, these rights are often articulated in the abstract. Law is not something that's immaterial. Um, it combines with the temperature in the atmosphere and it, you know, it swirls along with all the other smoke and smog and dust and aerosols that are in the atmosphere. Air is not one, it, it's multiple. So when we think about constructing something like a right to breathe, this research does show that breathing is not universal. We know that radiation in the way it moves, in the wind, and in our atmosphere, and its half-lives, obey no geographical borders or thinkable timescales. We have to ask whether law can attend to these different forms of existence, and how the scales of nuclear colonialism render life livable or unlivable. Being, breathing, and knowing um, are entangled. The challenge for me was that law does not register different pressures that act upon different bodies. So you have race and racism that constantly intra-act with the entanglement of pressures. And no body is independent for these, from these pressures. So for Black bodies like Barbara Dawson and George Floyd, you have medical and societal pressures that are acting on their bodies because of race and because of systemic racism. So a way for me to understand this force field of violence um, coherently and concretely was by asking how can we understand the relationship between law and force while also um, looking at matter and meaning together. I think the metaphorical method was really important for my project. It helped me really break down multiple entanglements that are in within this apparatus of police violence. So for example, the breakdown of physical and social forces, lethal bodily reactions, and objective reasonableness. You know, attending to the fact that when we think about rights and we think about law, you know, these rights are often articulated in the abstract and divorced from the actual mechanical processes that are taking place. And it's important then to make whatever laws that we have physically and materially rigorous, because so long as breathing exists only in the abstract, you can't defend it. You can't protect it. There are violences that are ongoing, which are not being discussed. I mean, there are protections in prisons against indoor smoking, protections against secondhand smoke, and there are no protections for a potentially deadly virus like COVID. Using a um, metaphorical approach shows the absences that, that carry down and now are reflected as well um, in absences in legal practice. That's the difficulty in addressing these questions and addressing the legal framework and scientific framework is how do you present a rigorous argument for something that cannot be described right now, but also thinking of how it can attend to questions that are not articulated yet or not formed yet, cannot be represented yet. And it's been very fruitful to collaborate. And I think ultimately has really, has been a style of research that I had been unfamiliar with before. And I think ultimately is 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 what I believe to sort of be a way that I want to operate and continue to work in the future. Of the investigation, the identification of specific unrecognized breathing injustices and the shortcomings of the legal frameworks have informed the lab's approach towards the conception of a right to breathe and the modalities that can make it happen. So how to construct a right to breathe in times of climate change and rapid technological developments whose protective range far exceeds the individual yet includes it. So neatly packed uh, in one sentence, the challenge might sound pretty straightforward. Unfortunately, it is not. First of all, how to create a new kind of right or even legal framework. We tend to think of parliaments and courtrooms as the sites of lawmaking. And we think of states and state actors as those exerting normativity. Yet, 
this narrow conception of law does not fully hold anymore. And it is hindering our ability to develop responses to the injustices we are so acutely aware of. Platforms and private actors, as we heard today already, are important players in normative global processes. And in addition to shifting the very conditions of knowledge production, technological developments play a major role in determining present and future forms of law and governance. Decentralized ledger technologies such as blockchain are shifting commercial and property law. Algorithmic computing and machine learning are remodeling legal practice. Remote sensing technologies are increasingly informing international treaties. And quantum tech will have significant impact on global and national security law, among many other fields of law. So taking into consideration the results of our research, the participatory forms of normativity, the various actors involved, and the significance of technology, the task for us is to create a platform that brings together private and public stakeholders and mobilize new technological tools to build a right to breathe that can stand the pressures and demands of our time. And this is how we're going to do it. Combining innovative methods from tech and startup spaces with established and rigorous academic and scientific research, the Lexaton is a wholly unprecedented event form of real-time collaborative solution design. As with all hackathons, it is a mechanism that enables the development of solutions that are based on technological tools. However, where classical hackathons, even legal hackathons, seek the production of software or prototypes, the Lexaton goes further. It provides the platform to bring together a diverse group of stakeholders and makes use of the potential of new technologies to address injustices identified from these fields. The important difference between this format and the traditional fora for redressing injustices and grievances is that the Lexaton is not solely about policy making that could eventually turn into a right to breathe. Rather, it seeks to collaboratively engage solution-oriented normative design processes, which then cumulatively create a right to breathe. In doing so, the Lexaton establishes the capacity for leveraging the skills and the creativity of a wide range of invested stakeholders from, from for example, governmental and non-governmental agency working style the improvement of air quality to blockchain startups proposing decarbonization through token economics or from downwinder activists in New Mexico to biomedical engineers manufacturing breathing devices or, as we heard, sensors from universities to international courts, from policymakers to medical doctors. So concretely, the Lexaton in its first iteration will consist of an intensive four-day in-person event in 2023, preceded by specific de problem development workshops hosted on a virtual co-working platform. Currently, we are in the process of securing participating stakeholders with a target aim of 50 participants in total, and we are still welcoming proposals for collaboration. With that, and in the name of the Logische Fantasy Lab, I want to thank you for your attention. I want to thank Oster and the team for inviting me. And, um, and I want to encourage you to reach out to us. If you want to know more about the Logische Fantasy Lab, or even more importantly, if you're interested in working together towards a right to breathe, because there should be a right to breathe. Thank you. Thank you, Daniela. And as I've said before, just want to remind you, if you want full bios of the speakers here, you have them uh, on, if you uh, check the QR code on your um, name card. Uh, we will move on to Zainab Abuisa, and I hope I pronounced your name correctly. <laughs> she is a senior licensing manager at Georgetown University, uh, 
on, and she will talk about intellectual property and technology transfer. Zainab. Thank you very much. Hello. Hello. All right, hello everybody. Thank you so much for inviting me today. My name is Zainab Abuisa and I'm a senior licensing manager at uh, Georgetown University's Office of Technology Commercialization. So today my talk will be um, focused on technology transfer at universities, just a very brief history of um, technology transfer in the US, uh, the impact that it's had over the years on the US economy, and um, some of the uh, roles and responsibilities of a tech transfer office and how it could greatly benefit the researchers um, at the universities. So um, tech transfer really began around the 1980 um, with the enactment of the Bayh-Dole Act, which um, was a uh, legislation sponsored by um, Senator Birch Bayh and Senator Bob Dole. And it's currently referred to um, by this famous quote as possibly the most inspired piece of legislation to be enacted in America in over the past half century was the Bayh-Dole Act of 1980. More than anything, this single policy measure helped reverse America's precipitous slide into industrial irrelevance. So before the Bayh-Dole Act, inventions that came out of the research labs um, at universities and in small businesses that were federally funded were owned by the federal government. And there was really no framework in place to manage those inventions. And out of about 28,000 patents, um, less than five of those, um, five percent of those inventions were actually licensed non-exclusively to companies for development. And companies didn't really have the incentive to seek out licenses when they um, didn't have any promise of any uh, market exclusivity to uh, develop those products. So um, around the time of the Bayh-Dole Act, there was a lot of congressional interest into spurring technological innovation in the U.S., and studies were found that actually um, about one-fourth, uh, on average, of the um, amount of money that it takes to get a product to market was in the research phase, um, and obviously a lot of that is done at universities. And so the thoughts were that um, have an, a, a legislation that aligns the ownership of inventions and intellectual property with the interests of the people that own them, the universities, the researchers, and the companies who would benefit from developing them. So after the Bayh-Dole Act was put in place, some of the key provisions was give the ownership of the inventions that come out of federal funding um, to the institution that developed that invention. Um, the university will have a limited time to elect title to that invention and file patent protection, um, if applicable, on that, uh, on that invention. The university will attempt to develop and commercialize the invention by partnering with companies. Um, the university will give some rights to the federal government still in the form of a non-exclusive um, license. And that's, that's a whole other talk in itself. <laughs> and universities would give a priority of partnering with small businesses and specifically in the United States, obviously, to boost the U.S. economy. Um, and uh, ex the revenue that comes into the university from commercialization of those inventions would feed re further research and development in the university, as well as it will be shared with the inventors. So not to bore you with this graph, but before the Bayh-Dole Act, um, and this is specific to drugs and active new substances, less than 10% of active new substances were first launched and developed in the U.S. And by 2010, 2014, um, Around over 60% of um, active new substances were first introduced in the United States. 
So this um, graph is uh, obtained from metrics that are reported to AUTUMN, which stands for Association of University Technology Managers. And that's really in the tech transfer profession, the, um, the, the professional organization that we all belong to. Um, and it really highlights, um, you know, the, the metrics that are reported to it by the universities for tech transfer. So in 2020, there was over 20... 27,000 invention disclosures. Um, there was, uh, there is over 1,000 startups that are formed. Um, 900 products were created. Um, 10,000 options, options and licenses were executed between um, universities and industry partners. And then this graph kind of highlights from 1996 to present day the effect of technology transfer in the U.S. So over 900, uh, over 800 billion dollars um, contributed to U.S. GDP, um, and 15,000 startups have been formed. Um, 200, uh, over 200 uh, drugs and vaccines have been developed. And of the uh, licenses and the options that have been negotiated with companies, over 70% of them were negotiated and licensed with uh, and executed with startups and small businesses. So this slide kind of just highlights some of the products that we see day to day on the market that actually stemmed out of universities. So we have cisplatin, which is the chemotherapy drug that came out of uh, Michigan State University, recombinant DNA technology, of course, and, you know, what that led to to the biotech industry pretty much from Stanford. Um, from Georgetown, we're known for Allegra, the antihistamine, and also for um, the technology that led to Cerevarix and Gardasil, the HPV vaccine. Um, Lyrica brought in, I think, $1.3 billion to Northwestern University. Um, Citricale from um, South, uh, Texas Southwestern. And then these are some of the technologies that you see often that are not, um, you know, uh, therapeutics that also came out of technology transfer. Um, efforts. So Google from Stanford, um, MIT, the, the Living Proof is a famous uh, hair care line based on a molecule developed at MIT that uh, controls moisture absorption in out of, and out of hair. Um, Florida State University, you have um, uh, cell tower power technology and synthetic vitamin D uh, for vitamin D deficiency was from University of Wisconsin-Madison and uh, Cosmic Crisp Apple Variety from Washington State University, where actually I was before I came to Georgetown. Um, so the technology transfer life cycle is right here. And really, a technology transfer office is pretty much involved in every single one of those boxes. So our office and most all tech transfer offices in the U.S., um, we evaluate invention disclosures as they come in from the inventors. Um, we assess them for patentability. Are they patentable? Do they meet all of the requirements to be protected? Um, does the university want to invest in filing a patent on those inventions? Do we think it has commercial potential? Is it going to give us back the return on investment? Um, so we do market evaluation and market assessment. Um, we work with outside patent attorneys to file patents, copyrights, um, and intellectual property protection. Uh, we actually market all of the technologies that come from the university as well through various different channels, emails, conferences, cold calls, working with inventors. Um, we identify all of the uh, companies that could potentially partner with the university to develop a particular um, invention. Um, and we negotiate all forms of um, contractual agreements with them. So confidentiality agreements, licenses, options, um, sponsored research agreements. Uh, and then even after a license has actually been signed, our job is to also enforce that license and make sure that the company is um, diligently developing the technology. Um, and we always have to make um, hard decisions Actually, I think it's better than not having to make this decision, but if there's more than one company that wants it, for example, a startup versus an established company that wants a particular technology, who do you license it to? Do you license it to an established company that has more resources to develop a particular um, technology and take it to market, or do you license it to a startup, for example? that would have to go out and have to fundraise, raise money, develop and face many more hurdles to um, developing a technology than an already established um, company. 
Um, and then after the money comes in, of course, like I said, uh, we redistribute it within the university so that some goes back to um, the, the inventor's lab, some goes back to the tech transfer office to further um, you know, support our investment in other IP, and the other goes to the inventor. Um, so, you know, I think I pretty much from my short experience in tech transfer, I think I've been in tech transfer now for about six and a half years. Um, I really think of it as more of um, a business center that's a partner to the inventors at the university to supplement their, um, you know, their research activities and, and their impact that they can have. So when we learned from our colleague at um, Carnegie Mellon with her pulse oximetry um, invention and how, you know, federal funding wouldn't have been the right mechanism to support her large scale clinical trials, really the the thing that supplemented this and the thing that stepped in to help further that technology and get it developed was the private sector. And so we ask, you know, did you have, did you work with your tech transfer office to have any IP filed on it? Um, did they help with negotiating the license um, to those companies and split up the, you know, the field of use to um, fetus um, for example, monitoring versus brain monitoring. Um, we also kind of bridge the gap between industry and um, and our researchers in that we translate the discoveries into layman's terms. Um, and so, for example, I was working with a researcher one time on a carbon capture technology, and I was marketing the technology um, right and left, and we got some interest from ExxonMobil to learn more about the technology. And it's extremely hard to even, you know, get in front of these large companies. And we had a call with them and it was a Zoom call and there were maybe like 14 of the researchers on the call. And it was partly my mistake, but I hadn't really rehearsed the, uh, the pitch that the inventor was going to give to that company. And it ended up that he was on the Zoom call giving them like a 40 minute research presentation. And I was just watching them drop off the call one right after the other. And I, I, I was even having a hard time trying to figure out what the value is that he was trying to communicate to that company of what his invention would be to the, you know, to the company. And so we coached them into sort of translating the research beyond the research paper to actually being able to express the value of their invention to the company's, you know, mission, to their bottom line, um, and to the, to the end users. Um, so... We also help to seek out funding for um, for inventions that would otherwise face what's known as the valley of death. So, for example, maybe if, you know, federal funding is not an option and um, technologies need, like, uh, more funding to get it developed and de-risked so that it gets to private sector, uh, we can help. Um, at my previous university, we had a gap fund, which was, I think, about 500000 matched with another 500000 from... Um, from a local foundation, and it would reward certain projects up to $50,000 to give it that extra proof of concept data that it would need. Um, and one of the criteria was, well, first of all, do you have intellectual property protection on it? Have you seeked out, um, you know, partnering with uh, industry? And what was their feedback? Because this is obviously negative feedback, then there is really no point in, you know, putting further money into it. But if they had feedback that, you know, oh, if you needed just, you know, maybe 50 more um, data points, or you needed a prototype development, or you needed that, then maybe that gap fund would help them, would help them get over, um, get over that hurdle. Um, so of course, you know, we support revenue generation and job creation through startups that are uh, come out of the uh, universities um, and translation opportunities for students. So PhD students, for example, that are put on a certain sponsored research agreement and that's sponsored by a company could um, have internships at the company and could get hired by the companies after they graduate. Um, and then overall, it's just, um, you know, promotion of culture and innovation and entrepreneurship at, um, at the universities really um, uh, technology transfer is really at the heart of all of that. So I encourage all of the researchers to seek out and engage very closely with their tech transfer office because it really does open up a lot of opportunities. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Zainab. 
Thank you so much. What a diverse crowd we have here today. We're coming to our final uh, lightning speech and lightning speecher, uh, speaker, sorry, Andrew Van Schack. He is a senior lecturer at Vanderbilt University. Uh, he will be talking about technology foresight as a tool to promote innovation in university, industry, research, commerce, commercial, okay, <laughs> commerce, I'll start again. Commercialization activities, sort of. <laughs> I'm glad you said Welcome. it. I didn't have to. <laughs> so I'm going to start off with a question. What technology do you think will change the world as much in the next 25 years as computers and the Internet have over the last 25? I like that one, and I was going to look for you when you said that. So robots is something that uh, I think we've all seen. Boston Dynamics has two-legged, four-legged robots that are pretty exciting. There are autonomous vehicles, which is just another type of robot. Uh, the, the largest job category in the United States of America is driver of some kind. Those jobs are going to go away. Virtual and augmented reality. I think you might recognize the Oculus Rift on the left, Magic Leap on the right, a company that's raised $2.6 billion dollars and venture capital. Uh, within the next five years, I expect that we're going to have virtual reality that's indistinguishable from our, what we see around us every single day. Brain-computer interfaces. Uh, Neuralink is a very interesting product, a uh, company that uh, was started by Elon Musk. It's the idea that our interfaces with our computers right now are very, very slow. We type with our fingers, we listen with our ears, but it would be great if we could interface with computers, create cognitive prosthetics. Synthetic biology is the ability to slice and dice DNA using CRISPR and Cas9 to create new types of foods and fuels and pharmaceuticals. But of course, once we can manipulate DNA in that way, we can also make changes to the human genome. Some obviously for uh, very good purposes, but I think there are going to be some ethical concerns with respect to things like enhancing IQ. Reusable rockets are pretty cool. Uh, and I know that some of you have children that are really into rockets. Uh, and what that enables is taking uh, products and satellites and putting them into low Earth orbit to produce things like the Starlink satellite network. The idea that you could be anywhere on the planet Earth and get high-speed Internet connectivity with very low latency, which would have pretty significant implications for education. And, of course, energy to drive all of this. And there's... Lots of innovation in solar, photo, so, uh, I'll just say, solar cells, uh, hydropower, wind power, and then just a, a recent announcement out of MIT about a new type of technology that's going to make fission more practical in the coming decade. And then finally, artificial intelligence, which is usually the thing that I think is the go-to for most people with respect to what's going to change the world as much as computers and the Internet, the ability to perceive, comprehend, and take action. I could go on with a list, and I'm sure that there are some of the things that you would have put in your list compared to the ones that I just showed. Uh, I think what's amazing is all of these things in some way are going to change the world in remarkable ways, and the combination of them certainly will, and it's going to happen very, very quickly. But rather than just guessing and using our hunch, what are some techniques that we can use that are systematic, objective, and evidence-based to make predictions about the future? so that we can actually shape the future that we would like. So I'd like to just do a quick run-through of some methods of forecasting technologies. Porter and Rossini, back in 1987, took a look and developed a taxonomy of all the different types of forecasting methods, and they found out that there were hundreds of them. But it really comes down to five basic families. Monitoring, expert opinion, trend extrapolation, modeling, and scenarios. Everything is just a version of those. Monitoring is this recognition that the future is already here. It's just not very evenly distributed. Right? Whatever that technology is that's going to change the world as much in the next 25 years as the Internet and computer have in the last 25 is here today in some form, maybe in one of the research labs. One of the challenges of monitoring is just the massive amount of information that's available to us. Right, you go into the Internet, you type into Google some search words, and you come back with five million hits. How do you find that needle in the haystack? And one approach that I teach to my students 
is this recognition that there are stages of technological development. First, there is some sort of a scientific discovery. Usually happens at a university that we all work at. There is some laboratory feasibility when the researchers are trying to kind of control it, uh, to create some model of it. Then they develop a prototype to solve some sort of a problem, not necessarily driven by customer need, but by what they think they can do with it. Unfortunately, that puts the cart before the horse. Uh, technology before need. But then there is some operational or commercial use that came about, hopefully through some technology licensing, like we've heard about today, and then widespread commercial use if you're really, really lucky and successful. Ultimately, that technology gets diffused to other areas. So back in the early 1960s, lasers were developed. And think about all the different uses for lasers, for range finding, for communication, for surgery, uh, to read and write to optical media. And then people study the social and economic impact. And maybe, and unfortunately, the negative delayed consequences that weren't anticipated through its development. We need to think about those things early in the development process. Well, what's interesting about recognizing these stages of technological development is that information about those technologies are available through different channels. So if I wanted to find that needle in the haystack about some new technology, I would think about what stage of development was it at, from basic science all the way through to everyday life. And so information first appears about technologies through funding agencies. Right? The National Science Foundation puts out a proposal, and they say, we're looking for people to do research in this area, or DARPA. R&D labs create new technologies and publish reports. And that could be Google Labs, it could be Facebook, it could be any sort of a think tank. Conference proceedings, poster presentations at conferences just like the one we're at today. Competitions are very exciting, right? The X Prize uh, to provide or spur innovation from not just universities, not just private companies, but sometimes private citizens. Then there are academic journals, but we know what the publishing cycle is. It takes a long time to get something published. That's why it's a little bit later down this list. Then the patent database, right? Technologies get patented, and within 18 months of them being filed, those become public disclosures. Lots of very interesting things. And it takes longer than 18 months to get a product to market. So you can oftentimes find about it through the patent database publishing, and then it appears in the market six months or a year later. And then finally, industry white papers and media, and this is when... People hear about it on the street, right? Uh, people just become aware of something like AI that's been around for a long time because something came out in the news or it's in Popular Mechanics magazine. The second approach is a recognition that we can develop expertise and knowledge ourselves through monitoring, but let's go find an expert. Let's just ask them. But the problem is experts are subject, just like we all are, to certain cognitive biases. Right? And if you put a bunch of experts together, now you have even more biases through um, groupthink. So James Surowiecki, who wrote a book called The Wisdom of Crowds, said, paradoxically, the best way for a group to be smart is for each person in it to think and act as independently as possible. And this is an idea about applied cognitive psychology. How can we use what we know about how human beings think to help them to think more rationally, think with less biases? There's an organization called RAND, which stands for Research and Development, very clever name, that said the Delphi method was devised in order to obtain the most reliable consensus of a group of experts by subjecting them to a series of questionnaires in depth, interspersed with controlled opinion feedback. This was in 1951. And that's essentially the essence of the Delphi method. How can we collect information from a group of people in a systematic way to reduce bias? And the approach is very simple, and I'm going to go through it quickly. Uh, the moderator identifies a theme and recruits experts. The moderator may not be an expert in this area. It says, hey, I'd like to know something about quantum computing. I'd like to know something about AI. I'd like to know something about synthetic biology. Let's go find some experts, and then you tell me what things we should forecast. The experts identify events associated with that theme. The moderator consolidates those events and then, then sends out the questionnaire. Here's a list of 10 things in this particular field. When do you think they're going to happen? The experts forecast a date for each event. The moderator runs statistics on those dates and sends them to the experts. Here's the average date. Here's the range. Now, would you like to revise your estimate? Experts can update their estimates, and if they are an outlier, 
they're required to provide some sort of an explanation. The moderator runs statistics again, sends out the explanations provided by the experts, and again, experts can keep their estimate or modify it based upon the new information. Finally, that information is consolidated in a report and sent out to everybody. This is a pretty simple approach that uses anonymity, iteration, statistical feedback to reduce bias when developing consensus among, among experts. And in a recent Delphi forecast from 2016, actually in the world of AI, this is an ancient forecast, experts expect that by the year 2040, within that 25-year range I was asking about, high-level machine intelligence will be more likely than not. And this is what I talk to my students about. Within your lifetime, for sure, we will have computers that are more intelligent than you at pretty much anything you can do. And some of you might be suspicious of that, but today I already have a cell phone in my pocket that is way smarter than me at mathematics, way better than me at playing chess. And what we keep doing with AI is keep expanding the types of things that it can do to the point where it's going to have pretty serious implications on the types of jobs that are available. The third approach is called trend extrapolation. Here's a photo of um, Vinod Kosla, who is a co-founder of Sun Microsystems founder of Coastal Ventures in Silicon Valley, he said, future is not an extrapolation of the past. And that's true, because trends are only true into the future when we extrapolate them if nothing changes. Yet things change all the time. But that doesn't mean it doesn't tell us anything. We just have a general trajectory. Then we have to make some modifications based upon external realities. Trend extrapolation really came from this idea of growth curves. You put a cow onto a scale, you plot the data of its size week by week, draw a line through that data to create the best fit curve, and if you do this with a number of types of animals, you come to this recognition that there is a universal growth curve for animals. Right? We have dimensionless time across the bottom because not all animals live the same lifespan. They're not all the same weight, but they have a mass ratio, and we see regularities. And this is what's so exciting about trends extrapolation is that I could talk to you about a dozen different types of regularities that we see in nature. Some are logarithmic, some are exponential, some are linear. And if we know about those types of regularities and we understand what's driving those, we can, through extrapolation uh, and through analogy, apply that understanding to new phenomena to make predictions about the future. One of the most common observations, and I'm sure most of you have heard of this, is Moore's Law. Back in 1970s, a gentleman named Gordon Moore said that the number of components initially, but then transistors eventually, the number of transistors will double every two years. And that has been true for 50 years. And every decade, people bet against it. Moore's Law is dead. But Moore's Law continues and continues into the 2020s. Now, people say, Moore's Law is dead. Just you wait. And I just keep placing my bets that it won't. Now, someday, I'll probably lose that bet, but not for a few years. We just are very clever at coming up with new ideas. And sometimes we cheat with quantum computing. We change the rules of the game, and we continue on. We see different types of curves. Here's an example of what's called a substitution curve. In the early 1900s, most people got around town by riding horses. But then the automobile was invented. And slowly, people transitioned from riding horses to driving cars. And this is a very common set of substitution curves. And we see this in lots of different industries. I love this one because this is a type of substitution curve where people used to move goods through canals. But then they switched to railroads. And then they switched to roads. And then they switch to airways, right? This is how we move things around as we develop new technologies. But when you see a graph like this, don't you, like I do, think, what's next? So what's next? My bet is reusable rockets of this type. And so Elon Musk and SpaceX is producing this Starship rocket. It will be tested in a couple months. And imagine... Being able to go from any two points on the planet, planet within one hour, 
How would you like to be able to fly back to Vienna from Washington, D.C. in about 45 minutes? For real. Like this technology is being developed right now and will happen in the next few years. And it will displace a lot of movement of uh, goods and people. One quarter of the cost to produce one of these vehicles, 20 times the speed. Another area is artificial intelligence. One application of that is called GPT-3 from a company called OpenAI. Really interesting stuff. And the reason I bring this up is you, again, can make an extrapolation about the future. So here is uh, an example of the different types of technologies that basically you can have a conversation with your computer. On the vertical axis, you'll notice that it's on a logarithmic scale. It's on a linear scale across the horizontal axis. That straight line indicates exponential growth. And I can make a projection, and this is my wager. We can come back and check it out a little bit later. About this time next year, we will have GPT-4, which will have 100 trillion parameters, which is coincidentally the same number of synapses within the cerebral cortex of the human brain. Now, that doesn't mean it's as smart as a human being, but when it comes to something like communicating with your computer, it's pretty amazing. And I have to think about this as a teacher because kids are going to be using this to write their essays. And they're going to be great essays. That's probably how I'll be suspicious. Right? That's how I catch a lot of plagiarism, too. And how is this going to get faster? By using microprocessors like the one on the left. You can barely see the one on the bottom right. Did you see that one down there? That was the current largest GPU. This is a CPU that has 2.6 trillion transistors. And, of course, what would a slide be in a uh, uh, presentation about technology without Elon Musk's company? Uh, So he's doing some of the most sophisticated work in AI. And this time next year also, he will have one of the fastest supercomputers on the planet, dedicated solely to training AI systems. That's what this supercomputer is going to do. The fourth method of technology forecasting is called modeling. It's sort of an offshoot of trend extrapolation. Once we understand what these trends are, the underlying scientific mechanism or phenomena that drive those, we can create models. And the models allow us to explain, predict, and ultimately shape the future. Now, all models are wrong, and some are useful. By wrong, they're simplifications of the world. Right? We don't catch all the nuances. But they're useful in that they allow us to hopefully change the future to what we'd like it to be. And some examples include climate change. Right? We model what's happening. We make predictions, and hopefully we can shape it. The COVID-19 pandemic. Right? We see the waves coming. And all of us, who are pretty sophisticated, understand when a wave starts to take off and it starts growing exponentially, This thing is not going to just stop. It's going to continue, and we can make predictions about that. And, of course, replacement migration in Austria. So if you have questions about this, you can ask the professor in the front row. But we want to understand, because we have a big ship and a very small rudder. And if we want to change things in the future, we have to turn that rudder pretty early. And finally, the fifth method is scenario development. Seneca said back 2,000 years ago, whoever does not know how to take care of the future and the present will depend upon the uncertainties of that very future. Basically, we want to be proactive instead of reactive. And scenario development is very, very common. But I think it draws upon that interdisciplinary uh, character that we've discussed in so many of the presentations. Uh, This happens to be the mnemonic that I teach to my students the great thing about learning German is that the words are much, much longer. So I can include, include other types of external factors into this. But this is what's great about having people involved in the, the scenario development process who bring different types of knowledge and perspectives to the process of technology forecasting. It's used in industry by McKinsey and Company. It's used by the European Commission to develop forecasts uh, and scenarios of the future. And what it allows is what's called backcasting, this idea of we create a vision of some possible future when we say, how can we get there from here? So back in the early 1960s, 
in the very early months of John F. Kennedy's presidency, he said, I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely. This is an example of a politician recognizing that there's a possible future, getting the public behind it, getting the funding for it, and then coming up with a pl plan to get us from here to there. And it happened within a decade. Walter Gretzky, who, like many parents, was a coach to his son, Wayne Gretzky, who was arguably the greatest hockey player of all time, said, skate to where the puck is going, not to where it has been. <laughs> right? And any of you who've played sports where there's some ball on the ground, if you just try to chase that ball to where it is, you're just going to get tired. But if you watch the play develop, and you see something sneaking over on this side, and you watch the ball over there, you think, I can see where this is going and you run to where the ball is going to be and intercept it. That's what technology forecasting allows us to do, to skate to where the puck is going to be. So this is my proposal to promote innovation and tech transfer. We would like to say tech transfer is like this, right? We've got academia on the left, racing along, passing the baton of some new innovation to some commercialization partner, and no loss of speed, Unfortunately, what we often see is this. And I love the picture, the face of the man in the front, right? That's what some, sometimes happens in technology transfer. The baton gets dropped. And I think part of it is because of the way it typically happens. And I used to work at my university's technology transfer office, so I've seen it from both sides, actually, as an inventor and then as someone who's licensed technology. It's typically a very serial process, Right? And then you notice that vertical line there. I intentionally drew it to look like a brick wall. Um, that's a little cynical, I know. But the problem is that a lot of these technologies get developed and then marketed to people who didn't necessarily ask for it and say, this is what we want, and this is the way that we want it. And I think what would work much, much better is if we got people together a little bit earlier. This happens to be two real teams, one in Canada one in Silicon Valley. They sort of look like each other also, <laughs> just different jackets. Uh, and if we could get them, instead of waiting until the technology got developed and then passing it, hopefully, over this big brick wall and not dropping it on the way, but very, very early in the process, much earlier than I think most people would be comfortable with, working together using something like a technology forecast. Let's share our different perspectives. Let's talk even before you've begun doing some of your research. Let's monitor. And I can tell you, academics monitor different things than people in corporate America. When's the last time an academic monitor went on to Google Patents to see what they were going to include in their lit review? Academics don't go to Google Patents. Just like many people in corporate America don't go to Google Scholar. Right? There are a few people in the company that do that. They monitor different sources of information. The Delphi method, remember how we want experts that have different perspectives? Or trend extrapolation, there's different trends that people in corporate America look at compared to the scientists that underline, understand the underlying scientific principles. The same with modeling and scenario development, especially with scenario development. And I think the third party that can make this happen is the government. Right? I think that they can coordinate, moderate, and hopefully and especially participate in this process at conferences just like this one, right? And if we can get the university together with industry and government with their shared perspectives working together to create a shared vision of the future, we can use that backcasting technique to figure out how to get from here to there where everyone is contributing what it is that they do best. So that's what I like to see happen, and hopefully, and I won't, don't want to be too presumptuous, maybe here at 2022 <laughs> or 23, we might have the opportunity to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Andrew. I'm going to use some of uh, one phrase that you have used, some really interesting stuff. And I don't just mean your presentation, I mean all six presentations, uh, lightning talks that we have seen now. Um, we don't have a Q&A session now, but you will have uh, the 
opportunity to talk to all of the speakers tonight at the reception. You can have one-on-one -on -one talks. You can continue with your networking then. Uh, it's, it, I see the sun is shining. It's an outdoor reception. It's a wonderful place, the, res the residence of the Austrian ambassador. We'll get to the next uh, item on our program, the yearly audit poster session. It was held virtually this year, and it was a year of records. There were a record number of 40 submissions, and we had a record number of audience voting. This year, we had over 3,100 individual votes giving input on the top 10 posters and video pitches. So we'll have the representatives of Oster Washington, the Austrian Science Fund, and the Austrian Marshall Plan Foundation sharing more about the award, the selection process, and we'll be honoring the top three winners. And I'd like to ask on stage Simone Pötzschers. She is somewhere around. Here she is. <laughs> the Oster director, of course, Christoph Gattringer the president of the Austrian Science Fund, and Markus Schweiger, the executive director of the Austrian Marshall Plan. Welcome. We're looking forward to the award ceremony. I know. Uh, yeah, thank you uh, for staying so long. Um, I want to make it very brief. Uh, why are we doing this and why are we sponsoring this uh, poster award? Uh, if you look at the mission of our foundation, then it's foster transatlantic excellence. And therefore, sponsor an award for excellent research fits perfectly to this mission. And we also think that excellence should be visible. So that's the main reason why we are doing this. And I would like to use this opportunity uh, for some thank yous. First of all, a thank you to the community here. Uh, on the one hand, for contributing um, as jury members. And on the other hand, for submitting the proposals. Because without the proposals, there would not be... Uh, this kind of award. And Hanne Lorefeit already mentioned it. Uh, we had more than 40 proposals, or we had 40 proposals this year. When we started uh, five years ago, we had 12 proposals. So it's steadily evolving. I also would like to thank the FWF and Christoph Gattringer uh, for organizing the review pro process and uh, for providing the shortlist. And I also would like to thank Simone Pötcher. Uh, Matt and Ali for all the organizational stuff uh, regarding to the poster event. So thank you to all of you. And I'm thinking... I'm digging a little deeper into one of the topics that we were looking at for the poster awards, and it is science communication. Um, you all know how important communication has become. We learned a lot about misinformation already in the previous presentations. And today there is more data out there than ever, and not just scientific data, but data in general in the world. Um, we have estimates, and nobody can really uh, exactly tell, that there is about uh, 330,000 uh, to 2 million scientific papers uh, published on an annual basis around the globe. So that is a very broad range, but that is also a lot of data and a lot of science. Um, it's very hard for the general public to stay informed, to stay on track, um, so that they can make the best decisions for their lives uh, and for how they want to proceed. So I think science communication is so very important for every single scientist, no matter what career level, no matter what academic field. It's the basis for sharing with the world the value of what you're doing. We heard earlier about uh, implementation, but it's not just implementation and the effects of your work, but also how well can you communicate it. So um, with that, I'd like to say thank you so much to the 
people who submitted their science communication through either, um, well, not either, actually two ways. First, through a scientific poster where they shared their research results and also through a one-minute pitch where they shared with us what the process was for the work that they're showcasing. And we'll hear a little bit more from Christoph Katringer now about the process and the evaluation that leads us to the top three candidates that we're welcoming in just a moment and celebrating here today. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I very much agree with your statement you made that science communication in a world full of fake news is very important. But science communication is also a skill. And I think it's a very important skill. You can do fantastic research if you're not able to transport your results or to get people excited about your results, nobody will read your papers. So this is why I keep telling my students, uh, put a lot of effort in presenting your results. Every presentation always has to be perfect, otherwise people won't pay attention. And this is why the FWF is also happy to support uh, in this selection process for such an important task. So how do we do it? We already heard 40 applications came in this year and they are fed into the machinery of the FWF. So they are handed over to the board of reporters. This is a gremium of experts and they uh, divide them according to the dis different disciplines. And within each discipline, one of the reporters uh, made an assessment of the contribution. They were ranked in different uh, categories, excellent, good, and so on. And then they were passed on to the scientific presidents of the FWF, who came up with the final list of 10 candidates who were then passed on to the jury. The jury consisted of some members uh, who looked at the one-minute pitches, looked at the abstracts, of course, at the posters, uh, plus the public voting, and then in some magic process where I'm an <laughs> outsider, uh, was condensed to the final list. And I think this is what we are going to share with the public now. A very fair process, I have to say. <laughs> yes, of course. All right, so I'm going to get started with the first winner today. It's the third prize of the Austrian Marshall Plan Foundation Post Awards. And I don't know that we're going to get a drum roll here. Um, <laughs> may I ask up here, Sonia Schmidt from Virginia Tech University for her poster. In this in project, this Taylor Lawyer, I examine the, material culture the history of, special of ingredient. tritium production in the United States. Tritium is a radioactive isotope of hydrogen, which is used to massively increase the yield of modern nuclear warheads. The success of international arms control negotiations prompted the U.S. to shut down its military production reactors. This left the nuclear weapons complex without a reliable supply of tritium. Based on historical documents and interviews, we trace how multiple administrations reviewed possible options for replenishing tritium. We scrutinized the decision made in 1998 to utilize the commercial reactor at Watts Bar for irradiation services, and we focus on reconstructing the design, manufacturing, and chain of custody of the tritium producing absorber rods, or TP bars. Finally, Finally, we discussed the implications of tritium production for the nuclear, nuclear operation, operation regime and exposed, and exposed the, tentacles the tentacles of this seemingly small operation for the rest, the rest of the nuclear ecosystem. ecosystem. So I'm continuing with the second award, second prize, second place. And I think here we have a special way of participation because the winner of the second prize will be uh, live online, I guess. Virtual. Okay, virtually. And uh, the winner is Christiane Fuchs from the Massachusetts General Hospital for her poster, Planter Skin, an Evolutionary Revolution that Comes at the Trade-Off for Skin Growth. Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations, and we'll see the poster playing right now. Let me tell you about the differences in skin and the relationship to wound healing. We found a revolution comes at a trade off for skin growth. We performed our RNA seek with four different skin sites. Principal component analysis depicts the dorsal foot and trunk skin are highly related, whilst plant and snout skin are unique. Something was fundamentally different in plant skin. Trunk skin has a thin epidermis, whereas plant skin is much thicker with a massive stratum corneum known as callus and is also conserved in humans. Our RNA-seq data revealed that calcium ion binding and signaling is differentially regulated in planter skin. 
The epidermis typically exhibits a calcium gradient. One can see an increase in calcium and levels drop drastically until reaching the stratum corneum. Plantar skin has lower calcium levels and the gradient is absent. These differences led us to the hypothesis that plantar skin might display features of wound healing. On the left, you see tightly packed cells of normal skin. The center shows cells that are bigger and loosely packed in healing. Foot skin exhibits a comparable phenotype. This may be why wound healing in foot skin is impeded. Curious? Take a look at my poster. Thank you. How do we do the group picture? <laughs> she's she's going to be on later where we can take a photo. Of okay, her good. So we should move on? Okay. So I'm happy to present the winner of this year's uh, Austrian Marshall Plan Foundation Post Award. The first place goes to Anna Katharina von Kraulat from the Stanford University for her poster, Mapping the Path to 100% Renewable Energy. Hi, my name is Anna Katharina von Kraulat and I'm a PhD candidate at Stanford University. My research is focused on accelerating the transition to 100% renewable energy for the United States. I'm developing a wind energy atlas that reveals the available land area and power potential for wind farm siting across all states. I do this by mapping the restrictions to wind development, including infrastructure like roads and buildings, protected land areas such as national parks, and low wind speeds that wouldn't be economical. We find that the U.S. has far greater potential for onshore energy than previously suggested, and in fact has sufficient resources to meet 2050 targets. With this atlas, wind farm developers and policymakers can reduce the time selecting a new wind farm site, as well as the upfront cost, uncertainty, and investment risk. Further, it helps transform what is currently a manual process into one that is digitized and streamlined, helping states decide where and how many wind farms to build. Thank you. And now our, our awardees are going to have a chance to give us some quick uh, thank you words and remarks. Anna Katarina. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm really happy and grateful to be here today to accept this honor. Having grown up in Miami, the topic of climate change is so important to me, both because of the impacts it will have on my home city uh, and to my entire generation. It truly means a lot that my research that aims to accelerate the implementation of renewable energy is being recognized today. Thank you to the Office of Science and Technology Austria, the Austrian Science Fund, and the Marshall Plan Foundation for this honor. I appreciate all the support over the years and the interactions that I've had with the individuals from these organizations through my role as the president of the Stanford Austria Club. I also want to thank all those who supported me in my academic journey so far, including my PhD advisor, Dr. Mark Jacobson, and my collaborators in Denmark. And of course, my family and loved ones who have supported me every step of the way, especially my mother who was born and raised in Austria and gave me a deep connection to the majestic beauty of the Alps from a young age that continues to be central to who I am today. Vielen herzlichen Dank. I will hear the remarks from our second ever D on the screen. Servus from Massachusetts General Hospital. Thank you, Professor Dr. Christoph Gattinger, the president of the FUF, for the kind introduction. First, I would like to thank the organizers, the Office of Science and Technology Austria, the Austrian Science Fund, and the Austrian Marshall Plan Foundation for awarding me this prize. I would like to thank my former colleagues back in Austria, especially Dr. Andreas Teuschel and Professor Dr. Heinz Ledl, who were influential to my career and their continuing support. I'm also grateful to my colleagues here at Wellman Center for Photomedicine, especially to my mentors, Professor Dr. Rox Anderson, and my PI, Josh Tim, who gave me the opportunity to work on this exciting project. Lastly, but not least, I am grateful for my wonderful friends and family, my partner in crime, James, my dad, without whom I wouldn't be who I am and where I am today. Finally, to my mom and to my sister Edith, who always remind me of my Austrian roots. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
And Sonia, the third place, do you also have some remarks for us? Yeah, I think, um, can you hear me? Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, I would like to extend my thanks also, in addition to everybody who was already named a couple of times, to the anonymous reviewers who served the uh, fund for the, um, the FAF. I don't know how you translate that into English. <laughs> FWF. <laughs> FWF, okay. Um, uh, having served on that uh, committee myself, I know that it's, um, you know, a um, often unacknowledged uh, task. So thank you to, to everyone who uh, took the time to review all these um, poster proposals. And a special thanks to Simone for encouraging me to submit the proposal. Uh, and of course, I um, am accepting this award um, for uh, my graduate student, Taylor Loy, and myself, who has been uh, working with me on this project throughout the pandemic and was kind of a lifeline to not completely, um, you know, get sucked into the the, the drama of um, the doom scrolling, etc. <laughs> Instead, we focused on something uplifting, such as tritium production. <laughs> All right, um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, everybody. Um, I'm, I'm very honored to receive this award. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Gonna give your flowers again. I think this concludes the poster ceremony. Hannelore is gonna give us some more uh, remarks, and then I'm oh your oh, photo. Sorry, I apologize. Well, thank you. Congratulations to all three of you. And I'm sure it didn't go unnoticed that there are three women on the stage here. That says something about the place of women in science, and I'm happy about that. <laughs> Picture time again. <laughs> This brings this year's art to an end, at least to the official end. It will go on, continue unofficially. Um, we've heard a lot about innovation. We've had a lot of food for thought. I'm sure you will continue all the networking you have started during the lunch break uh, this evening at the reception, which starts at 6 o'clock at the residence of the Austrian ambassador. There will be buses. They will leave from the back entrance of the Willard Hotel. Uh, you can find all the details if you scan the QR code on your badges. Um, yes, I think it's time for final well, remarks have, for Simone. But well, I have one, do one more thing to do, and that is thank a few people. Uh, <laughs> foremost, Hanalo, I want to say thank you to you. You've been instrumental over very many years now. Thank you. Uh, a very important part of our Eretz. Thank you for being with us again today and guiding us through the day. It's much, appreci it's much appreciated. Do you have a free hand for the flowers? Uh, I think so, but I'd like to get in a word. Well, it's sort of difficult. <laughs> I'd, I'd, like, I'd like to thank you and I'd like to wish you well in your new endeavors and founding your own companies. And I'm pretty sure it will be a big success. All the best to you. Thank and you, you have the last much. word. Thank you very much. And I also want to... I also want to say a huge thank you. Uh, an event like that doesn't get organized uh, on its own. There is a lot of... Um, backing that we need, and that is the, minister, the BMBVF. We have the minister who uh, will join us again later, um, Director General Barbara weid -Kuba. Thank you so much, Herbert Buchbauer. You and your team in Vienna have been really amazing supporting this entire trip as well. The ambassador and the team at the embassy, I had this time around not only my wonderful team, I have Ali here, I think Matt is outside, but also a borrowed team uh, led by Cordy and um, for uh, uh, support um, people from other departments of the embassy to help along. So I'm really, really grateful for everyone's hands that were involved. Um, a big, big applause, please, for all those people that made this day today happen. Thank you so much, and we'll continue the celebration in the evening at the Astina Awards. Thanks. <laughs>